2021 to deal with the budget. The first item I'd like to do is call everyone to order. Madam Clerk, over to you for the roster. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to provide a very shortened review of the protocols for electronic participation in this council meeting. As there will be a number of presentations today, the recommended WebEx view is focus view or stage view to ensure a, few, a full view of the presentation slides and other uh, meeting materials. Voting for this meeting will be conducted verbally. For procedural votes that do not require a recorded vote, the chair or I will call for any objections. If you have an objection, indicate your name and objection. If no objections are stated, the motion will be deemed to be adopted. For recorded votes, I will call upon each member and will confirm the vote of each member. If you do not respond when called upon to vote, I will call your name a second time. If you do not respond to the second call, you will be recorded as abstaining from the vote and your vote will count in the negative as a nay vote. If you're participating electronically and are leaving the meeting, please send an email to council at peelregion.ca to indicate that you are leaving the meeting. If you leave the meeting for any votes thereafter, you will be marked absent. We'll now commence the meeting with roll call. Mayor Brown? Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Carlson? Here. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Crombie, she indicated that she may be arriving a little bit later due to other municipal business. Councillor DeMurla? Good morning, present. Thank you. Councillor Dasco? I'm present. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Councillor Dillon? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Downey? Present. Thank you. Councillor Fonseca? Good morning, present. Thank you. Councillor Fortini? Morning, here. Thank you. Councillor Groves? Good morning, present. Thank you. Councillor Innes? Present. Thank you. Councillor Kovac? Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Mahoney? Good morning, everyone. Thank you. And Councillor McFadden indicated that she would be, um, is that she was unable to attend the meeting today. Councillor Medeiros? Present. Thank you. Councillor Pileshi? Present, good morning. Thank you. Councillor Parrish? Here. Thank you. Councillor Raz? Present. Thank you. Councillor Sato? Here. Thank you. Councillor Santos? Present. Thank you. Councillor Sinclair? Present. Thank you. Councillor Starr? Uh, present. Mayor Thompson? Good morning. Present. Thank you. Councillor Vicente? Present. Thank you. Very good. That brings us to our Indigenous land acknowledgement. Thank you. We would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather and which the region of Peel operates as part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, Indigenous people inhabited and cared for this land. In particular, we acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, the land that is also home to the Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land and by doing so give our respect to its first inhabitants. And I think I might also acknowledge, uh, apropos to note that February's um, Black History Month and wonderful reading the press and the more popular press, that uh, everybody stepped up their game and we're learning more and more about our black history in Canada that even surprises a student of history like me in Canada. And it's wonderful that the stories are being told and I know we're gonna have a session here at the region as well. So nice to see that change come about. So thank you for that to everybody involved with Black History Month. All right, with that, declarations of conflict of interest. I do wanna note Councillor Sato has sent in or filled out the prescribed form that deals with conflict of interest. So hers is noted. Mr. Chair, Councillor I will formally note it too. Ah, very good. Thank you. Thank you. And as I said, all you've also uh, done the paperwork accordingly as well. So duly acknowledged, Councillor Sato. Thank you. Anybody else under conflict of interest? 
Hearing no one, I go to the approval of the minutes from the January 28, 21 meeting. My motion reads from Councillor Mahoney, seconded by Councillor Downey, that the minutes of the January 28, 2021 Regional Council budget meeting be approved. Do I have any objectors? Hearing no objectors or comment, that carries. Thank you very much. I now need an approval of the agenda. Madam Clerk, am I advised that we are withdrawing 7.4? So yes, with that, I will deal with the approval of the agenda now. I have a motion moved by Councillor Kovac, seconded by Councillor Mahoney, that item 7.4 on the February 4, 2021 Regional Council budget meeting be withdrawn, and further, that item 10.1 on the February 4, 2021 Regional Council meeting be withdrawn, and further, that the agenda for the February 4, 2021 Regional Council budget meeting be approved. Madam Clerk, is there something further? We're just reconfirming that covers it. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Yes, Councillor Santos. I just, I just wanted uh, so count, uh, CAO Baker and I spoke about those particular items. I'm just wondering at what point an explanation on why the item has been withdrawn uh, will be made. Yeah, and uh, Madam Clerk, I understand that that. We're just going to withdraw. Okay, so why don't we, the clerk is revising, we are only going to withdraw 7.4 at this time. So so okay. you can speak to it at the next point because it's also further in the agenda and that remains, Councillor Santos. Thank you very okay, much. very good, thank you. Okay, with that, I believe that is what is before me as the amended agenda. It has been moved and seconded. Do I have any objectors? Hearing none, that approves our agenda for the day. Very good. On to delegation 6.1. We have our list of presenters now for the balance of the budget. First up is the Peel Regional Police budget. And in a moment, I'll get to presenters Nish Apapa, our chief. And I understand Al Bountain's here, one of our board members as well, uh, who also does great work on the budget, and he will be here as well. But I also thought I would take this opportunity and have invited on your behalf Ahmed Atia, who is our new Police Services Board Chair. In the sort of normal non-COVID world, I think we would have seen him in the audience today, along with many of the members who show up, and I think many of them are tuned in otherwise virtually. But I just thought we'd, we'd like to introduce to you your new, new Police Services Board Chair, Ahmed Ati, who's well known to us in Mississauga, incidentally. But I, I thought, Ahmed, you might like to introduce yourself and introduce the Chief and your budget. Ahmed. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, I'm humbled and honored to be elected as the chair of the Real Police Service Board, and I want to thank all my colleagues on the board for the confidence and support for allowing me this opportunity to serve as a board full. I'd also like to thank Mayor Patrick Brown for his service on the board and welcome Councillor Medeiros from Brampton. If I have, if I could have a moment to just, you know, briefly speak about the work that we've done as a board over the last year. Um, despite the challenges associated with the global pandemic, Peel Police Services Board has made some significant progress. Uh, we've negotiated collective agreements with the Peel Regional Police Association and the Seniors Officers Association. Both agreements balance support for our uniform and civilian members with respect for our public finances. In his first full year as Chief of Police, the board supported Chief Nish by appointing three new deputy chiefs, giving him a full team to implement a new corporate organizational plan uh, in anticipation of a new strategic plan that we've passed. On behalf of our board, I can say unequivocally that we have the best police leadership in Canada. We've opened a community station in Moulton and one in downtown Brampton, and we completed a service delivery review. We signed an unprecedented MOU with the Ontario Human Rights Commission, which I'm very proud of, which is centered around remedies that aim to end systemic racism, and discrimination in policing, promote transparency, and enhance public, uh, throughout Peel, and enhance public safety throughout the Peel region. We recognize demands from communities, in particular Black and other racialized and Indigenous communities, to defund the police. The chief and the board recognize that gradually there has been an over-reliance on law enforcement for a variety of social and human service needs, such as dealing with situations involving mental health, addiction, housing, and homelessness. We've committed to explore options with regional, municipal, and provincial partners to reduce the role of police and demand for police services. We've approved body-worn cameras. The board's governance com uh, committee, which I chaired in 2020, worked closely with the chief and his team to develop a board-level policy to ensure public interests are served. It covers areas of transparency, accountability, controls, auditing, reporting, and oversight. 
We experienced a number of protests and we respected the rights of communities to protest peacefully. But unfortunately, we also witnessed unacceptable attacks and damage to police stations and headquarters, our headquarters and the Puyo Regional Police Memorial Monument. For 2021, the board has introduced a new strategic plan, which sets out the board's priorities over the next four years. And we focus on three overall goals, community safety and well-being, an inclusive, engaged, and progressive workplace, and accountability, equity, and service excellence. These goals reflect a year's worth of research, stakeholder input, community engagement, and planning through the board's governance committee. The board believes our strategic plan will ensure Peel Regional Police remains one of Canada's best police services, which places support for our community first and foremost. I'd like to thank Mr. L. Boughton and for chairing the Finance Committee and the Chief and his team for their collaboration collaboration over the course of 2020 to develop this budget. Lastly, please know that both I and the board office are available to the regional council for anything they need police related. Thank you, Chair, for giving me a few moments. Through the Chair, I'd like to now invite Mr. Albouton and Chief Nish to begin their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Atia. And uh, I think if this was uh, in chambers, you'd probably see uh, myself, uh, Board Chair Atia, uh, Mr. Bowden, and uh, our Director of Finance and Planning, Ms. Kira Lee Holmes, uh, all standing side by each. So let me first say good morning to everybody, and it's a pleasure to see everyone. Uh, I would, uh, as we progress, before we get to the, the slide presentation, I will introduce uh, Mr. Bowden, the Chair of our Finance uh, Committee. Good morning, Chair Iannico, members of Regional Council, and Regional Staff. It is my pleasure to join you this morning to introduce the 2021 Peel Police Services Board Budget along with Chief Nish. While I would have preferred to be meeting with all of you in person, at this point, we have all accepted our new reality uh, for the past year and for the next number of months. My name is Al Bowden. In addition to being a member of the Peel of Police Services Board, I'm also the chair of the board's Finance and Budget Committee. One of our duties as a committee is to work closely with the chief and his team over the course of the year to review and make decisions on finance-related matters, as well as collaborating on the development of the budget on behalf of the board. It may appear unorthodox that I'm addressing you this morning before the chief of police, who has historically presented the budget alone. And while I will turn the screen over to the chief shortly to go through the details of this year's budget, I'm here today for a few reasons. The first and most importantly is to ensure everyone is aware that this is the board's budget. As mandated in the Police Services Act, the decisions and the financials in this budget represent the direction of the board which has been developed with important input from the chief and the police service. Secondly, as a board charged with ensuring adequate and effective policing in our community, I want the community and the thousands of members of Peel Region of Police to know that our decisions will always support community safety and well-being. Moving to the budget itself, I am pleased with the collaborative effort that took place to bring this year's budget together. As you may know, 2020 represented the first full year under the leadership of Chief Nash. The board also appointed three new deputy chiefs in 2020 to help round out the chief's leadership team. And I'm proud to say that the board knows we have the best police leadership team anywhere in Canada. Since I became chair of the Finance and Budget Committee, I've been struck with the knowledge experience and professionalism of every member of Peel Regional Police that contributes to developing our budget. Along with Mayor Brown, who also sits on the committee, we worked along with our executive director, with Chief Nish and the budget team to take a deep dive into all facets of this year's budget. Obviously, given the impacts of COVID-19, we're always aware that this year's budget <clears throat> required a careful and critical eye. As you will hear from the chief, the 2021 budget represents what we have determined to be required to manage growth and continue to support our community and members of our service. 
The budget also reflects the outcomes of two successful collective agreements that we negotiated with both the Peel Regional Police Association and the Senior Officers Association. I'd like to thank everyone involved in the collective bargaining process, including my fellow board members on the negotiating committee and especially to the members of both the PRPA and the SOA for a professional and successful outcome. As the Chief watched you through some of the spending priorities in 2021, I am confident you will agree that the 2021 budget is necessary to provide adequate resources to ensure our streets remain safe and our residents receive the best service possible. I will add, and as Chief will discuss in greater detail, Peel still has one of the lowest numbers of officers for 100,000 people in similar sized communities. The board felt that this budget is necessary and was approved unanimously. In this context, I would be remiss if I did not underscore the leadership that your colleagues on the police board provided. They championed the community safety and well-being comes first and foremost. For that, I thank them. Before I turn the floor over to Chief Nash, I'd like to thank Regional Council for considering the budget today, as well as thanking my committee members, my board colleagues, and Chief Nash and the police service for a truly collaborative effort to bring you our 2021 budget. Chief. Thank you very much. And if we could have the presentation. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Bowden. And uh, as I said, uh, I do have uh, Mr. Bowden available, as well as our Director of Finance, uh, Ms. Carrie, Lee, Carrie Lynn Holmes. And uh, with that, if I can have the next slide, please. As we uh, have heard from both uh, Mr. Atia and Mr. Bowden, the board uh, commissioned our new 2021 to 2023 strategic plan. So, and the three golden themes uh, within it, I just want to take a little left turn to say that uh, I've appreciated the relationship with all of you uh, at council independently and collectively. Uh, as you know, just over a little over a year ago, I had the opportunity to really almost introduce myself uh, at a point where we're commencing a commitment to really build on the strengths of this organization and this community but uh, with a mandate for opportunities to do things differently and new. And, you know, one of the things I've always said is that we want to have three golden threads. And uh, I'm happy to say that they were, you know, sort of reflected in our strategic plan. And that is uh, the commonality with what you all have with me and our organization is number one, our community and the safety and well-being of our community. Secondly, uh, you know, the work we're doing needs to be innovative and modern, uh, but also a focus on our people. And perhaps you've heard me say it before, if we as an organization uh, are not good on the inside, we're not good on the outside. And, and not saying that we are in a need or a deficit, but that requires attention and, and investment. So I'm proud to say that that's reflected in our strategic plan. Next slide, please. So as a little over a year ago, as it had been uh, the chief here in Peel, it's been a, a, a really a significant year for us. Not only have we built on the longstanding impact to our service community, we have also done so much change within Peel Regional Police. Uh, I have talked to many of our members and we acknowledge the fact that this organization has seen more change in this one year than it has in decades. And that is, to say that we want to be focused on modernizing our community policing approach, emphasizing innovation, and investing in our people, both internally and externally. And those three elements had to be reflected right in the org chart, right down to you know who's in the driver's seat, uh, as well as you know realigning uh, priorities within this organization. And to use the turning a canoe around versus turning an ocean liner. This is a big ship with 3,200 people and years and years of, of uh, strategy and thought and reframing it in a way that's innovative and modern. And you know, not to dwell on the past, I often say to people, the past isn't intended to be a place of residence. It's supposed to be a place of reference. Uh, but you know, last year did require us to completely change 
our org structure, to shift the emphasis away from traditional policing to modern policing, to put the right people into places, institute new strategies from an infrastructure and resource deployment. And I look forward to telling you a little bit about that in the context of what our pressures are here in Peel and how it's reflected in our 2021 budget. And uh, these golden threads are what I, I hope to speak to. So as we do that, I'd like to shift to the concept of modernizing our community policing approach. And if we can have the next slide, please. Not only has it been a privilege to be here and look at where policing shifting, and I've been quoted various times, and I may need to evolve the quote, uh, but I've said, if we don't like the idea of change, we're gonna hate being irrelevant even more. I tell our own people that, and it's not a threat. It's simply from the fact that our traditional models of policing need to be informed by the people we serve, by your constituents, by each of you, by the changing needs of communities. We've seen a year where emphasis on strengthening other systems and not over-relying on emergency services has really come to the forefront. Can I tell you that's been an awakening that many people uh, in the public have realized but it's one that you as council and us as a police organization and me as a chief have always said we need to shift the traditional over-reliance on incident response and start looking at ways of getting upstream to change the outcomes. So it's been a privilege to co-chair the Community Safety Wellbeing Plan with uh, Commissioner Nancy Polsonelli and her team uh, at the region as well as uh, regional councillors uh, Downey, uh, Pileshi, and Sato, as well as the broader team behind them between the three municipalities. And can I tell you, we as a region should be proud. I want to just dwell on this for a second and tell me if it's a little too much. But in a time where most municipalities in Ontario did not proceed with seeing a community safety well-being plan through, the, the region appeal did continue to do that. And it's not intended to be a plan that sits on a shelf, but I think we all agree it's intended at the highest level to bring systems together, to coordinate better in the four levels of social development prevention and risk intervention, which we, uh, you know, as a police chief, have always been kind of floating in incident response and prevention, but we want to really emphasize the need for it. And, uh, this is a big machine, and I know the region requires resourcing behind it to make it happen. I have the full confidence that this, in a year where people have talked about defunding police, about you know turning the dial down on certain resources but emphasizing others, I think it's important to say that the, the ones listed here are the priorities of the region. And if I can have just the next uh, evolution of the slide, is to illustrate the direct connection to Peel Police. I have mandated within the organization to adopt the Community Safety Wellbeing Plan as our approach to community policing as we move forward. And it's not to say that a previous model was uh, deficient, but we recognize we can't be the ones 24-7 holding the bag on social disorder, housing, homelessness, youth, truancy, uh, as the only entity. And we're really thankful that the region is leading this way. I just want to assure you that my job is to make sure, as you saw in our strat plan, is to embed a direct connect to the regional plan with what we do here. And so our budget is really built on it. And as I move through my next slides, I hope I can illustrate to you where I'm being thoughtful and where as a leadership team, right down to the front line, we're, we're doing that. Insofar as that I've created a, a brand new community safety well-being branch and deconstructed you know, elements of neighborhood policing and reconstructed it from the top. Uh, the plan is going to be applied to uh, road safety, uh, you know, violent crime, inclusive of all, uh, all the issues that we see. But we have many other spinoffs, such as the establishment. Now we're three weeks into our regional situation table, which is a huge success. Uh, the one which involves all our uh, about 40 partners, which is a dotted line to our regional community safety well-being plan. And, uh, you know, I often say the rings are easy principles to tell people because they make a lot of sense right to our frontline officers, right down to community partners. And uh, we are completely aligned to where the region is going. Next slide, please. 
So as we move through some of the pressures, and uh, I, I want to harken back to uh, your motion at Regional Council, which was passed on July 9th, to really bolster the region's efforts towards mental health and addictions. We know that uh, over the last uh, five years, we've seen a 31% increase from a policing standpoint on calls for service for mental health and addictions. We're still roughly at 15 to 16 mental health apprehensions a day. Uh, we're very, very thankful for the inception of a mobile crisis rapid response team. But as your motion did in July, highlight that there needs to be more funding for our partners at uh, CMHA here, and uh, David Smith and I speak often, uh, our hospital streams at Osler and Trillium are great partners. But the reality is for them to give us a crisis worker requires funding from health in the province. Right now, we're operating with only two crisis workers a day, which means that 62% of the time, a uniformed officer is responding to a crisis call on their own. Although it's an amazing activity, we know that help needs uh, to see this funding. We believe that there's funding coming. David Smith and I speak regularly. We've been talking to Minister Tobolo to make sure we advocate for an increase in health funding. Uh, but on my side of the house, uh, I, I have to, uh, there is no funding stream for that. We, we allocate from within, and it's a very valuable effort for us. And I just want to highlight the fact that when a uniformed officer attends a doorstep for a mental health crisis, 83% of the time, we are apprehending somebody and taking them to the hospital. And we all know how, uh, you know, just the thought that the police are the only legislated entity to take somebody in crisis to the hospital speaks to how in my perspective, we see how misguided legislation is. We know that at times there are, we are the only people that should be at the doorstep in crisis and uh, especially in violent circumstances. And sadly, we've seen some take the spotlight, but there's an opportunity for alternate community led initiatives to be introduced. And we're really advocating for the fact that when we see a crisis worker and officer show up at a do doorstep, only 21% of the time is somebody taken to a hospital. And that's because they have the ability to connect directly to services. They have the greater training and discernment to, to know when somebody should be in an emergency room where we don't bottleneck ER rooms. We've all seen the pictures of 16 to 18 cruisers outside uh, Brampton Civic Hospital. And that's because our, our officers are trained uh, in a variety of different ways to de-escalation mental health training, but ultimately we're not mental health professionals. So we have a plan to get to eight teams. Uh, I am uh, willing to reallocate my officers uh, in a variety of capacities to meet uh, our health professionals at the doorstep to do that. We just are looking forward to the funding. Uh, and we are very thankful for Regional Council's support to bolster this. We do have some remarkable opportunities ahead, above and beyond what you're seeing here. And uh, some of the initiatives are collaborative, applying the community safety well-being plan. We've thankfully got six safe beds at SHIP, which is uh, supportive housing in Peel, to allow for our officers to get somebody in crisis right into uh, a, a place of coordination. We've got a mental health coordinator on our team. We're still operating a crisis outreach support as well as our new divisional mobilization units, which represent 48 new officers uh, in year, which I'll explain a little later how we got there, have all received full crisis intervention training that our MCERT teams are getting. And we look forward to adding new innovative areas. We have a community-led medic program that we're considering for piloting in our region, which would look at an uh, civilian members like has been done in Oregon, and we've seen what uh, uh, Toronto City Council's commissioned is an alternate response to mental health. Uh, we too are looking for that under the banner, uh, but these are also ongoing work that we look forward to updating Regional Council on as we move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, as you know, COVID has had a lot of impact impacts on us statistically. We're waiting to see what Stats Canada brings to us. 
We have seen a reduction in a variety of calls for service. However, we do still see some elements of violent crime continue to increase uh, across the GTA, but particularly in, in Peel region. Uh, one of which is uh, over the over the years trend is a 45 increase, 45 percent increase in our homicides, 89 percent increase in shootings. Uh, as it relates statistically, um, we had still in 2020 uh, 16 uh, homicides. Roughly 40 percent of our homicides year over year are intimate partner and f family intimate partner violence related, which is a priority for us. Uh, the number of investigated shootings and stabbings uh, are, are still there. But what we want to do is shift from, uh, you know, the focus on, for example, we, we've seen a lot of high uh, visibility crimes, like such as the carjackings. We've had the tragic homicide of an international student, the, uh, the murder of Darian Henderson, uh, which was on the heels of an individual repeat offender uh, released on forms of conditions. We know that right from repeat offenders that we have to look at things differently. We had the success of a large gun and gang initiative and the resolve of many uh, gun and gang homicides from 2020, which reflect the tireless work of our officers day in and day out. But many of the affected community communities we know also have young people, individuals that need support uh, families that need uh, support, communities that need additional resources in a coordinated fashion. And so what we're doing is shifting our response to apply community safety well-being impact to our violent crime. And our six violent crime areas that we're going to be focusing on are homicides and attempt homicides, gun and gang violence, intimate partner violence and robbery, gender-based violence, which includes sexual assault and human trafficking, drug trafficking and robbery. And as we progress, we're going to shift to a far more upstream approach. We want to do focus on enforcement. That'll always be our bread and butter. But we recognize strengthening our communities and some, some of the highly affected communities in 2021 will be our primary focus. And we're not going to do that alone. Next slide, please. One of our priorities is our populations, and we, we've termed that as priority populations, which allow us to focus on, uh, you know, not just youth engagement, older adult isolation, uh, diverse communities, uh, public engagement, our, our focus on uh, human rights initiatives. But we have this big bucket, and that is my and our organization's commitment to being accountable to the public. Uh, and quite often, accountability is seen as a negative context to us. It's our focus on relationships within and outside. And a lot of that is reflected in some of the efforts we've done. We've deconstructed some of our traditional neighborhood policing units and reallocated them to community, community safety well-being and divisional mobilization units. And also embarked on some of the smaller initiatives, such as data collection, uh, revamping our chief's advisory committees, looking at uh, getting upstream. We all know that there are opportunities in individuals here in a population of 1.4 million that our officers see uh, on a weekly basis. And our efforts is instead of, you know, arriving there, you've heard me say the analogy of arriving there on Friday night, every night to try to mitigate a risk, is trying to get there on a Tuesday to do a door knock with the appropriate services that we need so that it's not... Uh, you know, Chief Dundas or our fire chiefs or me uh, and our teams repeatedly serving health and wellness social disorder issues. But this is part of our commitment to our priority populations. Next slide, please. The other continued pressure that we continue to see uh, uh, without a doubt in the last five years, we've never uh, reached the number of, of fatal motor vehicle collisions that we've seen. 87% uh, increase in uh, fatal collision victims, which is 68% death. And, you know, we're not using the word accidents, we're using the word collisions, because they're all preventable. Uh, not only did we see COVID and all of you in your writings and your constituents saw the real impact 
of reduced road traffic safety and the increase of complaints of road noise. And that was a real thing. It's a health issue because it affects the quality of life. In that time and space, we saw an increase, without a doubt, right across the GTA in street racing and road, road racing. Uh, many of these intersection takeovers that we saw across here in New York, as well as the use of public spaces for, uh, you know, we want to call them the lot lounges where uh, vehicles were there, uh, despite the pandemic and some of the emergency orders in place. It continues to be uh, uh, an issue for us. Probably our more foremost issue is road safety for us. And I know it is for Council. We both embarked on road safety in the Vision Zero. I know Councillor Sato and many of uh, our councillors have been involved with our discussions on how we involve it, evolve it from not from the traditional approach. And if you could indulge me for a second, is we know that enforcement is always going to be important. Uh, initiatives at a municipal and at a regional level are always required. We've had multiple initiatives that we'd like to highlight. But one of the things I did, because this is a number one priority in over 2020 into 21, is reallocate a 16 additional officers to our regional road safety. Uh, and, and that's within year, uh, out of budget ask. And the reason we do that is we want to look at uh, you know, not to trivialize certain circumstances, but we've all seen uh, and been impacted by the death of the Chisillo family, uh, four, four members of our community deeply affected, uh, Mayor Thompson, Mayor Brown, and uh, Mayor Cromie and I have all chatted about this. The individual charged and before the courts is a gentleman named Brady Robertson, and I have uh, no issues highlighting the fact that he had into the double digits contact with police right across a variety of different communities with repeated uh, road safety offenses, conditions, suspensions. And, you know, one of our approaches is to look at these repeated high-risk driving offenders because we know as they continue, and if we continue to deal with them one-offs and one at a time in an uncoordinated fashion, they may be the ones taking the lives of a family of four. And, uh, and it's incumbent upon us and our partners to look at things differently. And so one of the things we've done with that new road safety team is now right at the roadside, when we uh, interdict or deal with a, a impaired driver, we partnered with uh, Peel Addiction Assessment and Referral Center. So right away, notwithstanding that it may not always be an addiction issue, but we are connecting and referring to services through PARC, uh, an impaired driver. And it's not a legislated activity. It's one that we're taking on because any opportunity we can get to get upstream and take somebody off that track, which may lead to tragedy, is how we're going to approach almost all our risks. Next slide, please. Some of the continued, uh, uh, you know, trends that we continue to see here is, uh, you know, we've seen uh, a reduction in a lot of offenses, such as commercial robberies, because we know a lot of business premises have been closed. Some continue to rise. Uh, you know, the number of firearms seized is part of a macro issue. 91% of the legal firearms we seize are coming from the United States. It's an, uh, a dialogue I'm having with chiefs right across the GTA and us as well with Public Safety Canada and Minister Blair as it pertains to enhanced efforts at our border. Uh, but we do also see, uh, you know, other crimes such as uh, drug offenses, uh, thefts, uh, carjackings uh, and property related offenses slightly continue. What the interesting thing is we've seen from a statistical effort, and I have to admit that here in Peel, we didn't have uh, you know, you've heard me say this before, the movie Moneyball came out, you know, in 2011. But, you know, policing seems to be the one of the last sectors that can get on top of proper business intelligence efforts. And we've been really uh, we're thankful for the board for some investment into the back end to do that. And what we're looking at, and we've talked about it last, it's not about always uh, the number of calls for services how we're appropriately using our time. And what we've seen is on, we call them priority one calls, which is intimate partner violence, impaired driving, robbery, the shootings, is our officers are spending over a four or five year period about 53% more. That is not really the issue. It's what I think you and our 
you know, we've got delegations at our board meetings regularly, and you probably hear it, is that uh, we operate and we dispatch the same finite number of officers in a priority basis. What happens is that our lower priority calls, which are extremely important for the families and individuals that are all ours that call in, end up suffering. And so what happens is individuals waiting for, for example, alarm calls, a citizen trespass calls, intoxicated persons, a call where there's no suspect on scene, such as brick and enters and driving complaints, are waiting now on average uh, uh, longer, right up to an hour and a half to two hours. Sometimes we have outliers of three to four hours, which is, as we'd all agree, not the service delivery that I intend on providing to our community. My efforts are going to be in how to shift the dial on that. And, and we do have, and we are aware of the growth rates within our region. I know that Chief Dunnass has presented that to you before, uh, the intensification in Mississauga that's projected, and as well as the growth in the north and east, west ends of Brampton. And we hear from our people, they're, you know, they're tired of waiting for an officer to arrive. These are pressures that we're quite intent on looking at innovative ways of doing it. Ultimately, we do need to look at our growth in our region and make sure we manage these demands in a thoughtful way. And so we have some approaches that we continue to do. Um, just a quick slide on uh, how we are uh, you know, taking the region's data on growth. Roughly it's a 1.4% uh, of the population uh, we see increasing. You know, households and registered vehicles are as well. Um, and we're also conscious that, um, you know, growth isn't always just about uh, uh, how we see uh, the impact on us. It's uh, finding other solutions, alternative response and service delivery models that we intend on adding under the banner of innovation this year to deal with some of the, the pressures. Next slide. Sorry, is it uh, two slides here? I'm, I can't see the animation. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry. As it was mentioned earlier by uh, Mr. Bowden, our officer per 100,000 population ratio still roughly uh, is uh, about middle of the pack and you know, the big 12. Um, we have had a, despite all the hiring we've done, we have decreased from a 1.48 a cop to pop ratio, we call it cop to pop ratio. Uh, when we look at, uh, if we can go to the next aggregation of the slide deck, please, is if we take the top of five uh, comparable uh, central, central uh, metropolitan areas across Canada, uh, Calgary to us is probably the closest for population growth. Toronto from the uh, next biggest municipal city, um, it, we have still a delta. It would take us roughly 200 officers to even catch up to the ratio of one to 100,000, uh, as you can see. And I, I think, you know, our, our perspective is, uh, you know, I'm always not uh, crazy about the cop to pop ratio. It's a national indicator, the only national indicator that we have for how things operate uh, from Stats Canada is to be thoughtful about who we have. To say this is our ratio is to be thoughtful of how we use them and not just you know throw more always at the solution. But we do know that we have continued pressures. Uh, and I would like to highlight that we do intend on maintaining this efficiency as appropriate, but it is a significant uh, uh, thing to either for us to be proud of, but also to be mindful of as we, uh, as we discuss with the board our pressures. So as I segue into what the efforts on mental health, intimate partner violence, and community policing and road safety look like, I'd like to show you how I approached it over the last year as, as let me say, as your chief. Next slide, please. The way uh, I sat down with my team is to say, we need to do things differently. We need the investment in mental health, uh, here in Peel Region, we were one of the last few to have uh, a frontline officer from 
start to finish, manage a domestic incident or intimate partner violence. Uh, in many regions, having a dedicated intimate partner violence unit was is not new. Uh, in Peel region, we were probably the last and probably the last out of the big, big 612 nationally. Our, our view to that was not to establish teams in each division, but to kind of embody that, go one step further. You know, our, our goal here, and my goal and commitment to you is to make sure Peel Region is the most progressive police organization in Canada, if not North America. And, you know, you know practically it doesn't happen in one year, but it does happen from changing the, our emphasis. And our efforts uh, with our team is to take not just, so in year we, we reallocated 48 officers to a dedicated intimate partner violence unit. Uh, we have taken them outside of a police facility and we are embedding them in a uh, Peel Safe Center. So we have the full access from a community safety well-being standpoint of, uh, you know, uh, financial, legal supports, uh, youth support, mental health, uh, addiction, legal, um, any of the social and not-for-profit services that individuals that are in a position of risk that need support would not traditionally get, we will be one of the first few nationally to have such an embedded model. And it's our commitment to look at things differently. Uh, we've been thankful for the Regional Appeal to help us sign the, the lease. We're working on the drywall and bricks and mortar, and we're hoping by March to have our 48 investigators there. So that means you've got from north to south across this region, and we're extending our support to OPP and uh, Calvin to make sure we access the same regional services uh, to, so that, uh, you know, people get handled in the way they should be. We understand human trafficking, family violence, and intimate partner violence is still number one. We have a highly diverse community which, with other factors that we need to apply different nuances to. And, uh, you know, so that represents about 48 officers that I needed to do that. Of course, the 16 for road safety. And I, I have to refer to the fact that each division had a neighborhood policing unit, but it, you know, I used it, it was like five kids trying to drive dad's car on Friday night. Uh, it all kind of looked a little different. They did an amazing job, but uh, the analogy is, you know, if you get a, a coffee at Tim Hortons in Halifax or you get one in Calgary, there might be lobster nets or saddlebags on the wall, but you want the coffee to kind of feel the same. Because we wanted to centralize the coordination and application of our new modernized policing approach to community safety well-being in a way. So we deconstructed neighborhood policing units, a youth programming, and we reconstructed it with these division, divisional mobilization teams. So that represented 47 new officers across all our, uh, our five divisions. Uh, we did have a deficit and a deficiency uh, from a criminal investigation overnight. If there was a significant incident, attempt murder or carjacking, there were gaps in our deployment of criminal uh, investigative officers. So we've now spanned a 24 seven coverage, but that acquired, required me to add another shift, which is about 64 across the region. We do have our pressures, uh, as I mentioned to you on call delays in the front line. And we are, you know, looking at things differently, uh, not the traditional model, but shifting to peak time policing and looking how we can re-earn our officers. And that is the establishment of real-time operations center at our 911 communication center. So roughly that's about, I needed during 2020, you know, 210 officers. I've been able to, as you can, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, within year, reallocate 183 officers. And, uh, you know, the importance for me and this is part of my assurance to you as council and my commitment to our police services board is to think of things differently. Uh, and that 183 officers was reshifting about, um, for me, that equates to about 27 million within year to these new priorities, which are the dotted line emphasis that I hope you see the golden threads to you, not just what uh, regional council has endorsed, but we, we too and the board has endorsed. Uh, you know, I think uh, the 27 is where you'll see in your budget uh, package, which uh, I have to comment on, has all the kind of details behind 
Uh, but I really wanted to highlight uh, how we're ending up with uh, our budget ask and approval from our police services board. So that leaves a shortfall of 27 officers that we're requesting in our 2021 budget. If you can go to the next slide, please. We, we do also know that there's a huge administrative uh, element to the organization. 2,200, roughly, of my organization is uniform. Uh, their balance is, uh, you know, the critical civilians that allow us to operate day to day. When I got here, I, not only the board asked me to commence a service delivery review, which I hired PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, but we also did an organizational top to bottom SWOT analysis in my first year. Uh, I knew that not only could I come with my own ideas, but I had to listen to what our people were saying and see where the efficiencies are. We also did a, a third organizational review on civilian staffing. The results are that uh, we reallocated uh, 31 positions, uh, some because of our collective bargaining uh, rights and making sure that we're looking after our people so that they have meaningful work take a little bit of more time for me to adjust. So in 2020, uh, about 800,000 worth of civilian staff, mostly administrative positions were moved to higher priorities to align to our innovation technology efforts and to supporting our new models of uh, policing. Uh, in 2021, we uh, anticipate in uh, 21 of our staff being re reallocated to new positions. So they don't find themselves into budget asks. Uh, and. Uh, you know, spent a lot of time with our civilian uh, staff and our finance staff. And we do go through uh, and assure uh, a line-by-line -line review of operating and capital budget costs. Uh, this this process, as uh, we, we believe over probably the last several years, has saved us $5 million in ongoing funding. Next slide, please. As I uh, conclude our presentation, uh, this is what represents our uh, overall 2021 budget, as, uh, is an increase of 3.75, which is under our forecast, forecasted increase of roughly 4% that we had projected. Uh, we were able to reduce some of that through our uh, work that we've done for reallocation. and represents 2.9% net tax levy for the region. And... Uh, you know, as a highlight of our increase, 68% of it is comprised of our salary and benefits. And, uh, you know, I think Mr. Boughton mentioned much of that is our collective agreements and our related benefits. Over my overall budget, 94% uh, of it is uh, uh, salary and benefits, which you, which you know. And, uh, and the, the increase of that 0.1% is primarily due to software maintenance and offsetting, uh, uh, but it was offset some by, by hydro savings. And the 5.2 equate to the 27 officers, which will go uh, dominantly to our front line uh, to deal with our uh, front line pressures, as well as uh, the real-time operations center. Next slide, please. I think it's important for me just to highlight some of our, our, our ongoing issues. 3% of my 3% of my overall budget comes from provincial funding and grant funding. Uh, we're thankful for some of the one-time funding, and we do hope to get more. We do know that the province is uh, one of the risks is they're revisiting their court security and prisoner transportation program, which expired with the province, and they're reviewing it. That goes to funding. Our, uh, we do have the busiest courthouse in Canada. There are uh, 12,000 cases a year at our Davis Courthouse. The next uh, lowest is uh, York Region, which is 6,000. And uh, and with that comes the management of uh, prisoners to and from provincial institutions. So we rely heavily on that small 3% funding to offset some of our costs. And uh, uh, so we're very appreciative of that. COVID, of course, uh, continues to impact us. We uh, do uh, ensure that the expenses to COVID are released. We're tracking our effort, efforts uh, as the municipalities are uh, as it pertains to that. Uh, we have budgeted for a $1 million draw from our working fund uh, reserve to cover additional expenditures. Uh, but uh, in our strategy, though, will be to access the safe start refunding from the region and province should that be made available for us to offset that. Next slide, please. As we shifted, just uh, touching on our, our capital uh, investments, 
uh, we, we know a lot of them are where we get to innovation as an investment. And many of them take time to see the, uh, uh, the, re the, the return on many of them, but we don't intend on just catching up to where Peel Region could be, but to be innovators and ahead of any police organization. And that platform is intended to be a vehicle for doing community safety better. It's not about getting shiny new technology uh, just in the hands of people, but it's making sure that we're more effective with the resources we have. And some of these projects or initiatives are the ones that we are advancing to. Uh, it's been some of my interests and the platforms we're looking at is being able to have, you know, officers connect people to services right uh, in a mobile uh, sense, right at, at, the, at the fingertips, uh, embedding crisis workers into a communication center, uh, which will help divert uh, activities out of our real-time operation center. We know uh, some of the initiatives are deeply intertwined with uh, data collection and automation of processes. Uh, and we are, a lot of our business processes have been completely revamped. We want to have this Google-esque feel to how uh, PRP is so that we're not, uh, you know, paralyzed by process, but that we're flexible and, and able to try new ideas. And if they don't work, to be able to say that didn't work and be able to move on. Our next slide, please. So as you know, our 10-year capital plan, uh, the major drivers are, of course, uh, you know, facilities and IT and infrastructure. They are uh, uh, critical ones that are mapped up, mapped out over the years. Uh, in addition to our regular replacements of vehicles, operational equipment, uh, specialized assets, information technology, our capital plan also includes, uh, you know, the new divisions and policing assets. Uh, we are still operating under our four division model that we've operated for d decades. We know that, uh, you know, Malton and uh, Brampton, North Brampton, and many of our communities have a desire for an increased presence of policing. And it doesn't just come from bricks and mortar, but it also comes from uh, being strategic about that. We're working with regional realty and both municipalities right now uh, on, on the acquisition of land. Uh, but these all form part of our, our long-term uh, capital uh, plan. Our, as we can go to the next slide, please. And in uh, summary, our 2021 budget really reflects, to you know, bring it back to the pressures that I know at the forefront of all our community, as you as a regional council, is on mental health and addictions, the violence strategy, and specifically a domestic part, uh, uh, intimate partner violence, uh, that bucket that I had previously discussed on priority populations, as well as road safety in our Vision Zero. Uh, we're thankful for the support of Regional Council and our, our uh, Police Services Board, we do intend on making sure that this organization does its best to be modern and meet the needs of our community. But I need to say that we do intend on shifting things in the years out so that we can make sure that the pressures that our community are facing now, we get ahead of it. And that this community is one of the safest for its population and sizes uh, nationally. And the change that a lot of what I've showed you uh, represents has never occurred before in this org organization. And it's uh, been a bit of, you know, through the fire hose for my team and staff, but we're all uh, excited about where the future holds and we're thankful for the opportunity to present our budget to you. Uh, with that, uh, you can uh, probably end the slide and uh, I will open it back to Chair Yenika and should there be any questions for uh, myself, Mr. Bowden, uh, and uh, Director Holmes as well. Chief, thank you very much, and thank you to Mr. Boughton and also to Chair Atia. I do have a list of questioners. It is Brown, Demerla, Santos, Sato, Dasco, Parrish, and Paleshi. Mayor Brown. Thank you, uh, Chair um, Yanika, and thank you, Chief Nish, uh, uh, for the presentation. Um, I've had the benefit of 
seen this uh, budget uh, developed and seen it presented a few times, but there are some aspects of it that I thought was important to draw out uh, for the benefit of regional council and the public that is 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 watching on the live stream. Um, I just want you to repeat, Chief Nish, what percent of your budget is um, labor costs and associated labor costs? Absolutely. Uh, so 90, 94% of my overall budget is uh, labor costs, salaries and benefits. And, um, you know, I, I think there needs to be an appreciation for how much of the budget is actually committed uh, through collective agreements that are beyond um, the, the, the purview of the, of the, um, of the chief or, or, frankly, regional council, because we're not in the business of reopening up uh, um, collective agreements or um, pension benefits that are uh, already uh, accrued. Um, what I wanted to, to say, one thing that impressed me about this police budget is the focus on mental health. And this is something that I think Mayor Crombie and myself have been active in advocating um, publicly. I think one of the challenges is I think the public perception is we want um, a mental health caseworker to go to every mental health call. And one thing that I found frustrating was learning um, about uh, the, the, the inability to, to, to do that. And, and I know you're moving the yardstick in the right direction, but I think some people think it would be as simple as the chief of police saying, OK, we're not going to go to calls. But I think you have some constraints under the Ontario Police Act. Um, and can you highlight for us um, what percent of calls we were able to respond to um, when you took over as chief um, with a mental health case worker and what we're looking at in this year ahead? Because if you look at the, the budget investments and where we're actually putting new dollars, mental health is one of the areas, but we can only do it in a manner that matches the health dollars and the mental health dollars um, that are brought by the province. And so it's I, from my understanding, you're going as far as the matching dollars go. Is is that correct? And, and, and can you ex explain again what percent of calls we're able to respond to with a mental health uh, worker? Absolutely, uh, Your Worship. So when I arrived in 2020, 100% uh, of the calls were responded by a uniformed officer. Uh, and, you know, they're amazing, amazing officers. We have the, some of the best trained globally here in Canada. Uh, we continue to invest in it. Uh, our initial uh, startup of the crisis response program was two officers a shift, which uh, was only achievable because our local uh, Lynn received funding to match us and meet us halfway with two crisis workers. We know statistically we need to be at eight cars a shift. And we are not there yet. So at the moment, our frontline people go to 62% of the calls, uh, mental health calls, uh, on their own. Uh, we have seen the benefit where we've been able to connect people to the services at the right time, get the right people to hospitals, uh, you know, completely uh, avoid uh, uh, the pressures that mental health have seen. But it's not optimal. And uh, it's not from my ministry, which is the Solicitor General's. Uh, we depend on funding from the Ministry of Health to go through, uh, to flow through the LIN and to CMHA. Uh, they're the machine that, you know, keeps doing as much as they can with what they've got, you know, the typical not-for-profit uh, story. Uh, we know that there's a willingness to be innovative. Uh, we, But within our space, you know, we know it's important because it saves lives, it gets people the services they need, and I'm willing to locate, allocate as much as I can within my budget to that, uh, but, it, but I do need the push on my side, which thus far hasn't, hasn't come from the province, but it does come through health. We're looking at creative opportunities, anything I can do to work with David Smith, uh, you know, to put a crisis worker in a communication center. Uh, as you know, we're going to a body-worn camera initiative, which means Conceivably, an officer could two-way stream to the crisis worker in 911, which is potentially a force multiplier. It's a different model. It almost exponentially allows her to connect to somebody in somebody's home. Uh, so these are all being explored. However, uh, we're dependent on health getting the money to hire somebody to put them there in that chair.
Okay, so, so just to be perfectly clear, you're saying to respond to all mental health calls with a mental health worker, we would need eight, eight cars. Um, and um, if you want to do that tomorrow, and regional council passes the motion saying we want the chief to do this, you don't have the capacity to do that because you need the partnership with the province. Is that correct? That's correct. We need uh, the provincial funding to the CMHA. And, and do you believe it would be a great thing for community safety if, if if we got there, if we had those eight cars? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And we wouldn't stop there. We'd be creative with other solutions as well. Um, it, you know, it was reflected in, in council's uh, motion, specifically the first bullet point was to, to seek uh, opportunities to advocate for that funding. And, you know, as thankful as I would be to get it, I'd, I'd you know, I'd rather see David Smith at CMHA get it so he can he can meet me at the doorstep for sure. Yeah. And so it, it would be helpful if our regional council and the mayors in Peel region continued to um, take that message to Queen's Park that this is something that um, is an integral tool we need in our community safety response. Absolutely. Okay. I also wanted to ask, um, you know, we've had uh, a number of community activists in Brampton talk about response times. Um, I've heard from groups in the northeast of the city and the northwest of the city talk about um, how to get faster response times. Um, and I think the, the immediate request tends to be infrastructure, bricks and mortar, where they want a station. And um, maybe on a higher level, if you could speak to us, how this budget moves us closer to faster um, response times. Sure, absolutely. And so just let me say the sentiment is people want service delivery. You know, they don't want to wait hours for an officer to respond to uh, a break and enter where they've called in and said, look, looks like somebody was in my house. You know, they're probably long gone. And our communications uh, person says, you know, please wait in your car till the officer responds. And that's sometimes, you know, unfortunately can be hours because there are higher priority ones. Uh, while we deal with the high priority ones, we, we want to be thoughtful about how to get there. And that comes from matching our growth. We have a long-term plan and really it's the deployment of officers, not the bricks and mortar. Part of that is actually matching the growth. We know we double the rate of growth that Toronto is based on the provincial data uh, in Peel over the next 10, 20 years, predominantly in, in North Brampton and the intensification in Mississauga. And um, we've got the same four divisions that we police from for the last decades. And it's a, and just to build a new station, which is part of our plan, uh, our, our plan has a fifth division. Uh, it needs, you know, several hundred hundred officers to leave that premise to start their shift and be deployed. Uh, and that can't probably all happen in year five or budget year, we need to continue to grow to meet those needs. And uh, as you know, our cop to pop is already at a moderate level or low one. Uh, so those demands that really people see as response times is just about us getting there. And, you know, Councillor uh, Parrish and I have talked many times about that feeling of presence in a community is what they want. They want that feeling back in, you know, Malton or whether it's Northeast Brampton, uh, you know, People may feel that when they see the sign of a community station, like the Malton station was a, was, a, was a good move because it brought something back that people had to reassure them. But the addition of small bricks and mortar places don't actually allow us to deploy more people from there. It's, staying, it's the same finite number of officers that are leaving, you know, here Ontario or uh, Peel, Peel Center Drive, uh, you know, doing that. Uh, we've got some creative discussions happening in the interim, and you know we're working with uh, regional realty. Listen, your your help for me uh, to really help lock down land to help you know really get to an accelerated plan. Uh, uh, look at doing things creative. We've had a great discussion with the Greater Toronto Airport Authority. We know we have a contract to police within the four walls of the GTA, but there's an, you know, is there's a potential for some of my officers to drive across the street and police Malton from there to be there in minutes across the road? Yes, and these are the creative ways we're looking at it, but it's still the same number of officers that we've got now, which is why I think, you know, the pressure and growth from response times is a real one. 
you know, if that was my mom, your sister or sibling or neighbor, it uh, it's unacceptable. And we, we get that. We totally get that. Uh, and I, no offense to my f- friends in, in uh, Toronto and the urban areas, I love them dearly, but we don't want to be in just a response method. You know, we want to be able to unravel, you know, low, low priority calls that are as important as a high priority for that person who's calling in. And uh, yeah. In my last question, Chief Nish, is I, I want to say um, that uh, you've had a lot of wins this year. Um, the, the Human Rights uh, Tribunal uh, commitment, uh, you know, you've, um, you know, I think you're making us proud as as, uh, as Chief of Police, and I've certainly noticed uh, um, how nimble you are and um, adapting to the needs of the community, and I've got great confidence that we have the right person uh, leading uh, the, the, the Peel Police. Uh, but one of the things that I think attracted a lot of people uh, to you uh, when you were coming in as, as chief of police was your ability to be ahead of the curve on technology. And I thought my concluding question um, would be for to give you an opportunity to speak about how you're using technology to be more agile, nimble within policing. And I see, you know, municipalities are now using automatic, automatic speed enforcement devices to um, because you obviously can't put an officer in front of every school. Um, how are these technologies being incorporated with your efforts to crack down on street racing? You know, I look at some of the gang activities, how you've brought in CCTV cameras on highways. What what has been the success of the CCTV cameras? Has that uh, provided, uh, has that been a useful tool? And what other technologies are you using to really make sure the Peel Police um, are uh, on the cutting edge of technology in, uh, in 2021? And thank you so much for your, your dedication. Thank you, Your Worship. So, you know, here's the speed dating version of uh, my my approach to uh, innovation technology. It's not the panacea for anybody. And people can invest in them, and they have a shelf life. They have to be evergreen. Our, our view and our approach to this, it needs to be a vehicle, a gateway to serve people better. So, for example, you know, you know, our officers still have a flip notebook where you can buy a home electronically uh, and sign for it on an iPad. You know, our officers are, uh, you know, got flip notebooks. And and so the normal idea would be, you know, let's get them a mobile device. Well, it could be just a plate of glass to send an email or make a phone call or a call. Uh, uh, but we want to go one step further. We want it to be free them from their vehicles, allow them to get information. One of the applications we're looking at is an AI-powered uh, a solution which allows an officer to, at the roadside, connect somebody to mental health referral to a variety of different services in real time. You know, the ability for CCTV cameras, I know there's a consternation to it, but can I tell you, we solved a fatal motor vehicle hit and run in one of our municipalities, thankfully, because we were able to see uh, the second vehicle involved. Uh, uh, we solved the homicide of Jason Ramkishun because we had no eyewitnesses. And I know those are the you know the most egregious ones, but in a, in a day and age where we want to really strengthen it. And our view is to say, look, Imagine if that came back to a communication center. And I gave the illustration of, you know, not in a crisis method, but an officer that's standing in somebody's home that wanted to just connect the parent to services because they're having a difficult time with their 14-year-old. If they could live stream from their body camera into our crisis, uh, into a communication center where there's a crisis worker, maybe a settlement worker, looking at opportunities to do things is is all fantastic. So our, our innovation... Uh, platform is all intended to enhance it. You know, we've just embarked on preparing ourselves for the public to send us a video instead of calling 911. We have some huge milestones for uh, 911 that we are legislated in our region to do. And can I tell you, we're going to lead that way to provide better service so our community can send us information in a way, be able to provide our public information in a way and from business intelligence having our officers connected and out of their cars um, is uh, is a critical way to do things. Uh, and we're partnering with our ed- education institutions from the innovative Ryerson Sheridan. Sheridan's got a virtual reality thing, uh, uh, programming where they're going to Im- look at embedding programming to allow us to do training for public. Uh, 
some of their programs are trying to be on the innovative side. Uh, and we want to leverage, you know, P3 partnerships. So a lot of our approach is about not doing things traditionally uh, and looking at it as a vehicle for doing things better. So the investments we see here are going to help with, you know, child exploitation, uh, human trafficking, civil remedies to grant uh, gang intervention, uh, some of the CCT camera cameras that we're uh, dovetailing in directly connect with the provincial grant funding for digital evidence management. It's, you know, I could go on forever, uh, but it's really giving us, taking us from, it's like an episode of Back to the Future, right? We're, we're really just jumped in into the next uh, uh, next platform. Uh, and uh, again, it's your investments don't live and die with something on a shelf. They're supposed to be a vehicle for us to do things better. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Uh, Councillor DeMerla. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, uh, Chief uh, Darayapa. I just want to thank you for your detailed presentation, and I really want to zero in on the mental health uh, response that you spoke to. As you know, Councillor Downey and I had uh, brought forward a motion uh, on this very topic, and I'm really, really pleased to see how invested you are in this and fully supportive of uh, everything that you seek to do, and so I just wanted to speak to that. I also want to thank you. Uh, I know that uh, police presence in Cooksville has increased, but I want to say, even as I acknowledge that, we need more. Uh, it's really a hot spot for uh, petty crime right now, and uh, I am going to continue to need uh, your help and support. Uh, it's one of the tools, not all of the tools, uh, but overall, thank you for your presentation today. Very well done. Thank you. Councillor Santos. I apologize, I pressed the wrong button. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, Chief, and thank you for uh, your presentation. Um, I echo some of the comments from Mayor Brown as well as from uh, Councillor DeMerla in, in thanks for uh, shifting, making some of those shifts into um, a different model of uh, policing and, and the services within police, particularly on the domestic violence, um, intimate partner violence file, you know, that I'm particularly um, passionate about that side. Um, I, I have an overall question just around transparency of the police budget itself. Um, you had mentioned that we have the police budget in in our package, in our budget binder. Um, I, I've been looking at the budget for the past couple of weeks and, and I, I don't have anything um, in my budget binder on it. And, and then I tried to look online for more details, um, like more line by line details on the budget and I couldn't find it online. I did see that the budget from last year was, was online. So if you could just comment on, on the transparency side and how we could get better uh, and more transparent on, on the police budget, simply because it is such a big ticket item on, on the property tax bill. Um, and, uh, and, it, you know, and if you could also comment on um, perhaps on the administration side uh, when it comes to potential savings, uh, you know, even if there's small savings here and there, it could add up to a lot, whether that's on furniture or equipment or various other things that we could perhaps cut back on just to, to relieve some pressure off of off the, um, the police budget. So those are my comments in addition to obviously the tremendous thanks uh, for the work that you are doing to, to update and modernize the police service in, in Peel Region. Thank you, Councillor Santos. And um, you know, I, I'm hoping, but I can't see it that there is that everyone received the package that comes along with our presentation. Uh, the you know the detailed board budget is uh, that of the board, the police services boards. Uh, but the the package that should be there, I'm hoping that you know. I'm hoping that somebody that I can see on the screen gives me a thumbs up, has that document uh, at, at, the, at the least. As it pertains to, you know, the efficiencies, you know, we recognize that we're stewards of uh, taxpayers' dollars, regardless of the fact that it goes through, you know, the Police Services Act legislation delegates it to the board. And we 
completely agree that, you know, you know, our but to be discerning on how we look at savings is at the at the foremost. You know, we've got a division where when it snows, the snowflakes come in through the windows. You know, it uh, there's a lot of uh, things happening that we're trying to improve, but we also have to look after our our assets. And we are very thoughtful. I can assure you, we're very thoughtful on how that 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 proceeds. And you know, to that extent, you know, why I wanted to reflect in my budget was, you know, I believe that the needs of the community need to drive my activities. And, you know, very clearly we know what those are. I, you know, I've, I've concluded the presentation and mentioned what they are from mental health, the intimate partner violence and road safety. And insofar as that is that, uh, you know, I, I hope I, I was able to articulate how important and thoughtful we are at making sure we take what we've got and reallocate it to that within our reach. So, you know, the 183 officers is, We've never posted that many jobs before internally for people to apply for. It had put this organization in a, in a real tailspin. Uh, but that's our commitment to really affect that change. I, I, I hope uh, you know we can continue to assure you that our commitment is to always be good stewards and thoughtful of it, but also to meet the pressures and needs uh, of, of a growing community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sato. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Chief Nish, a really good presentation. And I, I really want to applaud you for the changes that you've made. Um, I think last year I was a little critical that you didn't do it all in the first two months <laughs> uh, that you uh, that you came on board. But um, you, you have certainly done a lot in the past year, and I've seen it uh, probably mostly, as you mentioned, through the um, through the road safety side of things, and also working with you on the community safety and well-being plan. And uh, I've been very impressed with the changes that have been made, and how the officers are being deployed. And you know, the um, putting the community safety and well-being plan into road safety, I think, was a huge step, and can work. Hopefully, will work in the future to avoid tragedies such as um, as the one that happened in Brampton. So um, kudos on that. Um, so I, I do have a couple of questions and I'm sure you won't be able to answer some of them um, and, and staff probably can. So I will go through them and then whoever can answer them. Um, first one actually is to you and I would like you to comment on the status of the police in the school program, which um, I think is a, is a vital program. You and I have had a discussion with Mark um, on this in the, in previously, and um, uh, I was hoping to see it um, reinstituted again this year. Of course, with schools not open, things are all up in the air anyway. But maybe you could update us on that. Um, I would also like staff, uh, one of your finance people perhaps, or our finance people, to comment on um, a statement that's in one of our reports, 7.3, and I'm gonna ask it now because it relates to police, and that has to do with the changes to user fees now being um, dealt with by the Police Services Board, not by the region. Um, and I don't know what the impact on budgets is for that, so perhaps um, someone could make a note and respond to that. Um, I have a question with regard to assets, and you mentioned that near the end of your presentation. Um, and again, I had this question for the report we have on assets. I had it last week, it's been deferred to this week, but it does apply to you. Um, we were told some years ago that the Re Peel Regional Police assets, the buildings in particular, belong to the region of Peel. And we had been looking, the previous CAO had committed with staff, um, all of whom I think are gone now, um, to including the Peel Regional Police assets under the Regional Peel assets so that we could have a better idea from a council perspective what those assets are, um, what the problems with them are. You mentioned about wind coming through the doors and windows. Um, because they ultimately are regional appeal assets, 
um, they, we, we don't ever get information on those. So I was disappointed in the report from staff that uh, we're dealing with later today that says that uh, they were not included in the region's report. And uh, so I, I would like someone to respond to that, first of all, why they're not included in the report and when are we going to get, as members of council, more detailed information on those police assets, as we do on all of the other buildings that uh, that belong to the region of Peel. And finally, um, with regard to the mental health, you have done a tremendous amount there. Congratulations on that. But uh, last year I had asked our commissioner if um, if she could comment this this year on how the region of Peel and I guess it's really two commissioners because it'd be health and social services, mainly social services, um, how the region of Peel staff are supporting Peel Regional Police because we're, we're putting money into both and some of the, um, some of the uh, I don't wanna say projects, some of the services overlap. So are we putting more into our end of things in the regional department in order to ease the burden on Peel Regional Police. And, and I know that was part of our discussion also at the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. I'm not sure we really had that fully ironed out. So, Mr. Chair, those are my questions. Um, and whoever wants to answer each one of them, um, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll put them out to the team in turn, perhaps starting with the chief. Thank you very much, and thank you for the questions. Uh, and I'll, I'll definitely answer, uh, speak to the uh, first and fourth, and maybe lean on my colleague uh, uh, Carolyn Holmes to speak to the other two. So, uh, as it pertains to, you know, I think uh, all of council would benefit from knowing this. Uh, uh, as we've seen in many communities, uh, the footprint of officers in schools has um, has really, you know come to the forefront. We are uh, guests in their schools, but I'd like to first say that the value in Council of Seder, you and I chatted about this, and I think I've talked to a few of you, is, you know, in, in my opinion, our ability to engage young people is one of the most valuable things we could possibly do. You know, 170,000 young people, uh, an interaction point with us is an important thing. You know, I'm I'm a product of meeting a police officer in 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 my education and and my eyes being turned to the relationships and the value of that. That being said, you know, the programming of us in schools has been good, but it it does need to evolve and and it needs to be nurtured. Uh, it uh, it probably has to become more uh, more akin to. Uh, uh, modern health-related approaches and positive engagement. Uh, I'm, I'm not an advocate for the, you know, the whole monitor feel uh, uh, of officers. You know, our role should be there, just like the community safety well-being model, is to, to be able to mitigate risk and help with prevention and social development. And perhaps the days have go are gone of us, you know, standing up and doing, telling kids about uh, drugs, which really conceivably is a health-related uh, delivery of a subject matter, but we're better off to talk about, you know, cyber related crimes or uh, bullying and road safety. There's a space for us and also to help with positive engagement. So where we are at is um, uh, the, the, our traditional SRO program no longer exists. Um, we are gone into extensive, you know, consultations with our community to see what, if anything, is a footprint and what does that look like if there is an engagement piece. Uh, you know, strangely, COVID is upon us, which you know prohibits us from being there anyways. So we've been able to do with our Catholic board, uh, private schools particularly, uh, you know, continued, you know, engagement virtually. Uh, our intent is to, to inform uh, a new program, a youth engagement program that'll come out of our divisional mobilization units uh, we will have to look to the school board to say, yes, we allow you to step back in here or not. Uh, that'll be, you know, obviously the board's uh, decision. Uh, but we are willing to provide an engagement program that allows us to, to do what's, you know, appropriate in this day and age uh, from a positive standpoint with an equity lens. 
uh, to make sure that, you know, we don't uh, exacerbate uh, issues of the past that may have existed. So I don't know if I just confused you or <laughs> if I told you that, you know, we're still in discussions. Uh, <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. That that was very clear. <laughs> Okay. And the, the, the fourth piece on mental health and, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, probably we can probably chat maybe offline at a regional level with our, our, our partners at, at the region and staff is, uh, you know, the as it pertains to the investment from the region and mental health, you know, there's some discussions to be had because I, I think the vehicle for doing that, Councillor Sato, is, as you know, we've, we've struck a uh, uh, an action table, which is supposed to be the, the working group to do it. And now that we've started the New Year's, maybe come back to the table and say, okay, what, what could probably, you know, be taken back to council for uh, consideration? We know we saw Toronto City Council discuss piloting or researching the piloting of alternate mental health response. We have an idea that we're working on, which we'd love to sit down with regional council. That is a community-led possibility which would be first of its kind again, um, as it pertains to funding, uh, maybe that, that's, a, that's a proper format for us to look at it and how we can coordinate better. There, there's a lot of ideas, but I, I think there's an opportunity there just to kind of leave it open-ended with that. So I would suggest then that um, we, we could give direction to you <laughs> as the chair and Nancy as the co-chair and staff to, um, uh, to work to convene that action table in uh, now that we're into the new year and we can have a much further discussion on where we can go. I think you're right. That's, that's where we need to bring it in and to bring the other stakeholders in as well. Absolutely. I'll, I'll talk to you. Uh, Nancy and I talk every day, so we'll make sure we connect on that. And, uh, and we're very thankful for her team uh, for doing the heavy lifting on this. Chief, did we have somebody from staff with regards to questions two and three? I think you went uh, and addressed one and four, but I think Councillor had a couple of other points that your staff may have noted if they want to speak to them. Absolutely. We'll, we'll, I'll have Carolyn speak to you, uh, charger, uh, charge and user fees, as well as the asset matter now. Carrie Lynn, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, you are correct that our user fees are no longer part of the region's bylaw. The way um, that came about is earlier this year, we were doing a review of our budget policy. And in that, we realized that our user fees uh, included in the bylaw, as you know, council approves our budget as a whole and not line by line items. So we had done a review and realized that we were one of the only police services where our fees were a part of the region's bylaw. So I can assure you that we still do a thorough review of our fees every year, and they are presented to our board for approval as they have been in the past. They're just not part of the region's bylaw now. Um, but they will be posted um, upon budget approval to, um, to our website. And then secondly, in regards to assets, you are correct. Our assets do belong to the Region Appeal. Uh, we are participating with Region Appeal staff in a new enterprise asset management system. And that system is expected to come live in uh, 2023. And at that time, all of our assets and all of the data and whatnot will be shared within one system. And at that time, then we are, the state of our assets will also be included in that report. So that's, that's two years away. Um, could we as regional councillors, because um, you know the, these are assets that, that belong to the region appeal, and I think it would be very helpful to us to um, to know today what um, you know as we do with our other assets. Is there any way that um, I mean I'm sure you know because you have to plan ahead for your uh, for your infrastructure budgeting what the condition of the assets are. So would it be possible for regional council to receive? Um, that information in either a report or um, or a memo to uh, to regional council. Uh, Councillor Sato, I think Stephen Van Offwegen may have a thought on that from finance. Stephen, thank you. 
Uh, through the chair, thank you. We are working closely with Peel Police. They're, the starting point for Peel Police was further behind from all of the other regional assets that we do uh, report on to the infrastructure report. Um, I would be hopeful that we would be in a position prior to 2023. Our technology will, will be fully deployed by 2023, uh, but we are currently doing the uh, scorecarding without that robust enterprise technology today. But we'd have to, I'd have to go back to our director of enterprise asset management. And certainly as we come back, uh, we can probably provide an update to council on the status of that either an interim report to council at some point in time during 2021 to give you a clear picture of where we are and how soon that level of detail could be provided. But they are, we are working very closely and uh, it's a very good collaboration. So I, I, I guess I'm confused then. Does that mean that, uh, and Carrie Lynn, I guess I'll ask you, that you really don't know right now what condition your assets are in? Thank you. Uh, Are having some technical difficulties. No, we do. Um, to do so, um, we'll take that back to our board. We'll have to uh, report to them first on that. But we do. We um, during our capital budget, we definitely do a thorough review of our assets and we plan out. We also facilities does a review of assets to plan out uh, repairs and. Um, initiatives that they have to take on as well as our IT right. Um, Fleet, same idea. They have a pretty good, not a pretty good, they have a really good idea of when replacement of those assets, um, as well as just general maintenance for all of those major areas. Okay, thank you. I would have thought so. So I, I guess my request then um, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, you sit on the board and uh, Councillor Medeiros and Mayor Crombie is um, that I, I think that information should be provided to Regional Council. Um, as your assets are our assets, and uh, you know, if someone asks me, I like I don't have a clue what what condition they're in, and it's great that the board knows, but the board doesn't own them, so <laughs> I think that's information that should be shared with um, with with the region. And you know, I don't need a whole lot of detail. I I just like to get an overview as to where things are, um, you know, because I, I mean, you're going to come forward. The board's going to come forward with requests for budget for those assets. And I think we should know ahead of time what, you know, what condition they're in. And, you know, Councillor Santos spoke about transparency. I think that's uh, one other area of transparency that um, that I would like to see. And I think our citizens should know as well. So, and I, I'm not accusing the board or the, anyone for Carrie Lynn or the chief for hiding anything. I just think it's information council should have. Thank you, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Carrie Lynn, for your answers, Mr. Chair. And thank I can, uh, Chair Anika, I can just uh, follow up to that. Is that uh, Council Sater? I'll speak to the the board. I, you know, the, the the complexity is that it's a legislative requirement for them to get a facilities plan presented to them, and there's there's a lot of work behind in the machine behind uh, all our assets, which you know we'll uh, happily take that offline to find a way to. Uh, get you an overview if, if it's possible and work through the appropriate chain. And, and I would add that if there's anything that should not be made public um, with regard to it, that uh, that I, I fully understand that. But, you know, we receive confidential information all the time at Council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Carrie Lynn. Uh, next on, Councillor Dasko. Thank you through the chair and Chief Nish. It's great to see you coming into your second budget. Uh, the first one, I think, was really a trial by fire budget uh, as you as you just got sworn in. Um, and then this one has not been, I think, that that much kinder to you in the middle of, uh, of a pandemic. But uh, I just wanted to, I guess, reference towards the road safety component of the budget, which I thought is, is great to see. Um, the uh, the emphasis and uh, and kind of that that, that return to that. Uh, this is uh, in, uh, in in my ward certainly in southern Mississauga. It's uh, it's uh, probably right at the very top of the list of, uh, of what I hear from from constituents and residents. And uh, and one I guess a project that was started last year uh, was uh, was Project Noisemaker. 
with regards to, uh, I guess, as a compliment to to the Erase program, and also for uh, for those loud mufflers and, and, and things of that nature. Um, I just wanted to um, ask you, <clears throat> just uh, just with regards to that, uh, hoping that we will see that come back uh, again this year, Project Noisemaker. So I guess that, that that's a question, and also. Um, will we see uh, with this new complement? Um, I guess some with the with the current uh, uh, complement of officers as well, uh, and the new complement. Will we see uh, an increased presence on our roads? And uh, and, and I ask just because uh, you know uh, as we've gone through this, and we're still going through as a city a uh, a, a residential uh, turn, not not all resident. Councillor Dasko, if you can hear me, can we've hear lost you. Uh-oh. There you are. That sound. Carry on. Try again. Gar very okay. good. Carry, yeah, carry I'm on. I'm just asking, as we've, we've done a, a, a switch into from 50 kilometer an hour defaults to 40, uh, and also around our, our school zones down to 30, uh, if, we're, if we're able to see, um, with these resources, some more... Uh, boots on the ground, if you will, in our communities, because that's one thing that, uh, that we do get asked about. And so that's one thing I just wanted to, to ask you was just with regards to uh, things like Project Noisemaker and, uh, and just having more, uh, more visible presence on our streets, because uh, that's uh, something that is a, a big need. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Dasko. And uh, we can assure you that our efforts to do coordinated enforcement in the form of uh, projects or initiatives will continue. Uh, and for uh, everyone's reference, uh, everybody, I think I may have heard from everybody on the screen at least once about uh, the noise complaints from constituents. And, you know, it's a real thing. It's a real thing co compounded by lower regular traffic at the early stages of the pandemic. You, people heard it more. But then there is, without a doubt, an, uh, a movement for the modified mufflers and exhausts. So Noisemaker was just a project that lasted literally 60 days and uh, had over 570 improper noise and unnecessary uh, improper muffler and unnecessary noise offenses. That type of project combined with Erase and Drift and all those initiatives with our partners will continue. We It was a success last year. And if people are listening, we're going to be back out, making sure that that is uh, addressed again. Uh, but you, you appropriately identify that, you know, generally speaking, the additional presence in communities from a road safety standpoint is, a, is uh, helped by the visibility of officers or our enforcement. Uh, you know, we, knowing, say, we have a finite uh, number of officers, we've augmented it and added more. Uh, our approach is shifting now. It's shifting to not just the, the enforcement's always going to be our bread and butter, but we've got to get uh, a thoughtful with how we, you know, use our information, get to the right communities, right time, the right streets, getting more community safety neighborhood uh, uh Speed zones also impacts the number of, uh, you know, officers that we can get out to, you know, double down on them, and so we're 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 changing our approach. The whole community safety well-being model is has been reoriented. We've added a different, a new inspector in there and a new team, and it's kind of that, you know, I wish I could find like what these strategies look like, but you know, year one is you know getting them into concept, getting it resourced. In year two and three, we really want to actualize on it. So I guess this is a, a statement of optimism that we'll, we're going to do our best. Of course, you know, we can't be everywhere all the time. Um, every every ward or our, our zone, our area is going to require our presence. And that's why, you know, when I've been asked and, you know, mayors have asked me, I'm a proponent of the municipalities doing things on their own regarding speed enforcement. It, it kind of exponentially, it's like, better together approach. Uh, clearly, we know my role is 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 the one that shifts driver behavior. Um, 
but we also want to get upstream in, in a variety of different enforcement efforts. So it, where possible, we look forward to working with you, especially in, in areas that need it the most. Uh, always connect with me, Deputy Andrews, and uh, we'll happily work with you on that. Thank you. Councillor Parrish. Thank you very much. I have actually an opening comment and a closing comment and three questions. So I'm going to see if I can pack them all in quickly. Um, first of all, my opening comment is I truly appreciate the tone of this presentation. Uh, it's probably sat through 10 or 11 of these presentations. And in the past, it's always been huge slides filled with guns and slides filled with bullets and very sensational stuff to make us all quake in our boots. This has been focusing on community engagement, prevention, reallocation of officers, uh, and com community priorities. And I think you've done a fantastic job in this presentation. It's uh, sensible, it's calm, it's businesslike, and I really appreciate that. It's a delightful change. Um, my first question on page six, and I, this, I think Councillor Sato touched on this, you've got the Young Men's Empowerment Programs, and she touched on the school officers. We were about to tender the hub up in Malton, and what I'm hoping is you can assign some young officers in jeans to do some rap recordings with the kids, uh, pick up a basketball at the community centre, um, do some track coaching and maybe some cooking classes. That's the sort of uh, association that I think kids won't be intimidated by and they will learn, as I did when I was a child. My dad was a police officer in Toronto and when he'd come home from work in the afternoon in his uniform, all the kids would come pouring over to our front porch, ask him if he found any bad guys today and they were very comfortable with police officers. I don't think that happens these days. So I'm hoping that uh, your young men's empowerment programs um, can be quietly moved into the hub so that it, it's not uniformed officers walking around. Um, I like gray hair, but no gray hair either. I, I can see you don't have to worry about that. Um, I, shaved my, I shaved mine off, Councillor Parrish. The, the second question is uh, the break and enters. Um, I'm interested in whether the uh, police Act would allow uh, graduates of community college in plain clothes in small utility vehicles to go out and do the investigations. Uh, you'd get a two for one salary wise, two for one car equipment and all the rest of it wise. And I don't know if the police act allows that. I know they've gone to that in that direction in England and it's working extremely well. And my third question is I think there was a comment during your presentation about salary and benefits and agreements and pensions that you can't go back and redo them. Um, my understanding, and I could be wrong, is that um, the, the uh, agreements that we've got um, sometimes preclude uh, more officers uh, because we pay the officers we've got extremely well and we're committed to, to good benefits and good packages. And that's directed in negotiations by generally by the police officers. It, when you do those comparisons of numbers of police per 100,000 people, do you also compare salaries and benefits and see if there's any dis disparity there? And my last comment is uh, the Molten Station is fantastic. It's much like a duck. It's going smoothly on the surface. And then down in the basement, you've got all kinds of excitement excitement and activity going on. I don't think everybody realizes that it's like a officer drop in downstairs. They have their lunches there, they write their reports. There's cruisers out there all the time and it's 24 hours a day. And it is, for the people who realize that it's very comforting and uh, you've done a fantastic job there. I appreciate it. The whole community appreciates it. And um, the attitude to, to Malton has changed considerably and I hope the crime statistics show that soon. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parrish, and I, I've taken good notes. So, uh, uh, number one regarding are the the men's youth, youth empowerment hub. It's a yes, 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 uh, all, all the way. I, I think again, not to keep. I've I've got my to do list. We can happily chat uh, offline. Uh, we are uh, really excited about that opportunity. It falls directly in line with some of the new initiatives that we'd like to start rolling into, especially up in, in Malton. We, we want to do it, Acorn and McCurdy and all the different areas that have a like a 
a, a footprint that we can access. So uh, we'll happily plug in, plug into that. I think, you know, I'd like to talk, tell you about a couple of other initiatives that we're, we're doing as of this last week Been ha happy to, uh, to start the establishment of a, uh, uh, with partnership with an organization called ProAction, you might be aware of it from the tr from the Toronto footprint. It's basically a, a charitable entity that's nothing to do with us that sets up funds to allow us to run youth pro officers to run youth programming. So we'd happily chat with you about it. I, I did it once in the previous region that I was at, and it is about to start here, which means that we can get additional funding for programs that are kind of obviously outside of our budget, outside of what maybe can be achieved in the hub which would come along with some of the programs that you could do for uh, young men and women and, and, you know, right from the physical activities to the creative to STEM, uh, be happy to chat with you and that would be a perfect location for that. Uh, the, the break and enters, I know you, you had, had sent a correspondence once before and I remember talking to my team and saying, you know, ultimately, we've got more work than we can, ha we can handle, you know, that's the reality. And uh, would happily, chat and peel that back about whatever all uh, first of all i'm all for alternative opportunities to do the low low tier things that don't need a always a you know a fully trained officer to go to and you know one of our thoughts for example we've for scenes of you know if somebody breaks into a house we send somebody over to dust fingerprints as of you know the end of last year we've shifted a group of six that are civilians so, you know, it's like a halfway there in that concept, but what you're talking about is, are there collaborative opportunities to, to do really low tier stuff? Like, you know, we get, you know, the stolen bikes and come and pick up a lost wallet. And, and so in that space, just, I, I think this is where we need to reimagine. Uh, so our, our office can get to those priority one calls and priority two ones. And it is not an egress out of, what's important, but I think this is the reality. There's a space for other solutioning. And um, I appreciate your your prompt and, and that suggestion. And we're, you know, I think as a team, we're, we're like, we all agree that there's something in there to be explored and we'd happily discuss further, even some of the specific ideas. Um, the salary, you know, the com comparators. Yeah, you know, can I first say, I, you know, in the bargaining process, it is a, what inevitably happens is that each bargaining entity, the, the, the association, which is, uh, you know, the union, as well as, you know, the boards are all comparing where we're at. Uh, the way it normally rolls out and, and we can happily, we don't have the data where everybody sits, but it's almost always, you know, $30, $40, like plus or minus over the last uh, bargained agreement. And benefits fluctuate slightly. They, you know, I think in most negotiations, they compare it to the last municipality that compared, and it's always used as a frame of reference. So, we the at any any point that that data continues to change because some municipalities are in the middle of, of bargaining, but uh, that's all available. I just don't have, happen to ha have it, and it would show where where, where organizations and municipalities are at for sure. Yeah. It just it doesn't sit in the form of like stats can cranks out the data. We kind of have to like play the phone game and call people to say, "Hey, where are you at? Where are you at?" But it's all it's all roughly there for sure. Yeah. Well, thank and, you very uh, much. Thank you. And the the last uh, point about um, uh, you know, listen, I, I think we all agree. My people agree uh, when they drive around the community of Malton. The need for enhanced presence is there, is 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 there, and uh, I can assure you again, it's all part of our you know how do we serve this community better, uh, you know, and uh, you've heard me before. Uh, I'm not into growing thorns, and this is about us you know trying to solution things uh, in a in a smarter, better way, uh, and I, I really believe there's a lot there's a you know five year six year roadmap. Sometimes interim, interim solutions are needed and we can probably maximize on them to one step more. So thank you for your comments, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pileshi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chief. Uh, Mr. Chair, thanks, Chief. Uh, Chief, I'll forego the pat on the back and uh, I can call you later tonight if you, uh, if you require one. I have four quick questions. Uh, my biggest uh, request still today uh, remains police presence. 
if you look out your uh, your window, you see a police officer, you feel a little bit safer. Um, you talked a little bit about a strategic approach. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what that means and if you can provide any more uh, detail uh, to that. If not, maybe a, a future email um, or a future delegation to, to members of council um, could be a possibility. I'll roll right into my next question and that is around the next division has always been planned for the six years I've been a councillor and, and multiple years prior to, to that, the next division was always earmarked for Northwest Brampton. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe potentially provide any kind of types of timelines? Absolutely, thank you. I don't need the call. I was just waiting to hear what your questions were gonna be. So I don't need to be dusted off tonight. But uh, uh, as for your first question is, you know, the science behind deployment's always been, you know, officers police an area based on demand, and we deploy based on demand. But it's almost twofold. It's you know, are we thoughtful about, you know, traditional ways of meeting the demand, and are we thoughtful about traditional means of deployment? And and part of it has to be because we want to be thoughtful with the dollars and. Uh, and resources we've got is to really it gets overused, but be evidence based in how we do it. And can I tell you, we probably didn't have the most fulsome set of information and data to adequately say, look, this community is requiring more uh, resourcing than others. And it can't just be about volume of incidents. It has to be how time is being spent, the complexity of it. And so, and I'd be happy to chat with you afterwards. We've got a new command of innovation technology that's coming alongside the frontline side so that we can look at how resources are being deployed. We know that the number of officers needed on a Sunday night in a particular area is different than a Friday at 4 p.m. And, you know, our flexibility and ability to, to say, okay, we can't staff for the plane crash all the time, but we can staff for... We can be flexible to adjust. And one of the things we're wanting to do is add this ability in a real-time operating center to say, okay, we're seeing a surge in community X. We know that statistically every week it happens here. Can we augment uh, officers in there? And, you know, there's pros and cons to that. You know, are you having an officer that patrols an area that doesn't actually know the community and knows, oh, there's the, you know, the Johnsons or the Pileshis. So we want to be thoughtful about it. And part of this is getting that flow of back to a, a community-based approach uh, in a modern way. So I hope this isn't like, these aren't the droids you're looking for kind of answer, but it, we're trying to evolve our approach to being thoughtful, evidence-based, informed, real-time, uh, and looking at proper growth in, in municipal areas. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the building is our immediate priority is to go to a division five, a fifth division. And when the fifth division gets struck, it doesn't mean the, the patrol areas will look the same. We'll, we'll have to shift it, right? But right now I can actively say that we are working with staff at the region. Uh, they've been working in my year and then 12, 14 months here, uh, uh, regularly looking at uh, and working with the city staff. And I had a conversation with uh, CAO Barrick uh, within the last few days on where the opportunities are. And as you know, the prices of land continue to increase and the size and the needs. We're looking at every possibility from co-locating with municipal to regional assets to, uh, you know, land swaps, the whole deal. So uh, the moment I could put a, a fork in a piece of land, I'll be able to actually say the trickle down from that is this is how develop, you know, when shovel and ground bricks and mortar are. But really, to be honest with you, the challenge is there. The second big challenge for us from an asset is uh, we we do have to look at a uh, new administrative facility. That's not where I'm sitting. It's the 911 communication center records and and that that. That could be anywhere. That doesn't. That's not. A, that's an inward serving. It's not a public facing building. So that one has got a little bit more flexibility. But uh, Chair Unique and I have had many a chats about it, and uh, you know, not to be ambiguous about it, but it's front and center daily. You know, if 
if anybody has a Rolodex of somebody that's willing to give up some uh, uh, acres, uh, we're uh, we're happy to a chat. And you know, I don't also want to forsake the north for the south. You know, we we understand the intensification of Mississauga is huge, right, in Malton. So we will augment and change our service delivery based on when we get a proper footprint. And you heard my comment about in the interim, like. You know, there are, there are potential solutions that we're talking about that are creative. Uh, the new CEO for uh, GTA, Deborah Flint, remarkable individual, came from LAX. And they just want to, you know, that notwithstanding the pandemic, they want to see that become a community, right? Mm -hmm. And police like a community. We have a better in, in influence into the community if we maybe use that as a platform too. So we're looking at all solutions, Councilor Pelleschi, and we're happy to chat more. Thank you. Um, you've laid down the gauntlet, I think. What's the, um, my next question is uh, with respect to the relationship with the association and, and it's it's always a big part in having, you know, associations, unions um, and the organization to to really come together and, 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 and work together. Um, what's the relationship with the association <clears throat> and also how involved are they in the, in the budget process um, commenting on uh, during or, um, or after? So I, I can first say that, uh, you know, the association has a very distinct role and responsibility for the interests of its members. It's rooted in also uh, ensuring that we're, we are following our duties as management with our, with our staff, you know, in the nuances of policy, governance, abiding by the police, you know, we've got the whole Police Services Act machine uh, around us. And, uh, you know, that's the role and responsibility, and I respect that, you know, 100%. It, and, you know, we all are point, uh, our, our, my view is, and I'm not, hopefully not speaking out of school, there will be differences in opinions, no doubt, but we're pointed in the same direction, and that's, you know, good on the, looking after our people. You know, we gotta be good on the inside, good on the outside. Uh, we're not, it, I don't think any union environment's intended to be uh, allies or advocates, but we are aligned with the priority of our people. And uh, I am thankful for a relationship in the previous organization I came from, thankful for that too. And when it comes from that space, uh, I'll happily entertain, you know, the difficult discussion. So, you know, you know, We've got a long strategic plan, uh, Councillor Pelleschi, for this organization to make it the most progressive place and build on the best in class traditions of the past. And uh, we've got to stay the course and we're happy for them to come alongside of us. As it pertains to the budget, they're, they're not, uh, you, know, you know, clearly they can help drive priorities. You know, for example, if you know, the members are feeling that they're understaffed or they're, you know, or wait a second, the facilities aren't up to snuff, you know, they're another vehicle for, you know, you know, drawing attention to that. And, you know, that happens during the course of the year. You know, if it comes to, you know, they believe members aren't, civilian are sworn adequately, you know, resourced or supported, you know, that's where we have continual dialogue and that happens. As it comes to informing the budget, you know, we, we really have a very vibrant budget process that our, our team, like the whole machine, and I got to give them complete credit, you know, I always say they hired us, hired most of the officers because you can run a mile and a half and do a bunch of push-ups. You never find yourself sitting, at, you know, a regional council doing it. We they're the SMEs behind behind the scenes that that are are always looking at opportunities, being thoughtful, and um, you know, you know what we do is start off by saying. Here are our priorities, mental health, addictions, frontline policing, traffic, and innovation. And, uh, you know, and I'm not always perfect, uh, Councilor Pelleschi, but I always are open to en enhance dialogue with our association to help inform those priorities. Uh, you know, it's kind of my job is to set the vision and and hope my team around me can uh, help further that. And, uh you know, we really always hope that our members also align with that. And if the association's also supportive, that's, you know, a huge bonus. Good. Okay. Chief, my last question, and, and probably the, <clears throat> I think one of my most important, uh, we talk a lot about assets and our greatest asset being the, uh, the women and men 
um, in law enforcement and the well-being of our officers. They see some uh, horrific, uh, terrible, gruesome things. And gone are the days where you can go to the pub after work and drink those uh, drink those images away. It's a, it's a different day and age. Um, what are we doing uh, for their well-being, uh, their mental health? Um, what have you What have you done differently currently, and what's uh, uh, What are you thinking about long term in terms of uh, how we can how we can support our uh, our officers? Well, th thank you, Councilor Pileschi, for drawing uh, attention to a really, uh, you know, a critical piece is that, you know, when we swear in new officers, I tell their families, I say, you know, my goal is at the end of 30 years to send you somebody home the way you sent them to us. I say to our civilians, you know, we really want you to have a vibrant career here for how long it can be. But we know the realities of... Uh, you know, all first responders, whether it be healthcare, EMS, or firefighters, or police officers, are compounded by the cumulative uh, uh, stressors that they see. Uh, we have matured as you know, as a sector in how we see that. Uh, you know, upon my arrival, I'm, I'm thankful for some you know good, uh, this, uh, you know, establishment of. We have an, org an organizational wellness unit uh, that is here which is staffed by civilian sworn. They have access to clinicians. Uh, and, but the problem is they're in my building. And there's some stigma associated with ac accessing help uh, and wellness. So one of our immediate activities, I'm thankful that the board's uh, helping me work with the regional realty is to find an offsite facility for them to access programming and resources. We've become far more aware that, you know, when people put a uniform on or they come in civilian, the civilians is they also bring to them the pressures of their families, right? And uh, we, you know, when we talk about the, the negotiated bargaining benefits, some of it does help our members. It allows them to have support for their families and programs and benefits that are uh, extended healthcare benefits that, you know, weren't there before from a psychological services. You know, people can burn through psychological services pretty quick with two or three appointments. And, you know, those are important things for us to bolster. But what we also are doing is ensuring that we make it possible for it to feel okay to talk about it here. And that's a huge stigma piece, which, uh, you know, uh, as you talk about throwback ways of, commu uh, of, of managing that, uh, we, as of last week in Bell Let's Talk, have gone through testimonials of individuals and putting them out there just to make normalize the ability to have the convo to say that it's okay. Um, we do have programming in place that for high risk units that require uh, like baseline clinical you know, discussions. So we baseline them and we can evaluate. Uh, you know, there's some pros and cons to that. It's seen, it's a good program, but it's also seen as, oh, I'm being told to do that. Right. And we really want to normalize saying, you know, we, we've sent people to Los Angeles. I've sent people to LAPD in the last year. They have embedded clinicians right in their divisions at the ground floor. So when uh, somebody's coming in from a, you know, a baby death call, they're, they're seeing the clinician. And I'm not saying that that's the uh, apex model, but there's ways of, you know, diffusing the stigma around conversations that we're all looking for. Uh, and we, we are a proponent that we're not the solutions on our own also. Uh, we do know that uh, there are entities like uh, Beyond the Blue and Boots on the Ground, which are grassroots entities that are doing an amazing job, because sometimes legitimizing it comes better not from management, right, but from their peers. So it's that concept of peer support. And I, I have to say our our, uh, our police association and President Woolley have been, uh, you know, uh, proponents of that. We also have had discussions with our other emergency services entities, uh, Chief Dundas, our Chief Boyles, and uh, our new Ms. Sagar Fire Chief. I haven't got a chance to connect with her yet. I'm looking forward to it. Our, you know, what can we do that provides support for across the board, right? Uh, it, uh, it's the economies of scale, perhaps, too, in uh, getting emergency beds, potentially for people in crisis where benefits don't kick in. Uh, but our approach here is whatever we need to look after our members, uh, we'll do it. And it uh, is uh, our foremost uh, priority because ultimately they're the people that are showing up at the, your doorstep, right, and the community's doorstep. So uh, I hope that was it. Uh, off the cuff, appropriate off the cuff summary. Yep. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Vicente.
Councillor Vicente had you on my list. If you're speaking, we can't hear I'm you. Sorry. Um, through you, Chair, thanks, Chief, for your presentation. Uh, one thing I don't think you touched on in your presentation uh, was um, the kind of work that you've had to deal with uh, over the past two years since the new regulations that affect uh, the sale of legal cannabis and the advent of uh, stores and shops. I was wondering if you could just comment on um, the funding that you've received uh, that resulted from Brampton's decision to adopt the stores, how you've uh, been able to use it. And also, if you could uh, let us know or inform um, on what kind of impact you've had, whether positive or negative, uh, in terms of uh, more police time, additional use of resources, or is it less? Um, are you experiencing more or less work by your officers to deal with these new changes? Thank you for your question, uh, Councillor. And uh, so the funding stream for for it, we share with the municipality. I'm looking at my finance team. Yes, we shared it with health. With health. So uh, health, it's intended for both of us. Um, it really has been oriented to the communication education side versus to offset our en enforcement time. Uh, and outside of that, Councillor Vicente, we've, we directly have not... Um, received a specific funding for that area. Now, I can tell you that uh, illegal, illegal cannabis dispensaries are a problem for every police organization. The demand uh, on resources, uh, and I can think of a couple locations in our region, have to say that they weren't a thorn in the flesh for us, for the counselors in those areas, the business owners in that area is, is tremendous. And they become a platform for what we've seen as other criminal activity. And uh, uh, if we were to quantify the time and hours spent, I, I don't think there is a one-for-one -one remuneration uh, for that to offset that. And it, we've, we've, for the most part, absorbed it as a, a natural spinoff of, uh, you know, the new regulations over the last year to decriminalize the legitimate premises you know, all but have no impact on us, really. It's the illegitimate ones, especially the mobile ones, that continue to, to bring this, the, the, the secondary social disorder around them and uh, are, are, are require uh, parts of my drug enforcement team to continue to do compliance. Our divisions continue to do that. Uh, it goes through a variety of different ways, and uh, it's certainly... Uh, there are more aggravating locations than others, and uh, they've been problems for us, for sure. Thank you, and through you, Chair. So in terms of where, um, is there a, a difference or um, in terms of the region itself, do you see um, the illegal trade of cannabis uh, having increased or, or changed in any way, shape, or form as a result of the stores opening? Uh, I, it has not, as far as us in, in, uh, in the policing sector are concerned, the, the movement of cannabis out of a variety of different uh, forums has never changed, and it still exists at, at the most you know, organized level, organized crime level. I think the only thing that's changed is it's normalized the ability for somebody to, to advertise the sale of cannabis. And whether it's legitimate or not, people are far more bold. They're willing to you know, accept the, you know, the bylaw offense or the ticket, reopen under somebody else. Landlords and tenants, uh, you know, claim, landlords could claim, you know, lack of coordination over who their tenants are. So, you know, aggregating it to a point where you can put a restraint order on a, a property is probably the biggest thing. But uh, uh, if at all anything, Councillor, I think it's maybe normalized just the sale of illegal cannabis. Very good. And, and one would think that with more individuals having access to legal avenue to purchase it, would you uh, care to comment on, on whether or not that has been even if it's in a small way, beneficial? 
to to you and your work in terms of you not having to worry about whether that individual driving away from that mall uh, purchased their cannabis or is holding cannabis that was purchased illegally? Yes, yeah, so I, I think for the most part, our officers, uh, you know, don't always have the level of discernment to say where the cannabis originated from. And so, you know, that's kind of pretty much just out there. Uh, possession of cannabis and its impact on the Highway Traffic Act and the offenses that um, that are there are that's pretty cut and clear for our officers to be able to, to manage. Uh, I know talking to other chiefs, uh, you know, we, you know, our, a lot of our occupied, to be honest with you, a lot of our occupied time is on, you know, some of the other uh, drugs that are out available, fentanyl, uh, opioids uh, tend to be our dominant priority. Uh, where there's an intersecting point with youth offenses or driving is really where our time and efforts are from from a cannabis perspective. Or if we get a complaint about a legal dispensary, we do work our way through the menu list, and there's a lot of them. So the problem isn't necessarily the retail cannabis. It's more the larger problem is the illegal cannabis trade and then the other drugs that are available. Yes, I think really those ones don't draw a lot of attention. The province has a joint forces cannabis team, which looks at larger, larger uh, enforcement. The, the province has a compliance arm of uh, the province to, to regulate the licensed uh, premises. We, uh, for the most part, uh, stay clear of those ones. Okay, thank you, Chief. Thank, good information, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fonseca. Thank you through Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Chief Nish, for the presentation here today. I echo all that's been said in terms of uh, your, your first budget presentation a year ago um, and you laying out uh, along with the Police Services Board and uh, the budget items to address and be innovative and address health and safety and well-being in the community. Innovation, collaboration, and creativity are so important. I have one comment and then two questions. Um, with regards to the feeling of presence in the community when it comes to community policing and how important that is, uh, my one comment is I echo uh, what Councillor Parrish has said with regards to youth programming and collaboration within neighbourhoods. Um, and I would love to speak with you offline uh, and welcome yourself uh, and other others uh, within um, uh, policing to meet with myself and uh, the Dixie Bloor Neighborhood Center uh, around uh, opportunities for collaboration on youth programming. They have a new executive director uh, that just came in and uh, a number of new board members and uh, youth programming and collaboration with the police in the past has always been very beneficial to the community. So uh, hopefully uh, we can work together offline on that as well as with Our Place Peel, uh, which is uh, the youth shelter in Ward 3. So that's my one comment around collaboration, I think, and youth programming. I think it's extremely important. Um, next, if you could respond just to two, uh, two questions I have. With regards to feeling of presence in the community and community policing, um, and I know it's, I, I guess, woven into the budget, but if you could just respond to um, how this budget addresses uh, supports and services to seniors. Uh, on the one hand, seniors in the community are facing, and we've seen that they're extremely vulnerable and exposed uh, uh, to not only cyber issues um, where they where they're having to um, there's a whole new learning curve of where they're having to do a lot of their a, a lot of their day to day um, activity online um, and they are quite exposed to cyber uh, but at the same time they are continuing to face uh, door to door um, scams and, and I know that. Um, I know that the the, poli the police have really uh, have tried to address this in terms of crime prevention, uh, but if you could speak to how uh, we're 
how the police in, in this budget in particular are trying to get to the seniors to address these uh, these concerns. And then my other, uh, if you could also comment on uh, just a follow-up to Councillor Dasko with regards to the road safety. I'll echo that it's wonderful to see that there is a, um, there will be a continued focus on road safety from the noise, uh, Project Noisemaker and Project Erase. Um, on the other scale of road safety, and when you're looking at Vision Zero, uh, complete streets and sharing the road, um, I think it's extremely important um, and having a feeling of presence within the community that uh, uh, vulnerable road users such as pedestrians and cyclists uh, recognize all the work that um, uh, the police are doing as well as um, uh, in terms of collaboration with other departments at the region and at the local level uh, to invest in uh, road safety and complete streets for, for them, so cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, could you let me know if uh, there will be, if within this budget there is a continued focus and commitment uh, to having a bike unit um, uh, in the budget to address road safety and Vision Zero to, to go along with um, Obviously, we have to uh, we have to continue to invest in programs like Project Erase and uh, Project Noisemaker. But on the other end, we need to show uh, vulnerable road users that we're investing um, we're investing in Vision Zero as well. Thank you, Councillor Fonseca. And uh, on the first comment, uh, absolutely happy to connect with you on the Dixie Bloor Initiative. Uh, the same goes, uh, we, we, we we're ready. The last year we formulated, we're ready to really plug and play with some uh, great opportunities. So uh, please, uh, I, my team's all around and they're keeping notes. Um, as it pertains to, you know, uh, you know, the, the senior seniors. Um, so, under our community safety well-being plan, um, one of the slides uh, we had indicated priority populations, and if you could find, help me find a better name for it, I, I'd, I'd welcome it. But within that is where our programming for uh, seniors, uh, elder abuse, older adult isolation is embedded. So we have under our, our new, newly established community safety well-being plan, uh, individuals with a specific portfolio of uh, seniors and elder abuse. Uh, and we recognize that there's different streams of uh, programming. So some of that is on the education, prevention, you know, you highlighted the cyber bullying and whatnot, but then there's an investigative side. So we have a policy, we have a new uh, policy, which is now by our, our expanded investigative teams. Each division, you know, for example, if we, we know somebody in a long-term care facility is being exploited or being victimized, we have a policy in place. So the initial police officer might take the report, but it actually falls to an enhanced investigator that's got the specific training for that. But we, what we've gone is one step further is uh, rolled it into our community safety well-being uh, strategy. And so we basically have, I don't know what to call it, like I guess a soup to nuts strategy of where the vulnerability is, we will be able to uh, deal with it. Even as far as, as I mentioned to you, the intimate partner family violence unit that's being embedded at safe centers, they're gonna have that role too at the most egregious level to look at those investigations. So it's a real full full range and we'll be happy again to to get your proper briefing. You know, my, my team way down is somewhere cringing at my, uh, like my, uh, my, my synopsis of that programming, but it, it's pretty fulsome and, and it's renewed under the new CSWB plan because what we're trying to do is get upstream and make sure we plug and play collaborative entities alongside with us. Uh, but down to the road, the road safety and the vulnerable uh, uh, travelers, can I tell you, uh, if I had the data on uh, how many people out of our 43 fatalities were pedestrians at my fingertips, uh, I actually might have that here. Uh, well, I'll have to get my team to, to, to pull it out, but a good percentage of them were pedestrians or individuals riding uh, uh, cycles, cyclists. So it is part of our, our, our plan. Uh, our new road safety tra uh, is not just motor vehicle or vehicular uh, or commercial motor vehicle or motorcycles. They, fo they are focusing on 
especially on the areas where they have a lot of bicycle and pedestrian transit, a real emphasis on that area. Uh, there is uh, an effort to increase our presence in that space so they feel better. Uh, insofar as this, we uh, part of this budget ask has also helped augment and increase a. a, a a specific bicycle team, uh, Councilor Fonseca, that's part of what we're going to be deploying. And a lot of those officers, you know, in the winter, obviously, they can do uh, uh, some of this stuff in uh, the downtown areas, but they have dual roles. So what it goes to is supporting the operational cost of having the bikes available. We've heard time and time again that a lot of the communities want that and appreciate that visible presence. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That concludes all our questions. Chief, excellent presentation. So I thank you. I thank Al Bouton, who was here as well. And Ahmed, thank you very much to the chair of the board for showing up. And I know all the other members are listening in. So well done. Um, I want to move on just so I can manage everybody's time and give everybody an appropriate heads up just to say how I manage going forward. The next presentation we're going to have is again on police servicing. So I'd like to hear from our friends from the OPP. Then I'm, I'm going to suggest is we'll take our break then so that I can give Hassan and John and Deborah a heads up on the conservation authorities that I think the police one, the OPP one, might take the next 10 or 15 minutes. Then I want a 20, 30 minute break for everybody to take a, a break and lunch and a bio break. So I'm thinking that to our conservation friends, we'll have you back at 1230, 1245-ish, just so you can manage your day a bit. And then we still have all the reports to deal with and another presentation from Norman Lum and some other topics. So that's how I hope to proceed. So I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. So our next presentation before we break is that from the Ontario Provincial Police. We have here Heather Hare, Treasurer from the Town of Caledon, and Inspector Mike Garant from the Caledon OPP. Welcome, Heather and Mike. Thank you, Chair Ionica. <clears throat> um, yeah, we got it posted. So if we could just turn the page there, please. And uh, it, always big shoes to fill, uh, presenting after uh, Chief Nish. Um, but I'm prepared to go through with our 2021 uh, our budget for the Caledon OPP. So page uh, one, uh, I'm just highlighting the contract enhancements that we have in the Caledon OPP, which uh, equals 27 positions. Those positions focus on direct support and uh, activities of our dedicated traffic unit, our community response unit, our Caledon mental health unit, and our community street crime unit. Um, turn the page, please. Okay, as well, what we do have is we, we have support services uh, in court security, our regional crime analyst, emergency response team, major crime unit, victim services, school resource officers, which I will um, get more into uh, as we proceed through this presentation, and our community uh, uh, safety officer program. Uh, next page, please. Focus priorities. Our, our number one priority, and, and a lot of it mimics uh, uh, what Chief Nish uh, speaks to, is number one in Caledon is, is traffic enforcement, traffic safety, the umbrella of traffic safety. We also info, uh, focus on our property crime reduction, uh, our community engagement, which in 2020 was, uh, uh, a lot of it has gone virtual, uh, as well as our violent crime reduction. Uh, next page, please. To drill down into our, our priority of traffic safety, um, every day we receive traffic complaints, uh, we conduct traffic enforcement, and we conduct and provide uh, safety education, most of it being virtual uh, since the COVID pandemic has taken place. Embedded in our dedicated traffic teams are commercial motor vehicle inspectors that, that focus on our commercial motor vehicles traveling through the town, as well as uh, impaired driving or ride enforcement, uh, focus patrol initiatives. We focus on 14 provincial and national traffic safety initiatives, as well as our own uh, individual uh, town in initiatives for traffic safety and report on that. Um, we, we've taken strides in technology um, in traffic enforcement as all our tickets have gone virtual. They're called e-ticketing now. No longer are there handwritten tickets. The benefit of this is one, there's a there's an actual computer record of every uh, traffic stop that, that our officers have. 
we're paperless, so we don't have to buy paper. Uh, there's no more human error on writing the wrong date, or wrong location, or wrong charge. And for disclosure, we no longer have to prepare disclosure. Our court services get the disclosure automatic for these tickets uh, because everything's done in the car at the side of the road. So that, that's created efficiencies for our frontline officers. We also have automated license plate uh, recognition, which is an actual reader. So uh, in partnership with the MTO, uh, we have these vehicles out and about in our community, and they can identify suspended drivers, stolen vehicles, uh, and, and, and uh, missing people, and, and even, um, uh, you know, uh, people in jeopardy, uh, such as, um, I'm just trying to think, I don't have it written down, but, uh, Amber alerts. If we have an Amber alert and uh, it could be going through our community, if that license plate is, is typed in by a provincial operations center, then our officers will be able to automatically get hit on that through these automated license plate readers uh, right in their patrol cars. Uh, partnerships, I, I just mentioned a few, but we're actively engaged with the Region Appeal and Vision Zero, fatal collision reviews, uh, as well as our MTO partners for commercial motor vehicle enforcement and, and, and Peel Regional Police in many ways, as well as York Regional Police and our, and our other OPP partners. Next page, please. So I just go into, uh, 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 you'll notice that the timeframes here, this is year to date, January to the end of July in, in 2020 comparisons to the same timeframe in 2020, 2019. This is basically our, our frontline enforcement, which is Highway Traffic Act, Criminal Code Traffic, Non-Traffic, uh, Liquor License. The, the root causes of our collisions in the town of Caledon have been impaired driving and speed. So we have focused in 2020 on, on speed enforcement and, and ride and impaired driving enforcement. Those have been our focuses. Um, our impaired uh, numbers are up uh, 8% in 2020 compared to 2019. And, and our, our overall charges, uh, frontline uh, proactive charges, are actually down 16.3%. Uh, that includes all Highway Traffic Act and, and Liquor License Act. Um, th these charges are down primarily. Our officers have been retasked with COVID uh, re uh, uh, enforcement and, and many other challenges that, uh, that we've had uh, over this uh, past year. Next page, please. I'd like to highlight some of the 2020 operational efficiencies that the OPP as a whole has taken on and, and, and felt, and as well how that trickles down to the Caledon OPP. So our, our 911 system, our, communica our provincial communication centers have, have, have hired additional call uh, takers and they, have, they screen uh, all the questions for whether it's 911 calls or just traffic complaints or any type of uh, police service request. When it comes into our comm center, it's triaged and, and, and it's looked at uh, with a lens. Do we need an actual officer to attend? or can we assign this to another unit to follow up and complete the report? Or this can be reported online completely. So what this has led to is if there's an increase in our online reporting, which means officers on the front line don't have to go to the lower priority calls. Uh, our FSU stands for Field Support Unit. This is primarily a, a, a central location. In, in our case in Caledon, it's in Aurelia at our central region headquarters. We have uh, eight to 10 officers that are on accommodated duties where they're not permitted to go on the front line and drive police cruisers around. So what happens is if one of these calls come in on our non-emergency line on the 18888 number, and it doesn't require a police officer to actually attend the location, but a report needs to happen, this will be reassigned to our field support unit uh, members who will do the follow-up phone calls and complete the reports. This has enabled us to keep our frontline officers on the front line and available for, for serious calls and for proactive enforcement uh, uh, more often. Uh, as well, another efficiency local to Caledon is our new Southfields Village uh, uh, Extended Service Office. Uh, this is not a, a full-time uh, manned, if you will, uh, bricks and mortar office. But this is an office in one of our busiest, largest growing uh, areas of the town of Caledon, where officers now have no, no longer need to come back to our main office in Caledon East to do reports or to use the washroom or to have their lunch or whatever. 
they now, uh, when they're assigned to that zone, they stay in that zone for the entirety of their, their duration of their shift. So that's decreased response time into that area. And we also have the Bolton and the uh, Bell Fountain ESOs as well. Um, and like I say, all the administrative duties are done there in those buildings. Um, a little uh, human resource update. The organization as a whole for the OPP have updated our HR. One thing traditionally that Gallatin and OPP in comparison to other detachments has realized in past years is many officers get hired by the OPP and then they get assigned to Gallatin and OPP. And if they're not traditionally from here, they do their one year probation and they move on. That creates a lot of uh, people leaving, people coming, a lot of new officers, and, and we don't, uh, some spin-off negative effects is we don't get that community involvement with those, those particular officers. We've changed our, OT, our HR rules. When a new officer is assigned to Caledon, they have to complete three years of service in Caledon before they're entitled to uh, uh, seek a lateral transfer to another detachment elsewhere in the province. This enables us to train them properly here in Caledon. This enables us to ensure that they're engaged in the community and in the zones that they're assigned to. And the spin-off benefits for this are, are gonna be immense. I'm very excited about this. As well, um, we, we are finally um, in a position in the, in the Ontario Provincial Police to, to fill all of our vacancies. In 2020, we experienced 21 officers lateral or retire or, or transfer out due to promotions away from Caledon. We've replaced those 21 officers with 26 new officers, six of them being experienced officers from other agencies and 20 of them as new recruits uh, every every four months that we get them in. We are, we, we're getting eight more this week for 2021. And we're getting eight more in June which brings our numbers to 100% uh, capacity at detachment. That's the first time at the Calad and OPP has been at 100% capacity in years. So I'm very proud of this. And this has given me the opportunity to reinvest on the people that have left to put the right people in the right position so that we get the most effective and efficient uh, results out of all the units that are, that are in the Calad and OPP. Next slide, please. Another uh, statistic I'm, I'm very proud of, uh, and some may be surprised of, are motor vehicle collisions. Uh, our comparisons, I have year, I don't have the year end numbers on this slide, but I have them present. Our, our overall collisions are down 25.6%. Our fatals are down um, from nine till to five in 2020. And we, we, have a significant decrease in our personal injury and our property damage collisions. Totality is 25% down. That, that, that is uh, an experience of about 500 less collisions in 2020 than we did in 2019. Next slide, please. I just add this slide just to show how virtually we're getting out some of our successes and some of our challenges out to our local community. These are actually excerpts of some of our Twitter uh, uh, announcements and, and postings that, that we post uh, virtually each and every day. Next slide, please. Our other priority focus is property crime reduction. This is where our community street crime unit focuses on property crime, drug enforcement, education, partnerships, managing the legal marijuana grow operations that are in the town of Caledon, and our crime abatement program, which monitors our, our high-risk offenders that reside within the town of Caledon. We've had great successes in, in all of those areas uh, throughout uh, 2020, and I expect the same in 2021. Next slide, please. Our focus, again, our property crime reduction. Um, in 2020, year-end numbers uh, were, were at a, an overall 5.5% reduction in property crimes. Namely, the one I'm proud of is our break and enters are down uh, about 40% from, from the same time period in 2019. A lot of that can be said that a lot more people are working from home and are at home due to the COVID pandemic. So I'm sure that has some uh, 
aspect to that uh, final number, but it is uh, nice to see that those numbers are down. What is up is, is our fraud numbers. And we're doing a lot of virtual education with our target groups within the town of Caledon uh, to educate them on how to better protect themselves against these frauds. Next slide, please. Drug enforcement. Um, year end, uh, our overall increase is 69.6%. Um, in charges and proactive uh, drug investigations. This is primarily due to our collaboration of our enhancement community uh, street crime unit, focusing on uh, drug offenses because our drug offenses primarily lead to violence and violent offenses. Uh, so we have been very proactive in seeking warrants, seeking targets, and going after the people that are dealing the drugs in our community, and that's why our numbers are significantly up. On the other side of that, our frontline officers have been carrying naloxone on their persons uh, since 2017. We have now successfully saved 11 lives in Caledon alone uh, by applying this naloxone to people that were in an overdose situation and we were there before EMS could get there. So uh, 11 people are alive today because of our frontline officers carrying this, uh, this life-saving uh, product. Next slide, please. Our community response unit, um, it's another focus, it's another enhancement unit. Uh, their primary goal is community engagement, enforcement where necessary using directed patrols and focus patrols. I have a, a, a bullet point, COVID-19. Um, we experienced, everybody experienced different things in, in COVID-19. Uh, at the beginning of stage one, from basically uh, March of 2020 to, to July, uh, we got a lot of groups from the GTA traveling up to our Northwest region um, in large groups and, and, and vehicles. And, and our community response unit was able to enhance uh, what our frontline officers were assigned to and our traffic enforcement officers were assigned to. We were able to give uh, a much more enhanced visibility uh, as which we can do that anywhere in the town, and we did throughout the year. But this one was very focused, and, and you can see by some of the uh, photos that it was appreciated by the community. Uh, we do have the ability and, and the training for ATV and bicycle patrols, as well as bicycle and ATV education, safety education, and the partnerships we have uh, within the community. Next slide, please. Our community engagement. Um, our community safety officer program, um, we, we were able to uh, successfully uh, continue our neighborhood watch programs. We have 14 active in the town of Caledon. Uh, we were able to move to a virtual format and continue to share information and, and, and get information from the local communities as to what the local issues were. Uh, we were able to educate through crime prevention for elder abuse, anti-fraud, cyber safety, and, and how to reduce uh, property crime. Utilizing our media and social media, we've become more engaged in the town of Cal and OPP uh, with social media more in 2020 uh, than we ever have in the past and, and with, with success, and we plan on engaging in this in 2021 uh, to assist in our community engagement. Our auxiliary unit um, uh, are in charge of our Safeguard Ontario for victims of break and enters. Uh, community engagements uh, was severely restricted due to COVID. Our, our OPP command uh, at the headquarters level uh, have recessed the auxiliary program from March till September in 2020. And once again, in January of 2021, they're now stood down due to COVID. Uh, I'm hoping to bring them back soon. Uh, they are a great uh, asset for us here in the town of Caledon. They've been running car seat clinics uh, at all our major centers. Um, uh, and, and basically, I can't wait to have them back. Uh, next slide, please. Community engagement. Uh, speaking more about community resource officers. Uh, tr traditionally, they were uh, providing the D.A.R.E. program, OPP Kids, and, and many youth leadership programs. Um, our, the OPP 
school resource officer program has been stood down since March of 2020. Provincially, and that's provincially, not just in the town of Caledon. They're, they're undertaking a provincial review on how to bring it back and, and, and in which way. I can't, I do not have an update as to when it'll come back, but I do not believe it'll be back this calendar year of 2021. But we are big advocates for it in Caledon and the Caledon OPP program for, for the SRO is heavily um, being used on the review. Uh, many of the school boards in Peel will be consulted uh, on the entire OPP review of this uh, school resource program. And uh, so um, I'm hoping this comes back in one way, shape or form in, in the town of Caledon uh, sooner than later. But uh, being realistically with COVID still among us, uh, I believe that uh, this is probably gonna be a 2022 venture. Just throwing that out there. Um, as well as we're still engaged uh, more virtually on cram the cruisers, uh, shop with a cop, youth mentoring, all those things uh, during the holiday season to do our part in, in raising money, raising awareness to to the to the vulnerable people in our communities to uh, ensure that they get the support that they, that they need. So, um, next slide, please. Community engagement, uh, Caledon uh, mental health unit. Um, we uh, we're, we do have our partnership with the CMHA Peel. It is 24-7. Uh, it's a little different than Peel Regional Police. Our mental health uh, officer uh, is partnered with a CMHA uh, member, but they do a 24-hour consult after the crisis. They don't go to the crisis, uh, which is different than Peel Regional Police. This has been very, very effective for us. Um, we have actually, and year in uh, data is in uh, for 2020 in comparison to 2020, 2019. Um, our overall mental health calls for service are down 13%. Our apprehensions are down 21% in 2020 in comparison to 2019. Um, with, with all that we've been through in 2020, I, I'm actually a little surprised by those numbers, but. Um, our system and, and what we have in place here in the town of Caledon is working. And, and our consultations and the education that we've provided to our officers, we were at, I was personally at the table for the police hospital protocol development and, 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 uh, and launch in October, 2020. I can tell you that so far it is working. Uh, it is reducing the amount of time the officers are in the emergency uh, room and it's, it's, uh, it's enhancing the asset the time, quickening the time that it takes for, for someone in a crisis to get the medical assessment for medical professionals. So the time spent on that, working on that protocol was very well spent. Uh, next slide, please. Violent crime reduction, another priority of ours. We utilize our major crime unit we have major case management, which is outside the town of Caledon that comes in when needed, when we have a major crime. Crime analytics, our forensic identification, which also is, is, is central region, which we, 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 they attend when needed. Our community street crime unit, which is here as an enhancement, and our continued education and engagement through a community safety officer, as well as working very closely with our victim services uh, agencies. Um, next slide, please. Our overall violent crime in the town of Caledon is down 6.5%. Um, and and our, our, our major crimes, murders and attempted murders, uh, knock on wood, we, we've done quite well in 2019 and 2020. Uh, sexual assaults are down, assaults are down. Um, really it's, it's crimes uh, against persons that are up and, it's, and that relates mainly to domestic mischiefs and, uh, and, and threats. Uh, are, are where we're spiking a little bit in, in, in those areas. Um, and then our, our next slide actually takes us into the dollars and cents where I'd like to invite uh, our treasurer, Heather Hare, and I will definitely stand by for any questions that you wanna bring forward. Heather. Thank you. Good, good afternoon. I would like to start off by reviewing the OPP billing model and how the budget is presented on the next slide. 
The OPT billing model includes base services, which consists of costs uh, uh, for the staffing and detachment, and the municipal policing activities performed across the province. The calls for service represent services that are reactive in nature, such as drug violations, criminal code violations, property crimes, or violent criminal crimes. Each type of call is weighted for the average time involved and included in the OPT billing model. The 27 contract enhancements are over and above the base and calls for service and are made up of 23 uniform and four civilians that cover such services as the ride team, bike patrol, foot patrol, and community events. There is a street crime unit to focus on drug crimes, property crimes, theft and fraud, and there is a traffic unit to focus on commercial motor vehicle inspections. The next item is the OPT property service costs, which are the facility and equipment costs for the Caledon East OPT facility, Bell Fountain, CCRW, Orangeville storefronts, and the new office in Southfield Community Center. Uh, the next item is grant revenue, which consists of two different grants. Next slide. Thank you. Overall, we are proposing a 2.5% increase from the 2020 budget, which is approximately 300,000. The OPT contract costs have increased this year, mainly due to a budget adjustment to remove savings relating to billing adjustments for contract enhancement vacancies. This is the last year the OPT will be reconciling their billings. Therefore, we can expect to see these savings eliminated in 2022. The town in the past has, been, has seen savings of up to $790,000 a year, mainly relating to contract enhancement vacancies. To smooth this budget impact, the town is proposing to draw from the Calden OPT Policing Stabilization Reserve over a four-year period to phase out this budget adjustment. The OPT property service costs have increased mainly due to an increase in cleaning costs due to entering into a new contract in the pandemic. Uh, grants are expected to stay at the same level. However, the province is currently reviewing the court, the, sorry, the court security and prisoner transportation grant, uh, which we have budgeted at about $150,000. In regards to the forecast, OPT contract costs increase due to population increasing and the calls for service increasing. It also accounts for union agreement, um, uh, union agreement increases and inflation. Uh, facility and equipment costs are also adjusted by inflation and cost of living increases. Uh, next slide. There are two new proposed capital projects for 2021. The first is to move the OPT satellite office from CCRW to a larger office with a better layout in the new senior center edition. Uh, there's also another project to construct an ancillary building to allow for larger secure space for evidence storage. These projects are mainly funded from regional policing development charges. Next slide. This slide shows that there is sufficient funds to draw approximately $1.3 million from the OPT contract over the next four years, as well as handle any other fluctuations and future costs that may occur. The region has recently completed their, their new development charge bylaw, which includes these new capital projects. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations, Mike and Heather. Are there any questions at this time? Seeing none, I'm going to ask for a motion to... Mr. Sorry? Chair, I, I do have oh. one question. It's Councillor Groves. Go ahead. Thank Go you. ahead, um, Councillor Groves. Thank you. Actually, this is for the inspector. So, Inspector Garant, can you um, please qualify that fatalities and personal injuries numbers may be due to covid 19 for 2020. So just to Councillor Groves, thank you. Um, just to clarify your question, are the numbers for fatals and, and personal injury collisions, are they down because of COVID? Is that just to clarify, is that your question? Yes. Okay, so um, I'm sure there was some impact, but uh, Monitoring the traffic flow and, and what is happening in the town of Caledon. Um, from March till about the beginning of June, the town of Caledon as a whole saw a large reduction of traffic flow throughout uh, the town of Caledon. 
when we got into the summer of 2020, that traffic flow increased again, back to almost normal levels. And I don't think they've ever reduced again. I know more people are working from home and, and staying home, but if all you have to do is go for a drive out there and our traffic flow has not reduced. And, and that being said, our commercial motor vehicle traffic flow has increased. So I, I, I wish I had an answer as to what the actual cause is. And I, I hope that our enforcement and, and our, our, our collaborated approaches to traffic safety have a, a large impact on these reduced numbers. And, and I hope that the COVID response for people staying at home is part of that. But, but I don't know if it 100% contributes to those lower numbers. I hope, I hope that answers your question, Councillor. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next on my list, Councillor Sinclair. Yes. Uh, if you're looking Councillor Sinclair, you're breaking up a bit. Do you want to try again, please? Councillor Sinclair, you're breaking up. Do you want to try to start again and maybe uh, lose your Some video? Of the of the budget. Okay, I'm giving up. Councillor Sinclair, that's much that's no, much better. Can you okay, please I'll move receipt? Okay, Councillor Sinclair, one last shot because you sound better now. May I move receipt of the OPP budget presentation? Very good. Done. What I will do then, thank you, Ian. If that is our last questioner, I'm going to thank the two services for their reports. I have a motion to move receipt of the Peel Police budget and the OPP budget. We'll deal both at the same time. As moved by Councillor Fonseca, as moved by Councillor Sinclair, seconded by Councillor Fonseca. Are there any objections? Seeing none, those have been received. Okay, we've gotten down to about 12.30, so I'm going to suggest I'll have you all back to deal with the CVC budgets for 1 o'clock, and we will deal with the staff reports at that time as well, and carry on. So we stand recessed till 1. Thank you. Okay, everybody, welcome back. And we'll carry on with delegations. As promised, we're on to the Conservation Authority. First up, 6.3, presentation from Hassan Bassett, Chief Administrative Officer for Conservation Halton. Welcome. Good afternoon, um, everybody, and uh, thank you for, for giving me an opportunity to present our budget. Uh, if we can go through the next slide, please. Um, so our, our themes have not changed uh, in terms of probably the priorities that, that we have in front of us. So these have been what we've been focusing on for the past couple of years. Um, if we can go to the next slide. The strategic drivers, uh, external drivers that that you know, Conservation Halton is is um, focusing on, have also not changed, with the exception of the one in the bottom right-hand corner, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, and and that, as we're all well aware, has caused you know disruptions in various ways to all organizations, all businesses, and the Conservation Authority is no different. And you know, as of March of last year. Uh, focusing on business continuity and trying to manage that disruption both to people, services, finances became a key priority for us. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide, if we can go to that, please. If I were to divide our um, program areas into two sort of main buckets, you know, as the public facing um, face of the Conservation Authority, uh, we've got planning and parks, and as you'll see, and you're probably familiar by now in, in just a few slides, on the park side, we have huge exposure to revenues, um, just given the way our budget is, and given the fact that, that we generate two-thirds of our budget through those revenues. Um, with a shutdown in March, we were looking at massive deficits um, for our budget, and we had to quickly pivot to try and address those those, those gaps um, that, that included making some very, very tough decisions on, on you know, business disruption and layoffs and, 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 and you know, other uh, cost control measures and things like that, while at the same time being conflicted as a conservation authority about 
the fact that we were taking away people's access to nature, perhaps at a time when we've never needed it more. Um, so as we were shutting down in March to ensure the safety of visitors to, to look at public health guidelines, we were also thinking quite actively about how we're going to get through this to open up our conservation areas and allow people to, to access them. On the planning side, we pivoted very, very quickly. Uh, within days of uh, the first shutdown, we'd equip the entire workforce with laptops. We'd set up uh, all our mobile networks to, to work, file sharing systems, um, and not a single day uh, suffered in terms of our, our planning roles, and we were able to maintain our uh, both our workload and our, and our service standards, uh, as you'll see shortly. You can go to the next slide, please. For 2021, so the budget that's before you, our priorities include our asset management plan. Uh, we completed our asset management plans two or three years ago. We did them in phases. Um, and we now have a fully consolidated asset management plan as well as a funding strategy with our municipal partners. Um, business continuity continues to be a focus for us as we're all experiencing now the disruption from uh, the pandemic continues and will likely continue for some time for us. Again, you know, going back to our recreation um, uh, business, uh, it's it's quite a real disruption. We operate Ontario's third busiest ski uh, hill, which has been closed since December. That brings in about $7 million in revenues for us. It, it generates between two and a half and three and a half million dollars in profit. Um, so we're dealing with that um, disruption along with along with others. Uh, financial sustainability is a key focus. Digital transformation has been something that's been underpinning our, our uh, strategy for the last few years, and we're continuing to focus on that. Um, as well as floodplain mapping, it's an area that, that we're really focusing on. Uh, we have been over the last two years, and we have a plan to, to make that a very sustainable ongoing program. Um, and, and of course, uh, we're looking at the sustainability of our own operations. I just mentioned we operate at Ski Hill. Um, we have a role to play in looking at our own carbon footprint and the priority for us this year. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, I always like to lead with the numbers. And, and so just in, in summary, uh, overall, our municipal increase is at 3%. Um, it's a little bit lower for the region of Steel. Um, our budget is on some of these areas, um, and we're gonna, we're continuing to uh, still invest okay. in some key priorities. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, we'll see from the tables. And just before us, if I can ensure everybody else who isn't speaking, if they can remain on mute, please, for everybody else, if you can ensure you're on mute. Hassan, please, please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, so a lot of numbers on this slide, but if you look at the last row, uh, our 2021 budget is $36.8 million. Um, that's the overall budget. The municipal portion of that is $10.4 million. And, and, and you can see uh, the 3% increase. Um, it's broken down between operating and capital, 31 million in operating and close to $5 million in capital. We can, and, and our state of good repair levy um, which is funding our asset management plan is, is listed there as well. Can go to the next slide, please. Um, based on the apportionment, as I mentioned, our increase for 2021 for the region appeal on our budget is 1.7%. Uh, it's going up from 487,000 and change to 495,000 and change. So. As I mentioned, we've worked very hard throughout the year to, to get rid of some of the deficits that we were projecting, to take other cost control measures, but to still focus on ensuring that we can deliver our services, continue to move forward, continue to grow in the areas that we need to grow, recognizing that our watershed is one that is growing and, and that growth, that economic, um, the opportunities that come with that growth are, are critical. So we're very proud of the hard work we've been able to do um, to put this uh, budget together for 2021. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, this pie, pie chart I was referencing earlier in terms of you know the, the huge exposure we have, just like any mid-sized business would, um, to 
the disruption caused by the pandemic. It's illustrated by this uh, this, this donut. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, twenty million dollars and change of our overall budget is, is self-generated. Uh, you can see the proportion in green municipal sources of funding. Other funding include grants. Um, as well as um, debt financing from the region of Halton for some of our capital projects and some chargebacks from our parts that, that actually go back into the funding corporate, uh, so certain corporate roles. Um, and you can see the provincial portion of the funding as well. And, and that's uh, not just the base funding, but that includes um, one-time funding we received for uh, repairing our dams and channels as well. Go to the next slide. Thank you. Last slide on numbers, I promise. Um, this shows where the 3% increase came from, from as well. Um, even though we're, you know, happy to be within the guidelines provided to us by the region of Halton, which was, I think, 3.7%, so we're below that for the second or third year running. Um, I think we're below 2%, 1.7 for Peel region. Uh, it's still important to see what growth that increase for us, uh, compensation increase, adjustments to our, our salary bands to ensure that we it was truly reflecting where our staff are within the grid, uh, as well as a reduction in um, some planning revenues. Um, and, and some of these were offs offset by uh, changes to some of our uh, other programs and services, including a reduction in debt financing charges. So that, that's what makes up our overall 3% increase or $300,000. We can go to the next slide. The next few slides, you have them in front of you. Um, they, they do speak for themselves. I won't spend a lot of time. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I know you have a long agenda to go through, so I'll, I'll run them, uh, run through them fairly quickly. This shows a snapshot of our parts um, from just May to October. Um, we closed them in March. We opened them back up in May. We built uh, a new online um, reservation system. We partnered with a local Canadian startup to develop it. Um, we put in electronic gates everywhere. It's, it's, it was one of the first systems to open where you had to reserve a spot to go to a conservation area. You had to reserve a spot to go to the beach. Um, and we're carrying it forward because what it's allowed us to do is accommodate uh, 30 to 40% increase in visitation while still respecting public health guidelines around social distancing, while taking away bottlenecks at parking lots and at trailheads and, you know, driveways leading up into our parks used to be backed up onto regional roads for, for kilometers on, on a warm spring day. And um, this year, because of this reservation program, which involves, you know, license plate scanning and and, and validation of your, your entry without ever having to roll down your window, even at a gatehouse, has enabled us to to really tackle uh, a lot of those issues. And even though it's been driven, the, the innovation was driven by the pandemic, the result of it is, is that we're going to keep this system um, because it actually gives a more predictable, higher quality experience to people coming to our parks. They, they know exactly what they're going to get. And, um, uh, and, and, and it's been fantastic in terms of the data it's generating for us as well to allow us to better um, predict volumes, we can do staffing uh, accordingly, we can do things like garbage pickup based on a predictive pattern. Um, so there are huge operational and sustainability advantages uh, through the system and we're just continuing to build on it and mature it. Um, and actually we're going to be using it for our uh, ski operations as well, whenever they're, uh, we're going to open those. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So these are usually the pictures, the types of pictures you see from not just myself, but from Deb and John from CBC and TRCA as well. Um, this year put a dent in our ability to offer a lot of these programs, uh, but we were still able to pivot where we could within public health guidelines over the summer uh, to offer a lot of these programs. Uh, a lot of these were, were delivered virtually as well. Our Conservation Kids is a television series for kids and parents that we launched um, this past summer. Um, and we were able to launch uh, some camps, in-person camps as well in the summer. And fingers crossed that we can offer those uh, this coming year uh, as well. We can go to the next slide. We were able to also hold an in-person fundraising event um, in partnership with uh, Hamilton Public Health. Um, with their guidance, uh, we held our annual fundraising gala at one of our facilities, and uh, we were able to raise a quarter million dollars through that event, which, which was just and 
fantastic. Um, it's great to see the support from the community, from the corporate sector, from our, our, our local municipalities, and, and just from all the people that were able to come out and, and enjoy this, uh, this gala event. Can you go to the next slide. Our uh, land stewardship and restoration pro projects, um, you know, they underpin a lot of what a conservation authority does. This is, um, you know, I was listening to the police chief's presentation and he mentioned upstream several times. And uh, it you know, resonates with conservation authorities. We're all about upstream, even when it comes to managing hazards, managing, um, you know, managing flooding. Um, so much goes into studying the watershed to figure out where you can do enhancements, where you can uh, improve uh, riparian stream and, and, and in-stream uh, improvements, where you can uh, enhance or build or create or protect wetlands, um, plant forests and trees, and, and do it all in a way uh, where you can leverage you know, funds from various levels of government to, to bring those projects into local communities and work with the local communities because that's a very important part of what every conservation authority does. We don't just quietly want to go ahead and <clears throat> do the work. We'd actually like to use it as an opportunity to engage and ed educate. And um, our stewardship program is a prime example of that where we recognize that most of the land in the watershed is owned by private citizens. And, and so to work with those uh, citizens to come up with solutions is, is one of the uh, programs we're most proud of. We can go to the next slide. And we can actually um, skip ahead to the next one. Uh, again, this slide speaks for itself. Our emphasis on public safety uh, in our strategic plan <coughs> called Metamorphosis, uh, which we're redoing uh, this year. Uh, our number one priority was to focus on public safety, and we've done that over the last two or three years. We have four dams that are, that are active in that they still uh, serve a critical purpose in, in, in uh, regulating flows. We have three channels, all of these built in the 60s and 70s. Um, and we embarked on a very ambitious project uh, three years ago to digitize them and, and to repair them as well. So the brick and mortar repairs that needed to be carried out, that's part of our asset management plan, but also complete digitization of our ability to do smart forecasting, our ability to communicate the results of those forecasts to, um, to our stakeholders. Um, and to collect that data in a, in a more robust manner. Um, and we're continuing on those. Uh, again, you can see some of the improvements over the past year um, to that program. And also just to put it in perspective, you know, we uh, carried out some repairs to one of our dams, Kelso Dam, and, and the cost of those repairs was well over $9 million. And so this is infrastructure that, that, that is critical that is not actually diminishing in its importance given um, climate change and the unpredictability of uh, the weather and, and rain events. Um, and they, they require uh, a lot of scrutiny. They require uh, a lot of maintenance. So uh, we're happy to, to be continuing to focus on that in partnership with, with of course, our municipal partner. We can go to the next slide. Um, this is a slide that's, that's standard for, for me, for CH. Um, it's one of the services we offer. Um, it's one of the critical pieces, uh, you know, where, where we work with our municipal partners, uh, whether it's on the planning side, through our MOUs, or whether it's through uh, permits uh, under the CA Act. Uh, we track performance uh, we have for the past four years, uh, and we report it to our board quarterly. Uh, we report it to our uh, stakeholders and to regional councillors, uh, regional councils once a year. Um, so again, this year, uh, despite the disruption caused by the pandemic, uh, our internal target uh, is always to, to achieve 95% delivery within the specified uh, time period. And we've been able to exceed that in most cases. The, the only area where uh, we were a little bit low was technical reviews. And that was a one category. Uh, and these are results on the chart from Q1 to Q3, just because of when we submitted the presentation. By the end of the year, we were able to bring them up to over 75% in that category as well. Uh, we can go to the next slide. It's just a, a summary of our capital projects. It's there for you in case you have any questions. Um, again, one of the things I'll point out here, if you look at the bottom of the column for, uh, for 2021, the total spend on capital is $5 million. Total municipal portion going to that is two hundred fifty-seven thousand dollars. 
and the region of appeals portion of that is, is uh, you know, I think, 7% of the $257,000. So again, CA's ability to leverage multiple sources of funding uh, to, to get work from the ground done um, is is something that, that you know, all CA's are, are really good at. Um, we can go to the last slide, and with that, uh, again, thank you for your support last year. It enabled us to, to get through a very tough year. Um, and uh, uh, I look forward to uh, any questions you may have. Um, and with that, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Hassan. And first up for questions, Councillor Innes. Thank you, Chair Nika, and I hope the will be patient. It's not so much of a question, um, more of a, of a comment and a, and a suggestion. Firstly, I just want to say thank you for uh, you and your entire team. Um, it's been a very challenging year. Uh, and um, the issues of mental health and physical activity um, really were dealt with through uh, our CAs being able to provide the green space opportunities and programs for our residents. And so a big kudos to you and your entire team uh, on that. Um, as you know, Peel is home to uh, four conservation authorities, uh, TRCA, CPC, uh, Halton yourself, as well as Ottawa Saga. And so um, I, I want to congratulations in your new role as chair of the minister's um, uh, working group on this day, Ray. Um, and in that capacity, I just wanted to, to reach out to say that uh, as home to four of those conservation areas in the GTA, that uh, Peel Region is more than happy to, to work in your team and assisting on some of those regulations, um, as they will have a great impact on the residents that we serve to, uh, collectively. Um, and we look forward to working with you in that role and capacity. And, and again, thank you to you and your entire team for your efforts over this past year. Thank you very much, um, Chair Ennis, and uh, I'm a chair of TRCA, um, so thank you for that, and, and I'm supported by a very strong team, as you, you, you're aware, on that working group, so we'll continue to work on it, and, and we really appreciate the partnership uh, that our municipalities offer us. Okay. With that, Hassan, thank you very much for your presentation. That brings us to presentation. Uh, Mr. Chair, I've, it's, oh. it's Councillor Raz. I've oh, sorry, it's handout. not on my list, but please go ahead. Oh, I thought I raised it. I don't know. Anyway, thank thank you for coming today, Hassan. I just echo um, uh, Jennifer or Councillor Ennis's comments uh, on the good work that you've done. And I know that a lot of people from our area have also uh, frequented Conservation Hall, uh, Halton Parks. Um, I guess two questions. How do you envision making up the shortfalls for the revenue that you have received from Glen Eden over uh, the course of the year? And uh, and how do you manage that going forward? Or certainly there's the in-year um, loss, but but also going forward. Um, thank you. Um, I was going to call you Chair Rask, but you know what I meant by that. Um, <laughs> we, we, uh, um, we're projecting right now uh, a $2.1 million deficit for this year. Uh, and these are based on conservative assumptions that, that we will not have, a, you know, a viable ski season. So uh, our ski season generally ends at March break. Uh, even if there's snow, we just find that people are out of skiing mode by the end of March break. So if we are to open by the middle of this month, we're looking at a three or four week season. Um, and, and that might mean roughly, you know, a third of the revenues come in. Uh, so one of the one of the ways we're going to mitigate that impact, and it is that we finished 2020 very strongly on our parks. We uh, again because we brought in this this reservation system, uh, we were able to capture a lot more revenue uh, while also increasing capacity of our parks. And so we have a, a sizable surplus from last year, and we're going to be using that. Uh, and then we're just confident that, that given the enhancements to, to our parks, that we're going to beat revenue targets um, from last year. Um, so I think that we can mitigate the, the deficit in a year. Uh, and if not, we of course have revenue stabilization reserves as well, which, which if we need to dip into, we will dip into, but I'm just not, um, um, we've made a decision that, that we're not going to be doing layoffs, you know, twice in the 12-month calendar so, uh, period. So uh, we're confident. We, we feel the team is, is, is up for it. And, uh, and again, these are conservative forecasts. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that we will not have $7 million in revenue that we would have had from uh, a three-month ski season. Uh, but by controlling costs and by, by looking at reserves and by utilizing some of the profitability from last year, 
think we should be okay. Thank you. And uh, I'm just wondering how the work with the working group is going. And thank you for taking that chair role. I know that this is probably a, um, quite a bit of additional workload for you. Uh, but I'm, I'm just wondering if you can share with council how that uh, process is going. Um, thank you for that. Um, I, I think the process is going really well. Uh, I think for starters, it, it's just good to be at the table. And, and you know, um, it doesn't matter when the table was convened. Uh, I know the legislation has passed, but, but regulations uh, really, you know, define the limits of how we're going to be doing our jobs. And so it's critical to be at that table. Uh, it's a, it, it is a very good group. We have representation from ANIL. We have representation from uh, a small municipality in Ontario, um, Kevin Monaghan. Um, we have developers uh, around that table. Uh, and we have eight conservation authorities, and some of the smartest people I could find, uh, you know, experts in their fields, whether it's source protection, whether it's watershed management, whether it's planning or engineering, we're in good hands, uh, you know, with, with these people around the table. And we're having some very honest discussions. The, 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 the ministry staff have been very good at sharing the information with us and, you know, and, and looking and talking about, uh, you know, what the regulations are that they're proposing. Um, I actually think it's been a lot of work, but, and, but it's enjoyable because before we had this table, as you know, it was not enjoyable. It was stressful uh, to be reacting to the legislative changes. And so I'd, I'd much rather put in hours, uh, you know, this way than, than prior to December. Uh, so I feel confident we have the right people around the table. The minister has, has been very accommodating with his time. He's, he's involved in it uh, with regular updates to myself. Um, and, and, and I feel confident that, that this group will, will provide some very reasonable solutions that within the confines of what the legislation has changed, we, we can't go back and unchange that. Um, but within those changes, our job is to strengthen the mandate of the conservation authorities and ensure that the regulations are practical uh, so that they, they don't overburden municipalities, they, they, they don't erode um, the job that we need to do, which is absolutely critical. And, and that's really the, the goal of this working group. Thank you very much. And uh, let, just last comment, congratulations on that reservation system. I think you were the first out of the gate to implement that and it's been uh, it's been very successful and certainly CBC has adopted that as well. So I just wanna say congratulations and thank you for your presentation today. And um, Mr. Chair, I can uh, move the uh, uh, deputant and um, their presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take them all in total when we've dealt with all three and you'll be moving them. Thank you. With that again, Hassan, thank you. I see no one else on my list. Which brings us to 6.4, Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, John McKenzie. John, welcome. And uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm just uh, <laughs> waiting for my video to set up. Thank you very much, Chair Anika and members of Regional Council. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And I'm joined by Michael Polanski, our Chief Financial and Operating Officer. And of course, we have some staff that are, are, are part of this as well. Uh, I want to begin. Uh, Chair, um, by thanking the whole entire team at the Region Appeal for their support of our work in an unprecedented uh, 2020. We, in partnership with the Region, quickly adapted to provide seamless service. And in fact, uh, we were able to accelerate work on some projects. And I know one of great interest to the Region is the Jim Tovey Conservation Area. And uh, I'm very pleased that we are moving ahead of, of schedule on that and, and making that a fantastic place uh, in partnership with Credit Valley Conservation and partnership with the region and partner, partnership with the city and also working with nearby landowners. So this is a great, uh, great story. I would also say that TRCA has worked with uh, your staff to ensure a modest increase, uh, 2.6 to 2.8% annually over four years. And of course, we will continue to work with staff recognizing uh, budget pressures and issues. Uh, we uh, remain committed to working with staff on the details of the budget and uh, as always, uh, greatly appreciate our collaborative approach and your continued support. Uh, next slide, please. So we've organized our activities according to Peel's three funding streams, watershed, climate, and infrastructure. Uh, the following slides provide some of our high-level outputs anticipated in 2021. And I'm not gonna go through uh, all of them, but I, I wanna make sure that uh, we, uh, uh, you know, we have these shared collective 
uh, outcomes, and, uh, and, and I'll, I'll put them up there on the slides, but uh, these are provided for review, and again, uh, these are all um, output-driven and uh, KPIs that uh, we uh, are looking to ensure that the metrics of all of our work are presented going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, in climate, our outputs include works to improve um, our adaptability and our resilience to climate change impacts all across um, all across the region, and you can see some examples of that uh, on stream restoration works and, and uh, different projects and programs across the region. Next slide, please. On infrastructure, our outputs include uh, works that help protect the region's assets and address hazards that uh, we're all facing, uh, particularly around erosion, hazards, and, and hazards associated with climate change. Next slide, please. Uh, COVID-19 has been, uh, um, uh, again, a huge, a huge factor. And, and on the next slide here on COVID-19 adaptation, we uh, we we point out some uh, some of the um, some of the things we have done to adapt our services and programs to protect the health of employees and stakeholders. Uh, we, uh, working with our partners, are taking every step to mitigate. Uh, the direct and indirect impacts while pursuing opportunities to maximize uh, TRCA's revenue potential. Um, uh, maybe on the next slide, there's a couple of examples, and I, I know uh, I don't think we're move, moving to the next slide, but we have been working to scale and modify our programming to meet the restrictions and to meet the provincial directives that have, uh, uh, we've been given to mitigate a portion of the potential loss from uh, authority generated revenue that's been caused by the new directives. And uh, another thing that we've been doing is working very closely to mitigate losses by uh, applying to the federal relief programs, including the uh, Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy and the Temporary Wage Subsidy programs, but also looking to modify our programs. And you can see some examples of uh, uh, moving towards a drive through event at Albion Hills and making sure that we're having more virtual events. And I'll talk about a little bit more about that later. Next slide, please. Uh, here are a few highlights by service area, and we set up these service areas to explain our work. Uh, the first service area is watershed studies and strategies. Uh, C TRCA is uh, launching our watershed report cards and online watersheds and ecosystems reporting web application. Uh, on Earth Day, and this will provide our partners with more current and easily accessible information about the state of our watersheds and the waterfront. Uh, for water risk, uh, TRCA's erosion risk management program will be implementing uh, projects including the Brandon Gate Park uh, Bank Stabilization Project, which will protect uh, the public trail in the city of Mississauga as an example of the type of work that we're doing. Next slide, please. In terms of regional bio biodiversity, uh, this year we are initiating an invasive uh, management plan for Clareville, as well as Heart Lake and Albion Hills conservation areas. The plans will help guide future restoration actions and land management practices. In 2021, Glen Hathi Conservation Area will be the focus of planning activities, including the initiation of the Glen Hathi Master Plan as part of the Niagara Escarpment Parks and Open Space System uh, required uh, management plan um, um, process. Next slide, please. In 2021, TRC will continue to expand the trail network in Peel Region with additional trail construction of the West Humber Trail and the Bolton Resource Management Track. And from a planning perspective, TRC will continue to be involved with the municipal comprehensive review processes uh, along with all of our partners to ensure we support the uh, Brampton citywide official plan review and other official plan reviews underway. In 2021, the province is uh, obviously consulting on, uh, will consult on regulations and we're involved in that as part of the working group that Hassan is the chair of and we'll be reporting to our board and working with our partner municipalities throughout all of this to make sure that we're uh, sharing our information to inform the work of our municipal staff partners. Next slide, please. On education and outreach, uh, we've developed a virtual learning strategy which provides direction for staff to develop and deliver online programs. As we move into 2021, we will continue our focus on virtual learning as well as developing blended teaching models which combine in-person and online learning. 
SNAP, uh, PPG, and other um, parts of our organization uh, are working to engage over 2,000 community members across Peel through a variety of mediums over the next year. Next slide, please. So on some priority uh, shared initiatives, I just wanted to talk about uh, uh, Bolton Camp and Dixie Dundas. Uh, for the Bolton Camp project and Dixie Dundas Special Policy Area, we will continue to be um, uh, involved uh, with the region and with uh, our municipal partners. At Bolton Camp, uh, the project phases such as the baseball diamond, hydro installation, and site services, which include sewer and, 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 uh, and a water main, have been completed. There is a recreation hall and swimming pool design uh, exercises, with, which are complete, but implementation uh, is delayed in part due to the COVID pandemic, but we're also working on trying to acquire and finalize some partnerships to secure additional funding for implementation of those components of the project. Uh, the city of Mississauga is, is working close, closely with us right now, and, and, and the city is leading an environmental assessment for the Dixie Dundas special policy area. TRC is supporting the city through hydraulic modeling review, technical submission commentary, and uh, we're involved in a number of the project activities and, and working on communications and outreach with the city on this initiative. Next slide, please. Uh, I spoke earlier about uh, Jim Toby Conservation Area and Lakeview Waterfront Connection. Uh, this is a long-term partnership with CVC, the Region of Peel, the City of Mississauga, uh, working also with the nearby owners and the community to restore and, and uh, recreate natural coastal habitats, which will encourage public use of the waterfront and facilitate sustainable city building. In 2021, um, we plan for the completion of the final uh, shoreline protection for the North Island. Um, that's also uh, uh, under construction underway, along with completion of the North Groin at Marie Curtis Park and the North Cobble Beach protection from North Island to Marie Curtis Park uh, West. And um, there's armor stone work, aquatic plantings that we're working with CBC on for the Applewood wetland, uh, a great deal of grading topsoil and, and plantings underway. Um, a lot of activities taking place. I've been out there with staff over the last uh, number of weeks. Uh, over uh, over the holidays, work continued, and uh, there was uh, a great deal of uh, uh, soil being imported and work underway. So it's uh, it's it's ongoing and, and haven't skipped a beat on this uh, during COVID. The trail layout and concept is shown here, and there's some recent aerial images here that you can see uh, that uh, that put the size and scale of this great project into uh, perspective. So thank you uh, to the region for the great partnership on this. Next slide, please. I also want to speak a little bit about leverage funding. And um, uh, over the course of last year and, and in previous years, TRC has been supporting uh, the city and the region. Uh, with the city of Brampton, we supported their successful application to the Disaster Mitigation Adaptation Fund, the DMAF Fund, the Federal um, Ministry of Infrastructure Communities Fund. Uh, TRC is now working closely with the city to support the Riverwalk Urban Design Master Plan process. And uh, the process, um, the master plan process will complement the flood protection solution that was approved to the EA. And all of this is leading to a more dynamic, resilient public realm and a green space for downtown Brampton that will also be a catalyst for more urban uh, redevelopment and compact uh, urban form uh, as part of the Urban Growth Center uh, initiative. So it's, uh, it's a great news story and it's a good example of working uh, with others and working uh, in partnership to attract some more senior level funding. Next slide, please. Uh, TRC is continuing to monitor and respond to provincial direction uh, related to uh, a, a number of, of things related to the CA Act, Planning Act, et cetera. Um, public health and safety is our number one priority. And uh, we will continue, unfortunately, to be impacted uh, in 2021 due to uh, COVID directives. Uh, as well, related to the province, uh, you know, TRC staff have initiated a process to identify our programs and services as mandatory or core and non-mandatory uh, to refocus our efforts towards the core conservation authority mandate. Uh, TRC has been working to develop MOUs with our partners in order to deliver what we are anticipated to do uh, in, in terms of the non-mandatory uh, services for our municipal partners. And as well, uh, we've streamlined the agreement process for fee-for-service work. So this has helped us uh, continue to support our partners and, um, and, and TRC 
is uh, sharing a lot of this information with our uh, with our other partner conservation authorities and uh, and as part of the uh, working group uh, we'll continue to support uh, um, uh, information sharing related to our agreements that we uh, are, are completing and uh, we just completed one with the city of Brampton for example in December and and this is uh, this is helping us uh, you know again collaborate and share our uh, our skills and knowledge with our partners next slide please. So in terms of uh, uh, budget, the budget summary, this slide shows the approved 2020 budget and TRC's proposed 2021 budget amounts. Uh, given the economic uncertainty, no budget target has been recommended by Region Appeal staff as yet, but currently TRCA's 2021 budget shows an increase of 2.8% with no change to the provincial section 39 MNRF funding. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the 2020 approved budget and four year forecast and our current forecast projects a 2.6 to 2.8 budget increase annually, as I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Uh, the 2021 general levy for the region appeal is 1.98 million, a 3.3% increase from 2020. And Peel's 2021 CBA apportionment is 10.91%, which is provided by the province annually. Next slide, please. TRCA previously forecasted that the 2021 operating budget would be $51 million based on historical revenue trends. However, through a detailed budget process and from further analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on TRCA operations, the preliminary operating budget has been reduced to $42 million. We have reduced our expected user revenue fee fees um, in the areas of tourism and recreation and the education and outreach service areas. Uh, which is the largest region for the, uh, the decrease that you see here, uh, recognizing uh, the challenges with COVID-19. Next slide, please. The proposed increase to the general levy is 64,000, bringing the total general levy to 1.984 million. The increase is comprised of annual cost of living expenses and benefits that have been discussed in previous uh, budget submissions to the region. Next slide, please. And the proposed special levy is estimated at 17.6 million with a 466,000 increase over 2020. Uh, across these funding streams, projects and programs have been budgeted to maintain the current service levels. Next slide, please. Our funding requests related to climate change projects in 2021 have been vetted through the climate change risk assessment methodology with the majority of TRCA projects falling into the invest category followed by act and sustain. Uh, there's ongoing discussions with Peel's Office of Climate Change and Energy Management and, and we will continue those discussions and continue working uh, through the implementation of the Peel Climate Change uh, Key Performance Indicators Project throughout 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, the plan for limiting non-CVCA amounts, the, the Region Appeal non-CVCA levy for 2021 is currently estimated at 305,000. Uh, while it is uh, all of our parties' intentions to minimize the non-CVCA component, uh, elimination will be difficult due to differing uh, municipal budgets. And we will uh, await the CA Act supporting regulations, which may provide some further guidance on this matter. Uh, currently, the City of Toronto is in year two of a three-year plan for their portion of operating levy catch-up. As a result of this catch-up, York Region's payments are now uh, furthest uh, out of proportion in terms of the funding formula. So we have started preliminary discussions with York Region, and we are continuing to uh, review this issue with staff at the Region of York. So um, we, can, uh, we can explain any of that if there's any questions. But uh, I guess I just wanted to, uh, in closing and going to the next slide, just uh, thank, um, thank Region Appeal staff, thank Region Appeal Council. Uh, this has been a very, very uh, a dynamic year. Uh, it's, been a, um, it's been a year with a lot of, uh, of uh, I guess, a lot of uh, situations that we've had to collaborate on and, and make decisions on very quickly. So uh, we really appreciate the, uh, the uh, close partnership and um, we're happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank you. Yes, John. 
Yes, John, thank you very much. And first up, TRCA Chair Innes. Thank you, Chair Anika, and um, thank you, John and Michael, for the presentation. Um, I, I don't want to be a broken record, so I know that you've heard and, and Deb, uh, who's up next, has heard what I've said about the importance of, of CAs, especially over this past year, and, and thank you to the entire team um, for their hard work. It has been a difficult and challenging year. Um, but I do want to highlight something, and you, and you did touch on it, but um, in regards to, you know, I'm very proud of uh, the team at the TRC and the work that they've done, especially with our grant writing and proposal team has been extremely successful um, over the past year and a half. So, um, and it's a great example that's benefiting our community at large and, and a special kudos to uh, Mayor Brown and uh, his team at Brampton, uh, and in particular board members Santos and Fleshy, who when I became chair first came to me, uh, their first issue was saying, we need, we need, to, we need to push on Riverwalk. Uh, in downtown Brampton, because not only is it uh, necessary for flood protection, but it allows an opportunity to revitalize an entire downtown core, um, which is an economic stimulus, uh, but also improves the quality of the life of the residents living in that community. Um, and uh, through that hard work of that grants team uh, and staff at the Region of Peel and the City of Brampton, um, we were very successful in getting uh, substantial funding from the federal government to make sure that this project moves forward. So uh, a big thank you to everybody that was involved. But I think that this is a great example of how the collaboration between conservation authorities, um, our municipal partners and the development industry can work together to make the quality of life for our residents better while protecting our natural resources at the same time. So uh, keep up the great work. Uh, it's going to be another challenging year ahead. Um, and uh, as soon as this is over, I'm looking forward to doing another site visit uh, down at Jim Toby with uh, CBC and TRCA, um, as it is a special project that is very near and dear to many. Of our Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, John, I thank you for your presentation. No, my, name, my hand was up. I apologize. Oh, and I again, it's not on mine, but please go ahead. Thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I also wanted to echo uh, what uh, Councillor slash Chair Innes had to say with respect to the TRCA, the Riverwalk Project in particular. Congratulations again to the team uh, for putting that forward. Um, one of the things that I have noticed, and this I guess is consistent across all uh, CAs, is uh, the increase in traffic on our various trails and the usage of our green spaces. Um, Councillor Fonseca, myself, and uh, some other of my colleagues here at the region are pushing a little bit heavier on uh, implementation of active transportation um, and also uh, trying hard to reduce our greenhouse gas emission target. Can you speak, Don, about kind of the activity levels on those various trails and, and, um, and the impact that has had uh, in terms of uh, promoting um, more healthy, active, lifestyles, especially during COVID-19? Uh, through, uh, through the chair, yes. Um, thank you for the question. Yes, we have, uh, based on our uh, existing network of trail uh, counters, seen a minimum 35% uh, increase on some of our more formalized sites, and that's, that's a minimum. I think what we are seeing with uh, some new trail counters uh, that have been installed, it, it's an even higher increase in use. And, and, and I think just from, you know, being out there and, and being with staff out there in our conservation parks and out in our, on, on our trails, uh, it's been a very, very um, um, well-used resource throughout all of this. So I think, uh, I think the investments in this are paying huge dividends in terms of recreation and, um, and uh, healthy, I guess, I guess being out there and being healthy in this period of time when people need a reprieve. So I think that's, um, um, you know, I think one of the things that we're seeing, for example, in, 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 in Clareville, for example, an area in, in East Brampton, uh, we've seen usage going up by well, almost 160%. And, and I think it's great timing. There's a, a great deal of work underway uh, supported by this city. And I know the region's been involved to help us uh, fund some of our regional trail strategy. And I think uh, that investment is paying huge dividends right now. So uh, we are doing our best to articulate all of this and, and to present some of this information related to the metrics and you know the number of kilometers of trails being built. Uh, we're continuing, as we mentioned in our presentation uh, in 2021 to build 
elements of the Humber. We're working very hard right now, and there's crews out there, even today, advancing the work in Clareville, and we'll continue to uh, build elements of, of the trails uh, within the region of Peel over the next uh, over the next year. So it's uh, it's uh, great work with the city of uh, Brampton, great work with the city with uh, city of Mississauga, great work with uh, uh, Caledon right now, and the region of Peel as we advance this network. So um, happy to uh, answer any more detailed specific questions, but it is a it is something that uh, we will continue on in uh, in 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and through you, Chair John, um, I wanted to just highlight it because um, it, the connectivity to those various networks and systems throughout the entire region is an important element. And I know that um, recreational use is something that these trails provide. But um, as we try to shift the auto-centric culture of suburban sprawl uh, in Mississauga and Brampton, I think that we should start to also be promoting it as um, an alternative uh, to getting around the city in general or getting around the region and, and the various cities in general. So thank you very much for those comments um, and thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, John, thank you once again. Okay, and with that, that brings us down to 6.5 in your agenda, but number one in our hearts, Deborah Martin Downs <laughs> of the CBC. Aww. Sorry, that's, that's, that's just from my old days when I got to work with her on the CBC. So, Deb, you're up. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chair Anika. That's very sweet of you. Uh, so, uh, I originally had good morning in my notes, but it's good afternoon now, and members of council as well. Uh, we're glad to be able to join you virtually today, and uh, Jeff Payne is also with me uh, as well. Uh, and I do want to thank you for the excuse to dust off some of my go-to-meeting clothes that have been sitting in the back of the closet for quite a while now, and I'm happy to report that they actually almost fit. So, uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, today, I'm going to just give you a sense of the work we've completed in 2020, along with some of the key priorities and projects and programs for uh, 2021. Uh, and of course, we'll talk about our 2021 budget ask, and it would never be complete uh, a presentation from me without talking about some of our coming work and pressures. So next slide, please. So uh, 2020, and you've heard it already from my two colleagues, but was anything but usual. And like you, our world was turned upside down by COVID. We did begin planning for our business continuity almost a year ago and started implementing so many of our measures as early as March 12th when we had to cancel our Maple Syrup Festival at that time. We did close our office. We moved to a work from home model on March 24th, and we stayed there until we reopened our office on September 8th, which unfortunately with Peel Region in the red zone and soon after in the gray, we decided to close it again in, in November, but it really was great while it lasted. I wanted to uh, also publicly acknowledge the tremendous uh, job that Jeff Payne's done over the last year. And he brought a pragmatic and thoughtful approach to our preparations, which allowed us to successfully continue all of our core business on behalf of our partners and ensured safety for our staff and the residents that we serve in our offices and the parks and in the community. And I uh, couldn't have done it without the training that Peel gave him. So thank you so much for, for uh, letting him be part of that. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge the great support we had from Peel Public Health, who were always there at the end of the line to help us interpret the rules and gu provide guidance as we navigated our uncharted waters. And so in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you a bit more about some of the things we were able to do over the past year and where we are headed this year. So next slide, please. So one of the things we we're really proud of was finally completing our updated strategic plan. Our previous five-year strategy had uh, really set the foundation for some big projects, but it expired at the end of 2019. And with all the uncertainty we've been facing, we weren't sure we should do one, but uh, CBC and our board decided that we needed to own our own future. So we began developing the plan in late 2019. And like everything, it was a little delayed due to the pandemic, but we did it mostly virtually and we pushed through and in September, we uh, published and launched our future taking shape, our strategic plan for 2020 to 2022. Already we're one year in uh, and the plan is pretty ambitious, but it focuses on completing or making substantive progress on all the project and activities that we uh, um, had been starting under the previous plan. So there's a lot of good work to do, so little time and, uh, and we'll tell you more now. So 
Next slide, please. One of the goals of the last strategic plan was to become one of Canada's top 100 employers. And we're really proud to announce that CBC was named one of Canada's greenest employers for 2020 and, and one of the Greater Toronto's top employers for 2021. And these awards really honour and reflect our passion and our dedicated team. It's critical that we lead by example and demonstrate in our workplace the commitment to the local environment that we continuously advance in the community. We have to walk the talk too. So it's important for us to be forward thinking, to attract and support talented individuals who continue to do the kind of work we do and on behalf of the communities we serve. Um, and we do wanna thank our board and Peel for the support that's allowed us to continue to pursue this. We are still working towards Canada's top 100, but I consider this a check mark in my strat plan goal achieved. Next slide, please. At the core of all of our ability, and you heard it from my colleagues as well, is our, uh, our ability to uh, serve our residents was so uh, important to have all our digital tools in place. So all of our staff had received laptops uh, by, by November 2019, and our network setup allowed all 220 staff to easily work remotely with full access to all the digital tools they would have in the office. Our timing could not have been better to get this all finished. Um, but of course, with IT, there's always much work to do in making the transition complete. Uh, so we're working hard this coming year on implementing our document management system and getting rid of some of the paper that uh, that is strewed around the office. And we were, of course, pushed to do much of that uh, in the next um uh, because of the uh, a pandemic, we weren't able to uh, push that paper around. So next slide, please. So as you know, we've told you, talked to you about this before, but we undertake a variety of climatic, water, natural heritage monitoring and inventory programs. And here's a picture of Zach with a frog monitoring device that we, uh, we install. <clears throat> this field data is the foundation of our decision-making processes and some of yours too, because we share it widely with our partners and their consultants and consultants that we use. So despite some of our watershed monitoring activities being stopped or reduced this past year, uh, staff made great strides at analyzing over 25 years worth of data to look at trends and assess health of various attributes. And this will be really valuable for our watershed plan and to support future projects for all of our parties. Next slide, please. So we have a number of forest monitoring sites as well, and they're telling us a troubling story. Uh, we see damage due to climate change, forest diseases, and invasive species. With climate change, it's expected that we'll see more drought, as well as more intense storms <clears throat> and warmer winters that will damage trees with wind and ice. You can see some of that in the center picture. Over time, changing conditions in the watershed may affect what species can grow here. And as some species decline, it can result in invasive plant species increasingly filling the void. And that's shown in the right photo where the understory is all dog strangling vines so that the forest doesn't replenish itself. And we see plantations in the left, fo in the left photo. Uh, these are remnants of the early watershed restoration efforts that have lacked the resources to be managed over the years. Next slide, please. So as a result, CBC staff completed the Sustainable Forest Management Plan in 2020, and this plan will guide us in protecting, maintaining, enhancing the ecology of our forested properties uh, in the face of stressors like land use change, invasive species, and climate change. And one of the focuses of the plan is ma management of plantations, of which there are about 3,300 hectares in the watershed on private properties as well as CBC-owned properties. And I think you would agree with me that the picture on the left of an unmanaged plantation with no understory growth because of low sunlight may be easy to walk through. It's much less interesting. And with drought and human presence, it will be much more sustainable to forest fire. And we've seen that that isn't uh, something that is too far-fetched uh, in our urban communities. The right side shows a plantation that's been thinned to remove trees to create light and space for the growth of native vegetation uh, and moving it towards a healthy uh, mixed forest, and that's the outcome that we need to strive for throughout the watershed. Next slide, please. So over the past decade, we've also watched uh, the emerald ash borer kill the majority of our ash trees, 
Uh, Peel supported us in the management of the EAB infestation on our properties, and over the last six years, we've assessed all CBC trails and property boundaries and removed or treated all mature impacted ash trees that pose a hazard to health and safety. And in total, we removed over 5,500 mature ash trees, and as of the end of 2020, the main goal of our EA, ban EA management program will have been achieved, and you'll see that in the budget. Next slide, please. So Ontario has the highest number of invasive species of any province or territory in Canada, and the Credit River is no exception. There are currently 214 documented invasive species in the watershed, and pictured here are just three that many of you have been grappling with too, gypsy moth, phragmites, giant hogweed. Invasive species coverage in the lower watershed is more than double that of the upper or more rural watershed, uh, and the lower watershed is increasing at a one, one and a half times faster than the upper watershed. So thankfully, we have an opportunity to at least manage in the upper watershed for these conditions. So in response to the increasing threat, staff also updated our invasive species strategy, which was approved by the board in December. Next slide, please. And this is where invasive species and sustainable forest programs meet. So you've already heard about Edermold ash borer that resulted in the death or decline of virtually all our ash trees. But there's a lot of other potential forest pests and diseases that are coming in, uh, in the coming years, and some of them are at our doorstep now. And these include, or have included, something as, was known as Asian longhorn beetle, which fortunately is eradicated right now, but it, it, we can't be sure that it will stay that way. Uh, oak wilt, hemlock lilia delgate, beech leaf disease, to name a few. And the resulting impact on our forest could be quite devastating. So if, if these all came, you can see in the graphic, roughly 51% of our forests uh, would be dominated by tree species that are vulnerable to those current and emerging forest pests. So I don't have to tell you the importance of our forests to water management, to carbon sequestration, temperature mitigation, and tourism, to name a few. So we're trying to align our resources and seek further investment in forest invasive species management to do our best to respond to the lands, uh, to respond on our lands and to help landowners and municipalities address these existing and future threats uh, through monitoring and through uh, management and action. Next slide, please. So just Turning to a slightly different uh, emergency topic, uh, the council knows we have many communities in the watershed that are flood vulnerable, and we have been looking for ways to be able to communicate with residents directly. And we're really pleased to report that uh, in July, we onboarded Alertable. Uh, so residents can subscribe to our alerts in the Credit River watershed and or along the Mississauga's portion of the Lake Ontario shoreline through the Alertable app. There's no cost for the app or subscription fee for the service. There is for us, but uh, but not for the users. So uh, we're, we piloted it, and it seemed to be very successful. So uh, if you could get that word out to residents, uh, we are also doing the same. Next slide, please. So despite COVID, and uh, John said similar things, uh, our, our IT infrastructure empowered us to be able to quickly pivot from delivering in-person programs to online, allowing us to continue our work with landowner stewardship and environmental education and multicultural outreach. So our education staff, who were already challenged with school strikes pre-pandemic, began developing uh, multimedia curriculum connected digital resources for teachers and students from grade kindergarten to grade 12. And that included uh, videos and outdoor education activity packages that were also useful for weary parents. Next slide, please. Uh, in the fall, uh, we didn't get any uh, tree plantings in the spring, but we did uh, have uh, nine tree plantings in the fall with about 230 people participating, of course, distanced participating, and we planted, uh, were able to plant about 1,000 trees at that time. We did have to cancel our Conservation Youth Corps summer program, which gets youth out working with our staff to do a variety of environmental programs, but we were able to engage uh, in the frontline program with youth in the schools um, for a couple of uh, in-person events. So we certainly hope that we can get back to that in 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, I love this photo. Uh, this is Professor Mark Johnson of the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and his family preparing for participation in our butterfly blitz. 
and we trained 155 participants online who then went out and carried out this citizen science activity safely in their backyards or in their neighborhoods. Uh, it wasn't just a useful distraction, but it provides useful data for CBC uh, to, uh, to know what kinds of butterflies and how they're distributed through the watershed. Next slide, please. And despite the challenges, our outreach team were, uh, to, were successful in hosting about 11 virtual events and reaching about 650 residents. We continued to deliver the Fletcher's Creek Sustainable Neighborhood Action Plan in Brampton and had uh, over 100 community members uh, participating through virtual programming. And we were also able to continue our multicultural outreach uh, at, with about 550 English as second language participants and 34 health and wellness organizations uh, speaking with us. So, uh, so we hope that uh, we won't have to do it all this way in 2021, but we're ready if we need to. Next slide, please. Our programming also allowed us to continue to support private land stewardship, uh, which was relatively seamless. Uh, the Rural Water Quality Programs uh, did approve five new programs in Peel, the Landowner Action Fund for Rural Residential Stewardship Activities supported the completion of five projects and approved funding for 11 new ones. And Your Green Yard uh, conducted 43 home visits in Peel and planted about 100 native trees and shrubs. So um, again, we intend to be able to continue this in 2021. Next slide, please. In 2020, we worked closely with 16 watershed farmers on 19 properties to protect threatened grassland birds with our bird-friendly hay program. And as a reminder, the program connects hay producers with consumers looking for a product that's sustainably farmed and doesn't impact threatened grassland birds that nest in the hay fields. And the results so far seem to be pretty good. We recorded 291 bobolink sightings, 32 eastern meadowlark sightings, and most importantly, 88 pairs of nesting grassland birds. So we fledged, hopefully fledged those, uh, those birds to adults. Uh, and this program, I think, shows you how agriculture and wildlife can coexist and even thrive with just a slight shift in practice. Next slide, please. Um, as uh, we talked about earlier with, uh, uh, with John and Hassan is uh, our parks too have had quite a year. Um, at, in March 24th, we did have to make the difficult decision to close the parks and trails. Uh, we just didn't have PPE or protocols and we couldn't manage the number of people coming out without risk to staff. But we worked really closely with uh, bylaw enforcement and police to manage those property closures during that period. And we do really appreciate the support we got from the municipal staff and uh, at that time. And uh, fortunately, with uh, hard work on part of our, our park staff, we were re able to reopen our gates on May 13th, and we have been able to remain open um, up until when we normally close for our season. We were able also to open Bell Fountain in the Badlands in time for fall colors with a reservation system in place uh, to help control the crowds. And that seems to have been reasonably successful, especially for the ones who got the placements. The ones that showed up without were a little unhappy. But uh, uh, And we did have a lot of good weather this fall, so we, uh, we did extend our season to uh, address the demand. But we are uh, continuing to see that uh, demand. Next slide, please. So uh, this just gives you a sense, and there was some discussion about this uh, with John as well, but our parks were closed for about 50 to 67 days, depending on which park we're talking about. But just looking at the May to December period, we experienced a 70% increase in visitation over 2019. So, so we are seeing those numbers uh, going up and, and they're being steady into this year. Next slide, please. And that's on top of a steady increase over the past decade. So uh, some of you may have heard me say 260% over the last 10 years, which uh, apparently my math was a little off, but uh, it's 200% over the last 11 years. And for the first time ever, we had over a million visitors to our parks and that uh, we're already uh, well under our way this year to, uh, to a strong visitorship. So with growth, with denser neighborhoods, with COVID, we have to keep investing in our conservation areas as the, and I hesitate saying this, but the regional park system of Peel, uh, because we, there is, uh, there's municipal, local municipal parks and then uh, provincial parks and we are the parks in the middle. Next slide, please. 
Uh, John showed you the physical part of the uh, Jim Toby Lakeview Conservation Area taking shape, and uh, we have been working really hard at uh, doing the landscaping out there. That's Credit kind of Valley's role. Uh, and despite COVID delays, we managed to naturalize over nine hectares of newly formed land through topsoil placement, seeding, and native seed mix and cover crop. And we planted over 9,600 trees and shrubs uh, and during this time. We've been managing invasive species there as well, which is critical as the uh, native plants get established. We can't have the invasives taking over. The fill keeps rolling in and we keep adding to the landform and constructing uh, new wetland that will connect Appleby, uh, Applewood Creek uh, shortly. And uh, uh, we are also working on designing the public realm for the park with a number of stakeholders. And uh, we were fortunate to have a visit with Lee Toby out on site uh, last, uh, last fall uh, to ensure that whatever is being planned there truly reflects Jim and what he would have said was the right kind of thing to install. Next slide, please. And finally, in our last in-person event on November 3rd, we unveiled the first wayfinding interpretive signage for the Credit Valley Trail. And this was just on an existing stretch of the trail at Upper Credit Conservation Area in Caledon, uh, but now it's branded and the, it's, it's out there. And at the same time, we also launched our $10 million fundraising campaign for the trail. And this was a huge milestone for CBC and our partners. Uh, our staff have been working closely with all of our communities along the trail with our plan, uh, continuing the planning and design so that we can open additional segments and with the, with the trail identifier on it. And when complete, it will be a 100 kilometer pathway through the Credit River Valley from the hills of the headwaters to Lake Ontario and Port Credit. And again, adding capacity to the system of lands available for visitors that we see the demand for. Next slide, please. So with that, all that great news, I'm going to turn to the budget. So next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows you the um, uh, CBA apportionment for the, uh, all the municipalities in our jurisdiction. Uh, that information has been provided by Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Um, the board has uh, endorsed our 2021 draft budget at our October meeting. CBC's share is uh, reduced this year by about 0.06%, which is a second year in a row that Peel's seen a slight decrease for the total share um, of our budget. And theirs is at now at 91.68% of our budget. Next slide, please. This table shows the general levy based on the municipal apportionment. So the total general levy funding by each municipality is shown and the percent change in the general levy from 20. 20 to 2021. Peel's levy change is 2.56% for general levy um, and that is results in a $9.1 million ask. Next slide, please. And this table shows Peel's portion of the total levy, which includes general and special levy, and that special levy includes special shared and special benefiting levy that also includes the climate change uh, contribution. So general levy increased by $227,000 or 2.56%. Special levy increased by $392,000 or 2.49%. The net increase is $619,000 or 2.52% from our 2020 budget. Uh, and we also noted earlier in the slides that we finished our work uh, for EAB for the large part. So you, we've also included a significant reduction on the one-time funding for MO dashboard. The, uh, we do have some ongoing needs to treat trees with, that have been a part of the um, uh, protection program and to have continued vigilance for hazard trees. But we're going to work those into our future budgets as the numbers should be manageable within future allocations. So this was just a transition year to get us through. And, uh, and you'll see in, in the future slides that we haven't got any additional costs for EAB in there. Next slide, please. So this slide just speaks to the areas of increase of the general levy and not surprisingly, personnel costs drive much of the levy increase. Our budget does include a cost of living increase at 1%, uh, as well as partial implementation of results of a compensation review that the board approved undertaking at its meeting in February of 2020. Uh, and then we brought it forward um, uh, recently with the budget. And uh, we have also some uh, cost benefit increase benefit cost increases and performance adjustments in the budget as well. And that's all man, uh, managed within the budget as we've presented it. 
we have budgeted uh, in, the, in the negative 261 there, we've budgeted for the loss of revenue with the closure of Bell Fountain Conservation Area as we expect to be constructing phase one of the project this coming summer. We did also sharpen our pencils and achieve further cost savings across all cost centers to help offset the pressures elsewhere in the budget to keep the, uh, our ask at a reasonable level this year. Next slide, please. Uh, I don't really intend to say much about this uh, in detail, uh, but other than to point out that the province's, province continues to provide only 1% of our general levy budget uh, and uh, the remainder made up with municipal and user fees and, and chargebacks and recoveries. Next slide, please. This slide looks at the drivers of change for special levy. And again, no surprises here. The main driver is salary and wages, and the main pressure is reduced revenues that are coming from uh, partly COVID-related, but also from um, uh, some of the other uh, uh, activities that uh, have been affected by other changes. Next slide, please. So I don't also intend to go into this in any detail. Our future projections are awaiting proposed changes in legislation and regulation by the province. They did tell us recently that they wanted to implement it by 2022 budget year. But we've told them that's not possible, given that we don't know what is contained in the proposed regulations as of yet. It's the beginning of February, of course, and the work we anticipate we have to do to revise our budget and to get buy-in from all of you as our funders and to meet municipal timelines, submission timelines, we don't think is, is possible. However, that may not be up to me to decide. So uh, we will continue to review and refine the budget for 2022 and beyond, but right now we're projecting about a 4% increase and you will note that there's no EAB shown in the future years. Next slide, please. Uh, as John showed you, we have applied the climate risk methodologies to our projects funded by climate change. We didn't have any new projects to assess this year, so there is no change from prior years. And you can see how they're distributed on the slide. Next slide, please. And uh, despite the fact this is one of the worst possible years to be discussing this, I want to take uh, another minute or two to discuss our capital work pressures with you. Next slide, please. So we have the unprecedented opportunity now to capitalize on the love for nature and parks that COVID has unleashed. I mentioned the need for investment in parks and trails throughout this presentation. We have submitted a bundle of infrastructure projects to the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program for works in our parks, as well as for the Credit Valley Trail. And if successful, we're going to be able to access a 73% grant funding and we will have sufficient funds to provide the 27% contribution over the six year uh, implementation period that the grant is for. We have spoken to you for many years now, but the pending capital works required for Bell Fountain, and I know I've sounded like a broken record, but at least you'll remember it, uh, but we're really getting close. Bell Fountain phase one will be ready to commence construction by June of 2021. And so uh, next slide, please. Uh, at the December 10th Regional Council meeting, Council approved the uh, region's COVID-19 infrastructure resilience fund project, project list, and one of the projects on that list was Bell Fountain Phase 1 for the total amount of $4 million, and that's in your Scenario 1. We were so thankful to Peel that you've included uh, Phase 1 in that funding ask. It certainly is a, um, will be a, a relief if we can get that. But what this slide is here to show is how the funding may play out. And if we're successful with scenario one, that's the end of this discussion. Scenario two, without ICIP, uh, CBC will be providing all our accumulated capital, uh, assuming the province provides matching amount for the dam and channel, works of almost a million dollars through the Water and Erosion Control Infrastructure Fund. And as well, there's a, a some assumed small contribution from other partners. So the application for WECI is going in now, and we'll know more in April or May. Um, and uh, uh, it, because it's not a high priority dam, it'll be uh, maybe a stretch to get a million dollars, but we could get a portion of that. Scenario three assumes no additional levy fun uh, funding, leaving us with a potential funding gap of up to $1.7 million. So CBC is in the process of looking at carry forwards that we have from 2020 levy to determine how much we could apply to this project. Given that some of our projects didn't proceed as expected last year, we know we have some, uh, some contributions that we can uh, redirect to Bell Fountain. 
So we're raising it here today because there is um, a potential issue uh, in, uh, in a gap in funding, and we hope you'll be receptive to a conversation if we need your assistance to make the pro program uh, project a reality in 2021. But we're really hopeful that ICIP comes through for us. Next slide, please. And with that, in closing, I want to note that the work of the conservation authorities has never been more important than it has been shown to be today. Over the past year and at the end of last year particularly, our hearts have been very warm by all those who reached out to tell us why conservation matters to them. I want to thank the board, CBC board and Peel Region and the member municipalities for your generous and ongoing support that allows us to continue our conservation work. Next slide. And with that, we'll finish our presentation, Chair Anika, and be happy to take any questions of Council. Deb, thank you very much. First up, our CVC Chair, Councillor Raz. Councillor Raz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, through you, thank you, Deb, for your presentation today. I think it was a good update uh, for Council. Uh, just, I'm wondering if you can just um, expand on a few of those points. As it relates to the capital funding in our budget for, especially for Bell Fountain, that is in this operating budget, correct? So it's not a, capital isn't se separate from operating. And I just want pe people to realize because Bell Fountain is such a huge um, capital expenditure that um, it's really driving our, uh, our two and a half uh, ish percent this year. Uh, yeah, so we, what, in fact, the 2.3 million that we showed there is money that we've been accumulating over the years. So we, without, we don't have a formal capital works account, and Jeff could speak to this maybe a little bit more. Uh, so what we've been doing is every year we've got some money for capital works in our budget, and if it, some of it we've just been rolling over year over year. It's not the ideal. We'd like to, um, you know, eventually have a capital account that we, that is, meant for that and shown for that, and it wouldn't be subject to salary and um, other other kinds of increases that are related to cost of living and, and salary adjustments. But Jeff, do you want to maybe add a little bit to that? Yes, thanks. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Raz, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we have been working hard over the past number of years to uh, move forward with our capital asset management plan work. Um, key in that is understanding the state of the assets we have, but also planning for future assets, um, state of good repair and life cycle management. As we move forward with this, um, what we will be bringing forward is a full asset management plan that will eventually lead to us separating out a capital budget from an operating budget more in line with what uh, the municipalities at Peel are used to. Uh, it's just been a matter of, uh, you know, CBC has grown over the years. We're at the point uh, of maturity with our asset management work that uh, this is something that we'll look forward to, to bringing. Um, we also potentially have the opportunity with the realignment of the budgets as a result of the Conservation Authority Act changes to bring this change forward so that we're trying to bring all of the change forward to our municipal partners at one time, as opposed to making the change to the Conservation Authorities Act budgeting, and then later bringing um, asset management uh, planning or capital budgets forward. So we're gonna work hard in the next year to, to try to have all of that uh, in place. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I guess uh, probably back to Deb, when it comes to Bell Fountain, I mean, if if councillors haven't been up to the Caledon area lately, and it's certainly down in Rattray Marsh, which is probably our number one attended uh, uh, no fee park, it's the, the increased use and exhaustion of those resources on our properties is just, those, those costs are just creeping up and creeping up. Um, and uh, it's obviously something that we're going to have to deal with because people are going to come regardless, whether there's a pandemic or not. So uh, I'm just wondering if you can touch on how important and what we need to do uh, in terms of relating these parks to our tourism entities that we deal with and also the importance of the recreational aspects. That's a great point, Karen. Thank you for that. Um, the we do work very closely with tourism, particularly for the Credit Valley Trail. Uh, we've got a committee uh, that is looking at all those things. 
uh, and certainly a lot of the funding we uh, through the staff at the through Jeff's Parks team are also looking at funding opportunities through a variety of, of um, tourism related. In fact, a lot of the uh, funding that came for the early parts of developing the Credit Valley Trail was uh, provided by the province through their tourism. Uh, Department, which I can't, it's a very long name that I never get right. So, and they keep changing it. So, um, so we, we do know that, uh, that there is an interest. We have been trying to work very closely with Caledon as well for, um, to ensure that the, this, what we're building will, uh, support what they need as well. Uh, so we're still working through those things. I don't know if Jeff wants to add anything on that of late. Well, I think the other thing that's important is is we recognize the, the linkage to uh, the local businesses. And uh, this year, for example, when we had the closure and then we're planning our reopening, we were in constant communication with the local businesses in Bell Fountain just to keep them apprised of status. And we really do see them as, as in, you know, critical partners to our operations and to the success overall of uh, CBC and our parks operations. So. Okay, Those are important you. relationships. Um, all right, thank you. I don't have any further questions because I know I can access you at uh, pretty much any time. So. But I do want to give a shout out to uh, Deb, Jeff, and the incredible team behind you that has worked so hard during this pandemic uh, to get as many people out to enjoy our wonderful uh, conservation areas and resources as possible. So thank you both. And uh, Mr. Chair, I'll be happy to move the uh, the presentation and the deputation. Thank you. Yes, th thank you. Um, I see no other speakers on my list, but one last call. Are there any other questioners? Seeing none, then what I will do, thank you very much, Deb, and thank you very much to the team. I do have a motion before me from Councillor Raz and Councillor Innes that 6, 3, 4, and 5, all of the conservation reports be received. That is the motion before me. Any objectors? Seeing none, that carries, again, with thanks to all of our partners at the Conservation Authority. Okay, moving right along and trying to get us out before 3.30 in the hour we have left, so that we're done by the appointed time, I have the reports from 7.1 to 7.5. What I thought I would do, the only one that includes a presentation, is from Norm Lum with regards to budget initiatives and impacts for deferrals. I thought we might kick off with Norm to round everything out. Uh, Councillor Santos, as noted and as promised, I've got you on standby next because I know you had some questions and your notice of motion to deal with. I think it might appropriately be put then. And then I'm going to come back to Norm and perhaps the CAO to answer any questions that come from that. And then we will deal with reports 7, 1, 2, and 3, none of which include a presentation, but will entertain any other questions that may not have been answered. So with that, I jump to 7.5. Norm, please give us your budget initiative and impact of deferrals presentation. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of Regional Council. So I'm here to provide an update on the 2021 budget. Uh, next slide, please. So before getting into the specific budget numbers, I want to provide some context around the overall net tax expenditures for the Region of Peel. The proposed 2021 net tax operating budget totals just under $1.2 billion. The regionally financed external agencies, the conservation authorities, the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation and Police Services, most of whom you heard from earlier today, uh, represent 44% of the net tax levy. The remaining 56% funds all the region-controlled tax-supported services. Next slide, please. In developing the 2021 budget, uh, staff used the core principles endorsed by Council during deliberations of the 2020 budget. Protect and maintain service levels to meet the needs of a growing population, Ensure long-term financial sustainability of services by providing ongoing funding for long-term needs. Maintain taxpayer fairness and leverage our continuous improvement efforts. Next slide, please. And as presented in the budget overview last week, the 2021 budget includes $6.4 million in efficiencies achieved through our continuous improvement program, $2.5 million in cost savings and $3.9 million in cost avoidance. The $2.5 in savings included leveraging savings from finding ways to more efficiently deliver early on programs, shifting to online education for some public work services and also to outreach via students in the, in the waste service. Savings also reflect line by line reviews resulting in reductions in the discretionary spending budget and to the annual contribution to the working fund reserve. 
In addition to these savings, Council's approval to use the tax surpluses in the 2017, 2018, and 2019 uh, years eliminated the requirement of $30 million in debt financing for the Seniors Health and Wellness Village, resulting in annual savings of $1.6 million. Next slide, please. Cost avoidance included the use of callback technology and avoiding the hiring of additional staff to handle COVID-19 inquiries, saving time through an improved onboarding process, and improving the process of hiring external legal counsel. Next slide, please. So leveraging continuous improvements resulted in a proposed net tax levy increase of 3.2% or the equivalent of a 1.3% property tax impact. Next slide, please. So as presented to Council last week, two funding announcements were made by the province after the budget was developed. The first one was for anti-human sex trafficking. The province has provided $3.1 million to be used over a five-year period. Staff recommend that one-fifth of the funding, or $620,000, be applied to the 2021 budget for the Community Investment Service. This will reduce the overall net expenditure. The province also announced $5 million in one-time funding to offset the funding reduction to the early years in child care program in recognition of the challenging economic climate. This funding can be used to offset the funding reduction or be used to address COVID pressures for child care. To smooth out the impact of the $5 million funding reduction, staff recommend that $2.5 million of the one-time funding grant be used to partially offset the funding reduction in the 2021 budget. This will leave the remaining $3.8 million funding reduction to be addressed in the 2022 budget and an additional $1.2 million in 2021 to address COVID-related pressures. Next slide, please. So in addition to the provincial funding announcements, other options were reviewed to reduce the budget over the past week. Merging the Corporate Services Department with the Finance Department. This will result in the elimination of one commissioner position and one administrative assistant position and savings of $350,000. We were also provided with an update on the notional tax adjustment, which has identified an additional $423,000 in tax revenue. And finally, in consideration of the pandemic, staff don't think it will be likely that the Seniors Health and Wellness Village will be opening in December this year. Therefore, it is recommended that the long-term care service reduce its budget by $57,000, the equivalent of one month of building operating costs. Staff will bring an update to Council on the Seniors Health and Wellness Village in the spring. Next slide, please. With the recommended reductions, the proposed budget will drop from a net tax levy increase of 3.21% or 1.3% property tax impact to a revised net tax levy increase of 2.87% or 1.2% property tax impact. The revised average impact to the resident is now $58, and for the average small business owner, the impact will be $103. Next slide, please. The revised 2021 budget includes the following investments that staff believe are in line with the principles used to develop the 2021 budget and are critical to maintaining service levels. For paramedic services, two regular complement are requested to support the mental health and well-being of Peel's paramedic officers. For the infectious disease prevention and chronic disease prevention services, two public health inspectors and one public health nurse are requested. As presented to Council on December 3rd, 2020, the two additional inspectors are required to address the increased scope of work now required by the province, which includes ghost kitchens, and to address the backlog in inspections of high and moderate risk scenarios. The public health nurse has reduced the number of clients that are being turned away at the walk-ins, uh, walk-in clinics, pardon me. Also in chronic disease prevention, an investment has been requested to implement Council's Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, approved on October 22nd, 2020. The plan's vision is for a safe, inclusive, and collaborative community where all residents thrive. In housing support, the request is to include the cost to operationalize the new homelessness emergency shelter approved in camera for purchase by Regional Council on June 25, 2020. In early years in child care, as approved by Council on May 24, 2018, Resources are being requested to ensure the equitable access, including the number of hours, to child care programs. For enterprise programs and services, 
in order to provide a secure digital environment. The budget includes two additional positions to support the IT security team. The workload of the security team has increased considerably because of the additional scrutiny required to ensure security is embedded in new solutions, ensure security compliance, address security risks identified through various audits, and to address the ongoing maintenance of the existing security infrastructure to mitigate cybersecurity risks. In addition, the budget includes one position to support the IT infrastructure team in handling the move of on-premise technology to the cloud and continuing to maintain service levels. The next area for investment in 2021 is communications. Regional Council has shown its support to increase social media and COVID accelerated the opportunity to grow our social media presence. Overall social media reach has grown by over 60% this year. That means we are reaching different audiences, such as the millennials, more effectively. Moreover, the social media provides Peel residents direct and immediate access to up-to-date information. The budget includes two additional positions to meet public demand for connection through digital platforms. This request reflects a more strategic and intentional way of supporting our social media communication channels. And finally, a service investment is required in the area of addressing anti-racism and systemic discrimination. Regional Council adopted several resolutions in 2020 mandating serious investment and commitment of resources to make sure that anti-racism work gets done right. This work involves the development and implementation of an anti-racism strategy and tools for sustainable implementation and includes internal partnerships and external collaborations, such as the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan and the community-led anti-Black racism and systemic discrimination collective mentioned in the Health and Human Services presentations last week. To support this, the budget includes one additional position. Next slide, please. And now we'll shift gears to the utility rate program. As presented last week, Peel's 2021 water bill will be 35% below the 2020 average within the GTA, even with the proposed 2021 increase of 5.5%. Next slide, please. The 2021 utility rate budget includes an investment to sustain the management of growing water customer accounts. Currently, two contract staff are processing over 17,000 requests for change in ownership of resale properties. The work is ongoing. Therefore, we are recommending the conversion of these two positions to regular complement. The cost for these positions is covered by fee revenue generated by the service. This completes the review of initiatives that we have included in the 2021 budget. Next slide, please. So in summary, with the recommended reduction to the tax supported budget, a revised net tax levy increase of 2.87%, equivalent to a 1.2% property tax impact is proposed. Uh, this will result in an average annual impact of $58 to the resident and an annual impact of $103 to the average small business owner. Um, thank you, that concludes my presentation. And um, I guess to the chair, we're moving on to the next um, order of business, the reports. Um, no, i tell you what I'm going to do. Perhaps I might take questions at this time. And before I go to my list, I just wanted to add one more. Um, it's deep in the bowels of the budget, but I also wanted to confirm as promised to my colleagues that in the office of in my office in the chair's board, the 100000 for communications for my newsletter, just as I committed, I didn't spend it two years ago, I didn't spend it last year, and once again, I asked it not be spent this year, so there's an additional 100000 of savings, and I've also committed to do the same next year, as you know, so that's deep in there somewhere. With that, we're going to start with questions for Norm, and as promised, I have Councillor Santos first, then Sato Paleshi Raz. Questions, please, Councillor Santos. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, is this uh, it, questions in relation to the possible motion that I, I tabled from last week? Yes, I think that would be okay. appropriate. And we'll see where we go from there if you still wish to put a motion. So you're yeah. up and we'll see where we go from there. Okay, go ahead. So thank you through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the for the presentation and the, and the summary. Um, part of the reason why I, uh, that motion was, was uh, put forward last week was uh, simply because at, in Brampton, um, 
uh, we finished our budget process and managed to get to uh, a zero percent. Um, and part of that process was because we, uh, early in the term in 2018, Councillor Singh at the city brought forward a motion to uh, conduct a value for money audit. And through that audit, we were able to find a number of different efficiencies which have been implemented over the years. Now, I know that a value for money audit would not be able to take place right away in this particular budget process. And in speaking with CAO uh, Baker over the past few days, um, I understand that there is, in fact, a new process um, that uh, she is interested in implementing, which may actually accomplish the same goal of a value for money audit. So I'm wondering if if uh, CAO Baker might be able to share that. And uh, because of that conversation I had with her, um, I'd be happy to uh, withdraw the motion and if necessary, after this upcoming process, uh, table it again. So uh, over to you, CAO Baker. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, Councillor Santos, for, for your motion and your question. Uh, yes, so we did have, uh, certainly, I thought, a great conversation. So, of course, the first thing, and you've already alluded to it, is for us to look at uh, doing something like this in the current environment with our staff who are at more than 100% capacity dealing not just with COVID response, but also the upcoming mass vaccination plan. Um, there was just simply uh, no capacity in the organization for us to be able to advance this, not just for 2021. I, I don't, I wouldn't see how uh, through procurement and other support services that uh, that we could realistically launch something like this until much later in the fiscal year. Having said that, though, uh, there are a couple of things that I do want council to be aware of. So the first is prior to uh, my arriving at the region, uh, your executive leadership team uh, did actually engage uh, Ernst & Young to come in and look at a, a, a fairly broad range of administrative and other support services with a view to examining opportunities for uh, cost savings and efficiencies. So that work is still currently underway. Uh, we have just gotten um, the early recommendations from Ernst & Young. Within that, the portfolio of um, staff and, and services across the corporation that are engaged in what I would call the broad area of continuous improvement is something that we, we want to look at. I think you can see from some of the, the work that's been presented to you today that there certainly is uh, activity across the organization. However, uh, we've been given uh, some things to think about. I think there there are ways in which we can uh, streamline uh, some of these processes. We can make them more efficient. But more importantly, we can focus on really lifting up the capacity of the entire organization uh, to be able to do this work. Um, and um, my my former council colleagues in Mississauga would be very familiar with the program that we had there, which was uh, really grown around lean methodologies. We do practice those at the region, but I think we can do a better job of um, uh, utilizing uh, the, pr the past training and uh, the uh, talent and, and skill sets that we have across the corporation uh, to really uh, flex our muscles and, and, and do uh, a better uh, and more thorough job uh, of, of digging out and finding those efficiencies. The reality, though, of where we are in 2021 is even with uh, the, the work that we're examining and looking at and, and the things that we want to improve, you know, we have to be patient because I don't see that we'll have the capacity to really uh, launch uh, a change initiative like that until later in the year. And that is predicated on a successful vaccination program and our ability to climb our way out of, out of COVID. Um, um, but that's a bit of a, a, a some insight into some of the things that uh, the team and I are actively working on. Uh, and I can tell you that um, cost efficiency, 
service effectiveness, customer service is clearly job one for, for the team here and for me. And uh, we will regularly report back to you on our progress in implementing that. So hopefully, Councillor Santos, that gives you some, uh, some comfort that we may be approaching the issue differently than, than your proposal, but we very much have it top of mind. Thank you so much. And through you, Mr. Chair, based on um, the information that, that CAO Baker has provided, I'm happy to withdraw the motion and look forward to seeing some of those efficiencies and continuous improvement uh, programs come forward in, in the very near future. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And as I go to my list of questioners now, I want to be clear to everyone that having heard presentation 7.5, which is before us, I'm bringing forward at this time 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3, which were all here as presented. There's no deputations on them. So now is your time to ask any and all questions related to the budget to norm, related to 7.1, enterprise asset management, 7.2, overview and update of status reserves, 7.3, operating and capital budget, and the presentation Norm gave or whatever else you would like to speak to related to our budget, my list is Sato Paleshi Raz. Councillor Sato. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I'm assuming 7.5 was Norm's presentation. Is that correct? Because I don't have it in my agenda. That is correct. So was that sent to us? I, I don't have it. It's, oh, it's uh, not in my... Can the staff confirm um, through to the clerk's? Uh, they're nodding here that the answer is yes. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll see if my staff can find it then. Um, so I have a couple of questions to Norm. And first of all, thank you. That's that's a good report. It's always good when you find um, ways to, uh, to reduce the tax impact. So my question is with regard to the 1% infrastructure levy. Is that 1%, which I think is about equal to about 11 million, is that included in the chart that shows the, I think it's 46 million increase of um, departmental? I, I'm, I'm a little confused as to where that is. I don't see it identified on any of the, um, on any of the actual charts except the reserve one. Uh, so thank you for the chair, uh, the question and through the chair. It is on all the charts. You'll see even on the stack bar chart. Um, you'll, Can you it'll give me a page to look at? Oh, certainly. Here, let me go back quickly to um, the report. Um, I don't know if you remember. Um, actually, clerks, if you could go to um, slide number six from today. So you see that um, darker green bar, uh, the second bar, that's the 1% infrastructure levy. That's the $11.3 million. Councillor Sato, I think you're muted, if you can hear me. Thank you, sorry, I think staff keep muting me. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, you're I good to go. It. So on this chart, um, that adds up, that makes it part of the 3.2. So if that were to come out for 2021, that would bring that down to 2.2. What would that be on the tax rate increase? The tax rate increase for the, for the region appeal uh, through the chair? So yes. that, that increase that you're looking at right now is what we had uh, originally presented to council last week. So we had started out at 3.2%. Right. And then with the efficiencies we uh, presented in the new provincial funding, today I presented that we were at 2.9%. So right. if, we took, if we took out the 1% solution, we'd be at a 1.9% tax levy. Okay, so that's the tax levy would be 1.9%. So the 2.9 equated to 1.2 on the tax bill. That is correct. So what would the 1.9 equate to on the tax bill of, of what residents would actually see as an increase? 
Uh, so through the chair, um, uh, Councillor Sato, that would be 0.76. So just a little under 0.8 percent property tax impact on average. Okay. On average, right? Okay. Okay. So um, my next question then is: um, I mean, I've always been one that has supported infrastructure levies, additional levies every year because we need to build on that. Um, and and it's uh, it's just a very cost effective way of doing it. However, this is not a usual year, um, and people are struggling. And uh, anything that we can do to to give them a cushion over the next twelve months, I think we should be looking at doing. Um, we're not going to get to zero. I mean, uh, Brampton, it's nice to see you're getting to zero. We we did that for about twelve years. And when you have huge assessment growth, which we did, and now you're getting, it's it's actually fairly easy to get to zero. Our assessment growth at the region, I think, was only about 8.8%, which is, is, is that it right? It was about 8.8 or 9%. It wasn't that high anyway, or was it 8 million? <laughs> Am I reading my numbers wrong? Oh, oh through the chair, Councillor Sato, it was 0.88%. Point nine point nine. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I missed the I missed the decimal. Um, so you know, I'm I'm not looking at us getting to zero at the region because we have uh, you know we've had reductions from the province and in a lot of things and we've been hit by COVID. But I guess I would like staff to comment. Um, the report seven point three, I think it is, states that we can catch up to the shortfall in infrastructure if we continue with the levy over the next five years, which is a fairly short period of time. Um, if we were to forego the 1% this year, bring it back in in 2022, what would the impact be? So thank you for the question, Councillor Sato, and through the chair. So if we deferred, uh, if we deferred the 1%, um, infrastructure levy this year and put it back in at 2022. Instead yeah. of having uh, six years in total, it would take seven years in total to fill the gap. So right now we have a total gap in our uh, reserve funding uh, by $1.3 billion. So taking away the 1% solution over a, a 10 year period is about a loss in revenue of about $121 million. Okay. So okay. we'd have to go back and relook at the existing capital projects to see what we could defer. So, and by doing that, we would reduce the impact on our citizens by actually just more than one percent um, increase, which I think it, quite frankly, is worth looking at. If we hadn't just gone through a year of COVID where people had lost their jobs and uh, and were in great financial difficulty. Uh, and that's just residential. I think looking at the business, um, the the impact would be even greater on the businesses uh, if if we weren't to add that additional one percent on for 2021. As I said, it's not something that I've ever advocated doing in all the times I've been on regional council. But we also, um, the 30 years I've been on council, we haven't had a year where so many people in our community have been put in such dire financial straits as we have over the past year and as will be over a lot of this year as well because a lot of them you know the businesses are not going to be open fully uh, hospitality industry is not going to be open fully and uh, a lot of people won't be back at work so um, I, I'd like us to consider it I'm, I'm not going to put a motion forward right now because I, I would like to hear um, other comments on that possibility. As I said, I'm only looking at it for one year, which would delay the the, uh, the infrastructure funding for one year uh, in order to help out our citizens. The, um, the other thing I would like to ask, and Mr. Chair, I think now is probably the appropriate time for me to do this. Um, I had last week, I raised the issue of um, utility rates going up and impacting um, uh, the same people that I just finished speaking about who um, who are fighting to uh, to keep their homes, put food on the table, et cetera. 
So during the last week, I've had a chance to discuss this with um, with Anthony Parenti and, and Andrea. Um, so I would like to formally today, if council could give direction to staff to bring a report back to council, looking at um, various options that we could pursue that would enable the region to assist those residents who are in financial difficulties that simply cannot pay their water bill. We're, we're not gonna cut them off, um, but I think there are things that we can do that we could do internally, that we could assist those that are in, not, not just people that have higher water bills and don't wanna pay higher water bills, but those that can show real financial hardship um, as we have done with deferrals in the past. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'd like to put that um, as direction, but I think uh, because it needs to be voted on by council to give direction for staff to do that, um, it probably has to be in the form of a motion. Maybe the clerk could clarify. Yes, Councillor Sato, and you still have the floor, but for the sake of absolute clarity, Councillor Sato, um, and some people still, I think, have their mics on. I'm getting some feedback. If you're not, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Sato, yes, we would need a motion with regards to that for something, if I'm understanding correctly, for the staff to take away and come back with and see how it can be remediated, if you will, during the year. But the other point, Councillor Sato, I wish to make clear, your suggestion with regards to the 1%, um, the discussion is now, and we would be voting voting with regards to 7.3 on the budget right. today. So that is what is before. So you quite rightly put it for today because staff have done everything they're going to do. My yeah. final report for the day is the budget itself. So um, this is your opportunity to um, yeah. not, we're not just, you're putting it before the floor if you wish. It has to be debated now, unless you're telling me you want to defer the budget as a whole. So just to be clear, no, Councillor Sato. Chair, no, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm putting it forward as an idea, and I would like to, as a suggestion, I would like to hear from other members of council what they think about removing the 1% for 2021. Um, and after hearing from my colleagues, then I may or may not put a formal motion forward okay, as the part two. of 7.3. And I think we're going to end up at the same, but formally, I need a motion on the floor to speak to that. But the more broader point I was making is okay. happy to hear the conversation. What I'm telling everyone is now is the moment to have that conversation before okay. I ask for a motion to approve the budget. So, Councillor Sato, I come okay, back Mr. to you. Mr. Chair, if you would like a motion, then I'm going to put forward a motion, which would be an amendment to the budget recommendation that the 1% be deferred for 2021 and reinstated in 2022. Thank you, Councillor Sato. Properly put, do I have a seconder for that motion? Mr. Happy Chair, second. Councillor Raz, second. Oh, no, Councillor Pleshi, go ahead. Doesn't matter, whatever. Uh, I'll acknowledge Councillor Pileshi first, so I have the motion formally before me that when we get to 7.3, that has now been changed as proposed that it be the 1% less as discussed. That is the motion that I have before the floor. I will carry on with my, and thank you, Councillor Sato. I will carry on with my list. Pileshi, Raz, Demerlo. Mr. Count Mr. Chair, my other motion, sorry, staff keeps muting me when I'm trying to talk. Sorry, here. Pat, go ahead. My other, my other one you said would have to be in the form of a motion. So yes. if staff could prepare the proper wording for the direction for um, for the work staff to bring forward a report on assisting residents with the utility bill. Absolutely. Okay, thank uh, you. Totally appropriate. And we're aware of that. And that will follow without question. Yes. Okay. Moving on to the motion that I have before me, Councillors Pileshi, Raz, Demerla. Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, thank you. Happy to support Councillor Sato and seconding the motion. Um, I, uh, my question's related to uh, to Norm's uh, last presentation there and, and a better understanding of the 600 and change thousand dollars um, that I believe, if, I've, if I have it correctly, um, the province um, allocated some funding towards us for the anti-sex trafficking and um, we're now moving 600, and I think it was, if we can pull that slide back up, I think it was 630,000 uh, over to the community. 
if we can pull that slide back up, if that's possible. <clears throat> 620,000, the community investment service uh, 2021 budget. If I can get a better understanding on that. Is that the way I, I interpreted it? Yep, through to Norm. Yeah, thank you for the question, Councillor Pelleschi, and through the chair. Yes, that is correct. So the province have allocated to us uh, $3.1 million to use over a five-year period. So what we're proposing is to use it over a five-year period to take one-fifth of it into this year's budget and the other 80% over the next four years. So this year would reduce the budget by $620,740. Okay, but this is a this is an actual move to the to a community investment service portion. That's that's outside of the of the anti human sex trafficking funding. Oh no! So I apologize. So through the chair, Councillor Pelleschi, we already have um, an anti human sex trafficking uh, program that's run through our community investment service. What we're proposing is to use this funding. Uh, to help offset the cost. So we had proposed uh, a program to be based in over three years, starting a couple of years ago, hoping that it would, would attract funding. And now that the province announced funding, we thought it would be appropriate to apply the funding to reduce the budget with it. Okay, um, and that's kind of what I had thought. So I'm, I'm, um, I would rather see the funding continue with, with, the, uh, uh, with the program. And then, um, of course, that being on top of the the monies that are allocated by uh, uh, that were sent by the the province, um, so I'm not okay with supporting that. And so, Mr. Chair, uh, through you, I would like that removed from uh, the portion of the budget, so I can vote on that. So we can vote on that separately. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, duly noted here by the by the clerk's office. Carrying on with my list, Councillor Ras. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I, and I know that this is, you know, these are difficult conversations, probably the most difficult budget we've had to deal with since uh, since I've been on council, that's for sure. Um, and we should be taking the view that this isn't a normal budget and we are in, an, in fact in an emergency. Uh, and with that, I mean, we have to sharpen our pencils even further. When we look at a $110 increase for businesses, we know that there is absolutely no income coming into a lot of these businesses right now, especially our small businesses, and we need to provide them every ounce of support we can. So uh, I'm wondering, Norm, if you can go back to the slide of the um, new initiatives. And I know that a lot of these things are um, priorities that we've made throughout council, before this became, or before we were dealing with a pandemic. So I just wanna go through those again, and please explain to me which of these is absolutely necessary, and let's look at the ones that we can put off till 2022. I mean, the paramedic services absolutely for psychological health. Um, they're on our, fr you know, our frontline workers who absolutely need that support. But, um, you know, for compliance with f commercial food preparation, it, um, I don't know if that's something that can wait. So I'm just wondering if, if um, you know, the homelessness emergency shelter we absolutely need, but, but some of those other ones with respect to uh, digital platforms, can they wait? I mean, I'm looking, I'm looking, we're nickel and diming right now, and, and I fully support the 1% uh, the, the of infrastructure reduction this year, uh, or putting it on hold this year because we just we we need to do something and I know that the delay is the inevitable but we need to find more. So thank you for the question, uh, Councilor Raz, and through the chair. So what we have included on the slide are the things that we believe are critical for maintaining services this year. I would suggest that, is there anything specific you want to ask about? I, and I will defer to my colleagues if they want to explain more in detail about the need uh, to sustain their service. Yeah, Norm, uh, perhaps, uh, you still have the floor, of course, Councillor, but maybe the CAO would like to speak to that before I come right back to you. Uh, Janice, please. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, just to Councillor Rass's question on the enterprise programs and services, the dollars that are there for increased security and expertise are cybersecurity investments, and we do believe that those are critical, and I think Council would, would uh, understand why. Um, in, in today's environment, it is very important that we protect our systems and our data. Um, sorry, that slide went down. I mean, look, I, Many of these programs, uh, and, and the commissioners can speak to them because, uh, unfortunately, my institutional memory only started on October 19th, so I wasn't here when many of these things were approved. Uh, and, uh, you know, they can certainly speak to the ones that are already in progress. So my understanding on the, on the homelessness shelter is that's moving forward, and, and unless we want to not open it, uh, then we have to pay for the cost. These, again, are primarily uh, council-approved initiatives. Uh, however, uh, you know, the ones that we probably can stop are not large dollars. I think you can acknowledge that by looking at the, the numbers. Uh, the two big ones um, are the homelessness shelter. We could defer uh, the implementation of the community safety and well-being program. That is a priority that council has. I was here when that report was considered. It was my very first council meeting. So, you know, this is the dilemma that we have is that we've been marching down with these initiatives having been before council and having been approved, there is really very little with the exception of the, the security pieces on here that I think have come forward from staff outside of council discussions that have already occurred. I will tell you on the infrastructure levy, um, yes, that is a big ticket item, but uh, we all understand that the deferral or delay of the infrastructure levy just simply kicks the problem down the road. I do hear the concerns about the current environment and the pressures. So yes, these are, these are challenging and difficult decisions uh, that have to be made. But uh, there are real projects that are in the hopper that are intended to be funding, funded with those dollars. And uh, certainly, uh, staff, if you wish, uh, although it, it, it you know, uh, the, the lists are there, they can speak to the kinds of things that would have to be delayed. But bearing in mind that since water and wastewater is, is financed on rates, by and large, we're talking about programs like housing, we're talking about regional buildings, that's the infrastructure, uh, regional roads, so that's the infrastructure that this levy is designed to support. So something's got to give on the back end. There's something then uh, that will have to be looked at when will have to be deferred. Um, but I think, you know, council knows that, but it's it's important, I think, that we, we, we point that out to you. So um, I would certainly be happy to have the commissioners speak to any of the issues in more detail if council uh, needs clarification on what some of these initiatives are. But I think broadly, uh, these have already been council approved. And I think in a couple of cases, it would be extremely challenging for us to roll them back at this stage. Councillor Raz, you still have the floor. Anything further? No, nothing further, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Moving on, Councillor DeMerla. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I think Councillor Raz really said it well when she said these are really difficult decisions. And I'm, I'm struggling with the 1% the levy. I understand the sentiment. But I'd like a better understanding of what projects get delayed and how far. And I've been just thinking that, you know, one of the interesting things through 2000. 20 was we deferred the property taxes, but most homeowners paid up because they preferred to just keep going. And we have safe start for 2021. We won't have it for 2022. So if we kick this, you know, the difficult decisions down the road, 2022 will be an even more difficult year. So I'm just wondering, uh, it would be good to know, one, what are the capital projects that get delayed if we don't do the 1% levy? 
And the second is maybe could we meet halfway and do a 0.5% levy uh, this year as opposed to nothing? And, and we will have the option for people to defer taxes. That's what we've done at the city of Mississauga uh, on an application basis, and I'm assuming it's the same regionally as well. So we give people that option that if they can't pay, they're able to defer for some time. But to take it away and then add it later, uh, you know, unless I know properly, like, what is being delayed, A, and then maybe we end up with a 0.5 percent levy. So, so that, those were my thoughts, Chair, and uh, I'd love to hear back from staff and, of course, other councillors. Thank you. I think that frames a question for Commissioner Warren. Might I add, and I think she will speak to this as well, please be advised that this is in addition to a whole bunch of projects that we've deferred already on the capital infrastructure side because the levies aren't coming in. That's several hundreds of millions of dollars. It was a short while ago we had a report on all the projects that we were otherwise hoping to do, but because levies aren't coming in, those aren't individual tax dollars, those are development levies, nobody's developing. I think that number's as much as $800 million that we've had to kick down the road as well. Again, not on the tax bill, it's paid for where growth funds growth. So some of that's going on as we speak. But, Andrea, through to you, the question is, if that 1% or a fraction thereof was taken away, how does that imminently affect your plans going forward with this budget? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, through you, Regional Chair. Um, I'm actually going to seek clarification from our FSU uh, because uh, my understanding is that the utility rate component um, is, is a different infrastructure levy. So, Arvin, can you please speak to that, please? Hi, good afternoon to the chair. Um, with respect to the, the levy, the, we have a totally separate uh, infrastructure levy for utility, which is funded by utility rates. And then we have the infrastructure levy for the, the tax funded services, which basically funds all of the capital needs to maintain the, the assets in a state of good repair for all the tax funded services. Uh, that, as, you've, uh, as has already been mentioned, would include all the regional facilities, outside of the utility ones, including the roads and transportation, housing, uh, shelters, um, everything else that we need for the regional, uh, to support the capital needs for the region. So when we talk about the 1% infrastructure levy, we're only talking about everything outside of utility for water and wastewater. Understood, and if I've understood correctly, and I can be corrected, I think the question is though, but if this went ahead on the capital that you are referring to, imminently, how does that change your budget and what you otherwise thought you had ready to go for this year as part of the operating budget? I think the CAO has a thought on what, what I think the, the true question is and what we need to know what the real impact is. Uh, through to the CAO. Yeah, so I'm going to ask Stephen to speak to that, but I think broadly we would have to go back because we've built the capital plan around the proposed budget. So that is something clearly that we would have to go back um, and and examine and then come and say, if we take $11 million out of our pocket, what is it? that we're going to have to now defer as a consequence of that. So I don't know. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen, though, because there may have been some of that work done that I'm not aware of. So, Stephen, if you could just jump in, please. Yes, and, th and through the chair, and, and thank you. I'll try to provide a little bit of clarity. This, The 1% is only on the tax-supported infrastructure, which is primarily it's our affordable housing program, our paramedic facility program, our regional roads waste diversion programs, as well as our administrative facilities, although the administrative facilities are relatively minor in the big scheme of things. Um, as an example, deferring the $11 million is the equivalent of about $210 million over the next 20 years. So if you were to do the math on that, the entire paramedic facility program that council endorsed was only about $120 million for the next 10 years. Um, a couple, one affordable housing project is probably around $160 million. So that would sort of give you the context. We don't have which projects would be slowed down on a list ready to go. What we're saying is we have to maintain the city good repair. Council has made uh, some priority decisions around what to invest in. Active transportation is another area that could be impacted by it, and staff would have to go back and report back on how that uh, deferral would impact the capital program moving forward. 
CEO Baker. And I think the one thing that I would add, because the, the comment that I've heard is, well, we can add it on next year. So to Stephen's point about we're going to lose, you know, a larger amount. But, you know, with the power of compound interest, that means next year you're adding on two point something percent because you've got to make up for the one percent that we've not added on this year. So I think you need to think about the downstream consequences. Uh, I think it's far more likely if we take it out this year it is it won't get added back next year and then you are into that scenario that Stephen has alluded to where the impact of taking that out will aggregate over um, a longer period of time into some fairly material dollars thank you I hope that adds clarity councillor de Merle, you still have the floor if you had anything further I do um, so I guess uh, I'm a little uncomfortable saying blanket, we won't do the 1%, but not know from staff what the real impact is, that they would then rework their capital budget based on something we passed today without at least I understanding fully uh, what what gets slowed down. Um, so, so I do find that concerning because I've not been able to get an answer that would have said, well, the affordable housing would go ahead, but the paramedic sta station would uh, get delayed by two years. And then what does that mean? So it's it's a big decision. Um, anyway, I'd like to hear what other councillors might have to say. Um, but my inclination is, at the very least, we should have some kind of a levy this year. And if you want to decrease it or, you know, go 0.75 or 0.5, that may be one way to do it. But to go to zero completely, I, I think that's, we're going to have a tough budget next year as well, probably tougher for all of us. And do we want to be next year, you know, pretty much forced into doing at least the 1% uh, because we didn't do it this year? So I'm going to leave my thoughts at that. Uh, Chair, thank you. Thank you. Moving on with my list, Councillor Parrish. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, I'm very upset that we're doing this at quarter after three. I have a post-surgical appointment at four o'clock, which I made purposely after 3.30. Uh, this is a horrendous um, a lack of accountability or, or fairness to staff to be able to come back and in midair start giving us these numbers. So uh, first of all, I completely support keeping the infrastructure 1% in. Um, when I was on the school board, every year we needed to make cuts. We took off the um, maintenance and then portables fell apart and mold set in. So there's always a consequence to this. I will move referral of this whole discussion to the next council meeting, please. Um, I'm not prepared to leave and I'm not prepared to stay. I think this is very unfair to the staff and it's very unfair to those of us who try to plan our lives so that important discussions like this take place at the appropriate times and that the staff is prepared for it. So um, I'm going to move referral to the next council meeting. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I, I have a motion. That. And, has, and who, who who was it that seconded me? I, I heard you. Councillor DeMerla's asked for a second. Madam Clerk, over to you. I have a motion of referral. Uh, sorry, a motion of deferral to the next meeting. And that I have to deal with at this time. Very good. So in dealing with, I have a mover and a seconder, appropriately so. So the motion that I have before me at the present time is that the report of the Commissioner of Finance and Chief Finance Officer listed on the February 4, 2021 Regional Council Budget Agenda, list, titled rather 2021 Operating and Capital Budget, be deferred to the February 11, 2021 Regional Council Budget Meeting. Madam Clerk, for the vote over to you. Oh, I, I can ask. Okay, I'll do it that way. I, I'm going to ask first if, if this is a quick and dirty. Are there any objectors to that? Okay, seeing none, last call if I have no objectors. That's carried. Okay, thank you, and we will be dealing with it in one week's time. So, Madam Clerk, with that... I'm going to deal with the correspondence that's silver, because I'm guessing items 7, 1, 2, and 3, Mr. Lum's report, all under 7, are moved along to the next meeting. So let's deal with what else was before the chair. Okay, so we formally have to defer those reports as well. So also moved by Councillor Parrish, seconded by Councillor de Merler, that the report of the Commissioner of Finance listed on the February 4, 2021 Regional Bunchal Agenda 
titled Overview of Budget on the Status of Reserves be deferred until the February 11, 2021 Regional Council Budget Meeting. Anybody opposed to that? Hearing none, that is done. The next one, again moved by Councillors Parrish and DeMerla, that the report of the Commissioner of Finance and Chief Financial Officer listed on the February 4, 2021 Regional Council Budget Agenda titled Enterprise Asset Management Program be deferred to the February 11, 2021 Regional Council Budget Meeting. Is there anyone in opposition to that? Hearing no one again, that carries. So with that, all being appropriately deferred to our very next meeting, what remains before the chair is the communication items, items 8, 1 to 8, 8. I'm going to take them all in total. I won't pronounce them individually. At this time, would anybody like me to pull any of the items from 8, 1 to 8, 8? Hearing no one asking to speak to any of them, I'm going to accept a motion now. The communications items 81 to 88 all be received and referred on accordingly, as moved by Councillor Grove, seconded by. Can sorry. Uh, sorry, did somebody. Sorry, Councillor I was just throwing out the happy to move. Oh, very good. Thank you, Councillor Pelleschi. As moved by Councillor Pelleschi, seconded by Councillor Fortini. Is anyone in objection? Hearing not, that carries. Is there any other business before the chair? Sorry, Mr. Chair, is my motion on the utility also being moved to next week? Um, the answer I'm, I'm hearing it is. It's no okay, rush. Th thank you very much, Councillor Sato. Okay, and because it's just direction, Councillor Sato, I'm yeah. told we can deal with it now, and I think that's appropriate. Okay. So that's as great. moved, and I have it in my hand as we speak. So as moved by Councillor Sato, I am going to ask for a seconder. Who will second that for me? Happy to. Councillor Pelleschi, that staff be directed to report back to Regional Council with the options to assist the residents in the region of Peel who may require water billing assistance as a result of COVID-19. You've heard the motion. Are there any objectors to that motion? If not, that is carried as direction to staff. I dealt with other business, Madam Clerk. I'm on to the bylaws. Okay. And because we're deferring, the bylaws relate to the budget itself, though those have to be deferred. So the motion before me from Raz and Downey, that the bylaws listed on the February 4, 2021 Regional Council budget agenda being bylaws 6, 2021 to 10, 2021 inclusive, be deferred to the February 11, 2021 Regional Council budget meeting. You've heard the motion. Is there anybody in objection? Hearing that, it carries. The next motion that I have before me, as moved by Councillor Santos, seconded by Councillor Parrish, that bylaw 11 2021 to confirm the proceedings of the Regional Council at its budget meeting held on February 4, 2021, to deliberate the 2021 budget and to authorize the execution of documents in accordance with the Region Appeal bylaws relating thereto, be given the required numbers of readings taken as read, signed, in the, signed by the Regional Chair and the Deputy Regional Clerk, and the corporate seal be affixed thereto. Anybody opposed? That is carried. Madam.